Chapter One of the House of the Whispering Pines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carolyn. The House of the Whispering Pines by Anna Catherine Green. Book One. Smoke. Chapter One. The Hesitating Step to have reared a towering scheme of happiness and to behold it raised were nothing all men hope and see their hopes frustrate and grieve a while and hope anew but a blot in the scutcheon the moon rode high but ominous clouds were rushing towards it clouds heavy with snow i watched these clouds as i drove recklessly desperately over the winter roads i had just missed the desire of my life the one precious treasure which i coveted with my whole undisciplined heart and not being what you call a man of self-restraint i was chafed by my defeat far beyond the bounds i have usually set for myself the moon with the wild scurry of clouds hastening to blot it out of sight seemed to mirror the chaos threatening my better impulses and idly keeping it in view i rode on hardly conscious of my course till the rapid recurrence of several well-known landmarks warned me that i had taken the longest route home and that in another moment i should be skirting the grounds of the whispering pines our country clubhouse i had taken Ah, let me rather say my horse for he and i had traversed this road many times together and he had no means of knowing that the season was over and the club-house closed i did not think of it myself at the moment and was recklessly questioning whether i should not drive in and end my disappointment in a wild carouse when the great stack of chimneys coming suddenly into view against the broad disk of the still unclouded moon i perceived a thin trail of smoke soaring up from their midst and realized with a shock that there should be no such sign of life in a house i myself had closed locked and barred that very day i was the president of the club and felt responsible pausing only long enough to make sure that i had yielded to no delusion and that fire of some kind was burning on one of the clubhouse's deserted hearths i turned in at the lower gateway for reasons which i need not now state there were no bells attached to my cutter and consequently my approach was noiseless i was careful that it should be so also careful to stop short of the front door and leave my horse and sleigh in the black depths of the pine grove pressing up to the walls on either side i was sure that all was not as it should be inside these walls but as god lives i had no idea what was amiss or how deeply my own destiny was involved in the step i was about to take our club-house stands as it may be necessary to remind you on a knoll thickly wooded with the ancient trees i have mentioned these trees all pines and of a growth unusual and of an aspect well-nigh hoary extend only to the rear end of the house where a wide stretch of gently undulating ground opens at once upon the eye suggesting to all lovers of golf the admirable use to which it is put from early spring to latest fall now links as well as parterres and driveways are lying under an even blanket of winter snow and even the building with its picturesque gables and rows of bediamonded windows is well-nigh indistinguishable in the shadows cast by the heavy pines which soar above it and twist their limbs over its roof and about its forsaken corners with a moan and a whisper always desolate to the sensitive ear but from this night on simply appalling no other building stood within a half mile in any direction it was veritably a country club gay and full of life in the season but isolated and lonesome beyond description after winter had set in and buried flower and leaf under a white waste of untrodden snow i felt this isolation as i stepped from the edge of the trees and prepared to cross the few feet of open space leading to the main door 
the sudden darkness instantly enveloping me as the clouds whose advancing mass i had been watching made their final rush upon the moon added its physical shock to this inner sense of desolation and in some moods i should have paused and thought twice before attempting the door behind which lurked the unknown with its naturally accompanying suggestion of peril but rage and disappointment working hotly within me had left no space for fear rather rejoicing in the doubtfulness of the adventure i pushed my way over the snow until my feet struck the steps here instinct caused me to stop and glance quickly up and down the building either way not a gleam of light met my eye from the smallest scintillating pane was the house as soundless as it was dark i listened but heard nothing i listened again and still heard nothing then i proceeded boldly up the steps and laid my hand on the door it was unlatched and yielded to my touch light or no light sound or no sound there was some one within the fire which had sent its attenuated streak of smoke up into the moonlit air was burning yet on one of the many hearths within and before i should presently see whom what the question scarcely interested me nevertheless i proceeded to enter and closed the door carefully behind me as i did so i cast an involuntary glance without the sky was inky and a few wandering flakes of the now rapidly advancing storm came whirling in biting my cheeks and stinging my forehead once inside i stopped short possibly to listen again possibly to assure myself as to what i had best do next the silence was profound not a sound disturbed the great empty building my own footfall as i stirred seemed to wake extraordinary echoes i had moved but a few steps yet to my heightened senses the noise seemed loud enough to wake the dead instinctively i stopped and stood stock still there was no answering cessation of movement darkness silence everywhere yet not quite absolute darkness as my eyes grew accustomed to the place i found it possible to discern the outlines of the windows and locate the stairs and the arches where the side halls opened i was even able to pick out the exact spot where the great antlers spread themselves above the head-rack and presently the rack itself came into view with its row of empty pegs yesterday so full to-day quite empty that rack interested me i hardly knew why and regardless of the noise i made i crossed over to it and ran my hand along the wall underneath the result was startling a man's coat and hat hung from one of the pegs i knew my business as president of this club i also knew that no one should be in the house at this time that no one could be in it on any honest errand some secret and sinister business must be at the bottom of this mysterious intrusion immediately after the place has been shut for the winter would this hat and coat identify the intruder i would strike a light and see but this involved difficulties the gas had been turned off that very morning and i had no matches in my pocket but i remembered where they could be found i had seen them when i passed through the kitchen early in the day they were very accessible from the end of the hall where i stood i had but to feel my way through a passage or two and i should come to the kitchen door i began to move that way and presently came creeping back with a match-box half full of matches in my hand but i did not strike one then i had just made a move to do so when the unmistakable sound of a door opening somewhere in the house made me draw back into as quiet and dark a place as i could find this lay in the rear and at the right of the staircase and as the sound had appeared to come from above it was the most natural retreat that offered and a good one i found it i had hardly taken up my stand when the darkness above gave way to a faint glimmer 
and a step became audible coming from some one of the many small rooms in the second story but so slowly and with such evident hesitation that my imagination had ample time to work and fill my mind with varying anticipations each more disconcerting than the last now i seemed to be listening to the movements of an intoxicated man seeking an issue out of strange quarters then to the weary approach of one who had his own reasons for dread and was as conscious of my presence as i was of his but the light steadily increasing with each lagging but surely advancing step soon gave the lie to this latter supposition since no sane man afraid of an ambush would be likely to offer such odds to the one lying in wait for him as his own face illuminated by a flaming candle and i was yielding to the bewilderment of the moment when the uncertain step paused and a sob came faintly to my ears wrung from lips so stiff with human anguish that my fears took on a new shape and the event a significance which in my present mood of personal suffering and preoccupation was anything but welcome indeed i was coward enough to contemplate flight and might in another moment have yielded to the unworthy impulse if the sound of a second sigh had not struck shudderingly on my ear followed by the renewal of the step and the almost immediate appearance on the stairs of a young girl holding a candle in one hand and shielding her left cheek with the other life offers few such shocks to any man whatever his story or whatever his temperament i had been prepared by the sob i had heard to see a woman but not this woman nothing could have prepared me for an encounter with this woman anywhere that night after what had passed between us and the wreck she had made of my life but here in a place so remote and desolate i had hesitated to enter it myself what was i to think how was i to reconcile so inconceivable a fact with what i knew of her in the past with what i hope from her in the future to steady my thoughts and bring my whirling brain again under control i fixed my eyes on her well-known form and features as upon a stranger's whom i would understand and judge i have called her a woman and certainly i had loved her as such but as in this moment of strange detachment i watched her descent swaying foot following swaying foot falteringly down the stairs i was able to see that only the emotions which denaturalized her expression were a woman's that her features her pose and the peculiar childlike contour of the one cheek open to view were those of one whose yesterday was in the playroom but beautiful you do not often see such beauty under all the disfigurement of an agitation so great as to daunt me and make me question if i were its sole cause her face shone with an individual charm which marked her out as one of the few who are the making or marrying of men sometimes of nations this is the heritage she was born to this her lot not to be shirked not to be evaded even now at her early age of seventeen so much any one could see even in a momentary scrutiny of her face and figure but what was not so clear not even to myself with the consciousness of what had passed between us during the last few hours was why her heart should have so outrun her years and the emotion i beheld betray such shuddering depths some grisly fear some staring horror had met her in this strange retreat simple grief speaks with a different language from that which i read in her distorted features and tottering slowly creeping form what had happened above she had escaped me to run upon what my lips refused to ask my limbs refused to move and if i breathed at all i did so with such fierceness of restraint that her eyes never turned my way not even when she had reached the lowest step and paused for a moment there oscillating in pain or uncertainty her face was turned more fully towards me now and i had just begun to discern something in it besides its tragic beauty when she made a quick move and blew out the candle she held one moment that magical picture of superhuman loveliness 
then darkness i might say silence for i do not think either of us so much as stirred for several instants then there came a crash followed by the sound of flying feet she had flung the candlestick out of her hand and was hurriedly crossing the hall i thought she was coming my way and instinctively drew back against the wall but she stopped far short of me and i heard her groping about then give a sudden spring towards the front door it opened and the wind sowed in i felt the chill of snow upon my face and realized the tempest then all was quiet and dark again she had slid quickly out and the door had swung to behind her another instant and i heard the click of the key as it turned in the lock heard it and made no outcry such the spell such the bewilderment of my faculties but once the act was accomplished and egress made difficult nay for the moment impossible i felt all lesser emotions give way to an anxiety which demanded immediate action for the girl had gone out without wraps or covering for her head and my experience of the evening had told me how cold it was i must follow and find her and rescue her if possible from the snow the distance was long to town the cold would cease and perhaps prostrate her after which the wind and snow would do the rest throwing myself against the door i shook it violently it was immovable then i flew to the windows their fastenings yielded readily enough but not the windows themselves one had a broken cord another seemed glued to its frame and i was still struggling with the latter when i heard a sound which lifted the hair on my head and turned my whole attention back to what lay behind and above me there was still some one in the house i had forgotten everything in this apparition of the woman i have described in a place so disassociated with any conception i could possibly have of her whereabouts on this especial evening but this noise short sharp but too distant to be altogether recognizable roused doubts which once awakened changed the whole tenor of my thoughts and would not let me rest till i had probed the house from top to bottom to find carmel cumberland alone in this desolation was a mystifying discovery to which i had found it hard enough to reconcile myself but carmel here in company with another at the very moment when i had expected the fruition of my own joy ah that was to open hell's door in my breast a possibility too intolerable to remain unsettled for an instant though she had passed out before my eyes in a drooping almost agonized condition not she dear as she was and great as were my fears in her regard was to be sought out first but the man the man who was back of all this possibly back of my disappointment the man whose work i may have witnessed but at whose identity i could not even guess leaving the window i groped my way along the wall until i reached the rack where the man's coat and hat hung whether it was my intention to carry them away and hide them in my anxiety to secure this intruder and hold him to a bitter account for the misery he was causing me or whether i only meant to satisfy myself that they were the habiliments of a stranger and not those of some sneaking member of the club is of little importance in the light of the fact which presently burst upon me the hat and coat were gone nothing hung from the rack the wall was free from end to end she had taken these articles of male apparel with her she had not gone forth into the driving snow unprotected but i did not know what to think no acquaintanceship with her girlish impulses nothing that had occurred between us before or during this night had prepared me for a freak of this nature i felt backward along the wall i felt forward i even handled the pegs and counted them as i passed to and fro touching every one but i could not alter the fact the groping she had done had been in this direction she was searching for this hat and coat a man's hat a derby as i had been careful to assure myself at the first handling and in them she had gone home as she had probably come and there was no man in the case or if there were 
the doubt drove me to the staircase making no further effort to unravel the puzzle which only beclouded my faculties i began my weary ascent i had not the slightest fear i was too full of cold rage for that the arrangement of rooms on the second floor was well known to me i understood every nook and corner and could find my way about the whole place without a light i took but one precaution that of slipping off my shoes at the foot of the stairs i wished to surprise the intruder i was willing to resort to any expedient to accomplish this the matches i carried in my pocket would make this possible if once i heard him breathing i held my own breath as i stole softly up and waited for an instant at the top of the stairs to listen there was an awesome silence everywhere and i was hesitating whether to attack the front rooms first or to follow up a certain narrow hall leading to a rear staircase when i remembered the thin line of smoke which rising from one of the chimneys had first attracted my attention to the house in that was my clue there was but one room on this floor where a fire could be lit it lay a few feet beyond me down the narrow hall i have just mentioned why had i trusted everything to my ears when my nose would have been a better guide as i took the few steps necessary a slight smell of smoke became very perceptible and no longer in doubt of my course i pushed boldly on and entering the half-open door struck my match and peered anxiously about emptiness here just as everywhere else a few chairs a dresser it was a lady's dressing-room some smouldering ashes on the hearth a lounge piled up with cushions but no person the sound i had heard had not issued from this room yet something withheld me from seeking further chilled to the bone with teeth chattering in spite of myself i paused just inside the door and when the match went out in my hand remained shivering there in the darkness a prey to sensations more nearly approaching those of fear than any i had ever before experienced in my whole life End of chapter one Chapter Two of the House of the Whispering Pines by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. It was she, she indeed. Look on death itself, up, up, and see the great doom's visage. Macbeth. Why I did not know. There seemed to be no reason for this excess of feeling i had no dread of attack my apprehension was of another sort besides any attack here must come from the rear from the open doorway in which i stood and my dread lay before me in the room itself which as i have already said appeared to be totally empty what could occasion my doubts and why did i not fly the place there were passageways yet to search why linger here like a gaby in the dark when perhaps the man i believed to be in hiding somewhere within these walls was improving the opportunity to escape if i asked myself this question i did not answer it but i doubt if i asked it then i had forgotten the intruder the interest which had carried me thus far had become lost in a fresher one of which the beginning and ending lay hidden within the four walls i now stared upon unseeing not to see and yet to feel did that make the horror if so another lighted match must help me out i struck one while the thought was hot within me and again took a look at the room i noted but one thing new but that made me reel back till i was half way into the hall then a certain dogged persistency i possess came to my rescue and i re-entered the room at a leap and stood before the lounge in its pile of cushions they were numerous all that the room contained and more chairs had been stripped window seats denuded and the whole collection disposed here in a set which struck me as unnatural was this the janitor's idea 
i hardly thought so and was about to pluck one of these cushions off when that most unreasonable horror seized me again and i found myself looking back over my shoulder at the fireplace from which rose a fading streak of smoke which some passing gust perhaps had blown out into the room i felt sick was it the smell it was not that of burning wood hardly of burning paper i but here my second match went out thoroughly roused now you will say by what i felt my way out of the room and took the head of the staircase i remembered the candle and candlestick i had heard thrown down on the lower floor by carmel cumberland i would secure them and come back and settle these uncanny doubts it might be the veriest fool business but my mind was disturbed and must be set at ease nothing else seemed so important yet i was not without anxiety for the lovely and delicate woman wandering the snow-covered roads in the teeth of a furious gale any more than i was dead to the fact that i should never forgive myself if i allowed the man to escape whom i believed to be hiding somewhere in the rear of this house i had a hunt for the candlestick and a still longer one for the candle but finally i recovered both and lighting the letter i felt myself for the first time more or less master of the situation rapidly regaining the room in which my interest was now centred i set the candlestick down on the dresser and approached the lounge heartily knowing what i feared or what i expected to find i tore off one of the cushions and flung it behind me more cushions were revealed but that was not all escaping from the edge of one of them i saw a shiny tress of a woman's hair i gave a gasp and pulled off more cushions then i fell on my knees struck down by the greatest horror which a man can feel death lay before me violent uncalled-for death and the victim was a woman but it was not that though the head was not yet revealed i thought i knew the woman and that she did seconds pass or many minutes before i lifted the last cushion i shall never know it was an eternity to me and i am not of a sentimental cast but i have some sort of a conscience and during that interval it awoke it has never quite slept since the cushion had not concealed the hands but i did not look at them i did not dare i must first see the face but i did not twitch the pillow off i drew it aside slowly as though held by the restraining clutch of some one behind me and i was so held but not by what was visible rather by the terrors which gather in the soul at the summons of some dreadful doom i could not meet the certainty without some preparation i released another strand of hair then the side of a cheek half buried out of sight in the loosened locks and bulging pillows then with prayers to god for mercy an icy brow two staring eyes which having seen i let the cushion drop for mercy was not to be mine it was she she indeed and judgment was glassed in the look i met judgment and nothing more kindly however i might appeal to heaven for mercy or whatever the need of my fiercely startled and repentant soul dead adelaide the woman i had planned to wrong that very night and who had thus wronged me for a moment i could take in nothing but this one astounding fact then the how and the why woke in maddening curiosity within me and seizing the cushion i dragged it aside and stared down into the pitiful and accusing features thus revealed as though to tear from them the story of the crime which had released me as i would not have been released no not to have had my heart's desire in all the fullness with which i had contemplated it a few short hours before but beyond the ever accusing protuberant stare those features told nothing and stealing myself to the situation i made what observations i could of her condition and the surrounding circumstances for this was my betrothed wife whatever my intentions 
however far my love had strayed under the spell cast over me by her sister the young girl who had just passed out adelaide and i had been engaged for many months our wedding-day was even set but that was all over now ended as her life was ended suddenly incomprehensibly and by no stroke of god even the jewel on her finger was gone the token of our betrothal this was to be expected she would be apt to take it off before committing herself to a fate that proclaimed me a traitor to this symbol i should see that ring again i should find it in a letter filled with bitter words i would not think of it or of them now i would try to learn how she had committed this act whether by poison or it must have been by poison no other means would suggest themselves to one of her refined sense but if so why those marks on her neck growing darker and darker as i stared at them my senses reeled as i scrutinized those marks small delicate but deadly they stared upon me from either side of her white neck till nature could endure no more and i tottered back against the further wall beholding no longer room nor lounge nor recumbent body but a young girl's exquisite face set in lines which belied her seventeen years and made futile any attempts on my part at self-deception when my reason inexorably demanded an explanation of this death as suicide it was comprehensible as murder not unless and it had been murder i sank to the floor as i fully realized this End of chapter 2《3 of the House of the Whispering Pines by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Open. Prince, bring forth the parties of suspicion. Friar, I am the greatest, as the time and place doth make against me of this direful murder, and here I stand both to impeach and purge, myself condemned and myself excused romeo and juliet i have mentioned poison as my first thought it was a natural one the result undoubtedly of having noticed two small cordial glasses standing on a little table over against the fireplace when i was conscious again of my own fears i crossed to the table and peered into these glasses they were both empty however they had not been so long in each i found traces of anisette cordial and though no bottle stood near i was very confident that it could readily be found somewhere in the room what had preceded and followed the drinking of this cordial as i raised my head from bending over these glasses no club glasses by the way i caught sight of my face in the mental mirror it gave me maddening thoughts in this same mirror there had been reflected but a little while before two other faces for a sight of whose impression at that fatal moment i would gladly risk my soul how had she looked how that other would not the story of those awful those irrevocable moments be plain to my eye if the quickly responsive glass could but retain the impressions it receives and give back at need what had once informed its surface with moving life i stared at the senseless glass appealing to it with unreasoning frenzy as to something which could give up its secret if it would but only to meet my own features in every guise of fury and despair features i no longer knew features which insensibly increased my horror till i tore myself wildly from the spot and cast about for further clues to enlightenment before yielding to the conviction which was making a turmoil in mind heart and conscience alas there was but little more to see a pair of curling irons lay on the hearth but i had no sooner lifted them than i dropped them with a shudder of unspeakable loathing only to start at the noise they made in striking the tiles for it was the self-same noise i had heard when listening from below 
these tongs set up against the side of the fireplace had been jarred down by the forcible shutting of the large front door and no man other than myself was in the house or had been in the house only the two women but the time when this discovery would have brought comfort was past better a hundred times that a man i had almost said any man should have been with them here than that they should be closeted together in a spot so secluded with rancour and cause for complaint in one heart and a biting deadly flame in the other which once reaching up must from its very nature leave behind it a corrosive impress i saw i felt but i did not desist from my investigations a stick or two still smouldered on the hearthstone in the ashes lay some scattered fragments of paper which crumbled at my touch on the floor in front i espied only a stray hairpin everything else was in place throughout the room except the cushions and that horror on the lounge waiting the second look i had so far refrained from giving it that look i could no longer withhold i must know the depth of the gulf over which i hung i must not wrong with the thought one who had smiled upon me like an angel of light a young girl too with the dew of innocence on her beauty to every eye but mine and only not to mine within shall i say ten awful minutes it seemed ages all of my life and more yet that lovely breast had heaved not so many times since i looked upon her as a deified mortal and now two small spots on another woman's pulseless throat had drawn a veil of blood over that beauty and given to a child the attributes of a medusa yet hope was not quite stilled i would look again and perhaps discover that my own eyes had been at fault that there were no marks or if marks not just the ones my fancy had painted there turning i let my glance fall first on the feet i had not noted them before and i was startled to see that the arctics in which they were clad were filled all around with snow she had walked then as the other was walking now she who detested every effort and was of such delicate make that exertion of unusual kind could not readily be associated with her had she come alone or in carmel's company and if in carmel's company on what ostensible errand if not that of death her dress which was of dark wool showed that she had changed her garments for this trip i had seen her at dinner and this was not the gown she had worn then the gown in which she had confronted me during those few intolerable minutes when i could not meet her eyes fatal cowardice a moment of realization then and we might all have been saved this horror of sin and death and shameful retribution and yet who knows not understanding what i saw how could i measure the might have beens i would proceed with my task note if she wore the diamond brooch i had given her no she was without ornament i had never seen her so plainly clad might i draw a hope from this even the pins which had fallen from her hair were such as she wore when least adorned nothing spoke of the dinner-party or her having been dragged here unaware but all of previous intent and premeditation surely hope was getting uppermost if i had dreamt the marks but no there they were unmistakable and damning just when the breath struggles up i put my own thumbs on these two dark spots to see if when what was it a lightning stroke or a call of fate which one must answer while sense remains i felt my head pulled around by some unseen force from behind and met staring into mine through the glass of the window a pair of burning eyes or was it fantasy for in another moment they were gone nor was i in the condition just then to dissociate the real from the unreal but the possibility of a person having seen me in this position before the dead was enough to startle me to my feet and though in another instant i became convinced that i had been the victim of hallucination i nevertheless made haste 
to cross to the window and take a look through its dismal panes a gale of blinding snow was swept past making all things indistinguishable but the absence of balcony outside was reassuring and i stepped hastily back asking myself for the first time what i should do and where i should go now to ensure myself from being called as a witness to the awful occurrence which had just taken place in this house should i go home and by some sort of subterfuge now unthought of try to deceive my servants as to the time of my return or attempt to create an alibi elsewhere something i must do to save myself the anguish and calmel the danger of my testimony in this matter she must never know the world must never know that i had seen her here i had lost at a blow everything that gives zest or meaning to life but i might still be spared the bottommost depth of misery be saved the utterance of the word which would sink that erring but delicate soul into the hell yawning beneath her it was my one thought now though i knew that the woman who had fallen victim to her childish hate had loved me deeply and was well worth my avenging i could not be the death of two women the loss of one weighed heavily enough upon my conscience i would fly the place i would leave this ghastly find to tell its own story the night was stormy the hour late the spot a remote one and the road to it but little used i could easily escape and when the morrow came but it was the present i must think of now this hour this moment how came i to stay so long in feverish haste i began to throw the pillows back over the quiet limbs the accusing face shudderingly i hid those eyes i understood their strange protuberance now and recklessly bent on flight was half-way across the floor when my feet were stayed i wonder that my reason was not unseated by a sudden and tremendous attack on the great door below mingled with loud cries to open which ran thundering through the house calling up innumerable echoes from its dead and hidden corners it was the police the wild night the biting storm had been of no avail an alarm had reached headquarters and all hope of escape on my part was at an end yet because at such crisis instinct rises superior to reason i blew out the candle and softly made my way into the hall i had remembered a window opening over a shed at the head of the kitchen staircase i could reach it from this rear hall by just a turn or two and once on that shed a short leap would land me on the ground after which i could easily trust the storm to conceal my flight across the open golf links it was worth trying at least anything was better than being found in the house with my murdered betrothed i had no reason to think i was being sought or that my presence in this building was even suspected it might well be that the police were even ignorant of the tragedy awaiting them across the threshold of the door they seemed intent on battering down the gleam of a candle burning in this closed-up house or even the tale told by the rising smoke may have drawn them from the road to investigate such coincidences had been such untoward happenings had misled people into useless self-betrayal my case was too desperate for such weakness flight at this moment might save all i would at least attempt it the door was shaking on its hinges these intruders seemed determined to enter with a spring i reached the window by which i hoped to escape and quickly raised it a torrent of snow swept in covering my face and breast in a moment it did something more it cleared my brain and i remembered my poor horse standing in this blinding gale under cover of the snow-packed pines every one knew my horse i could commit no greater folly than to flee by the rear fields while such a witness to my presence remained in full view in front with the sensation of a trapped animal i reclosed the window and cast about for a safe corner where i could lie concealed until i learned what had brought these men here and how much i really had to fear from their presence i had but little time in which to choose 
the door below had just given way and a party of at least three men were already stamping their feet free from the snow in the hall i did not like the tone of their voices it was too low and steady to suit me i had rather have heard drunken cries or a burst of wild hilarity than these stern and purposeful whispers men of resolution could have but one errand here my doom was closing round me i could only put off the fatal moment but it was better to do this than to plunge headlong into the unknown fate awaiting me i knew of a possible place of concealment it was in the ballroom not far from where i stood i remembered the spot well it was at the top of a little staircase leading to the musicians gallery a balustrade guarded this gallery supported by a boarding white enough to hide a man lying behind it at his full length if the search i was endeavouring to evade was not minute enough to lead them to look behind this boarding it would offer me the double advantage of concealment and an unobstructed view of what went on in the hall through the main doorway opening directly opposite i could reach this ballroom and its terminal gallery without going around to this door a smaller one communicated directly with the corridor in which i was then lurking and towards this i now made my way with all the precautions suggested by my desperate situation no man ever moved more lightly the shoes which i had taken off in the lower hall were yet in my hand i had caught the mop after replacing the cushions on adelaide's body even to my own straining ears i made no perceptible sound i reached the balcony and stretched myself out at full length behind the boarding before the men below had left the lower floor an interval of hard torture and wearing suspense now followed they were ransacking the rooms below by the aid of their own lanterns as i could tell from their assured manner that they had not made at once for the scene of crime brought me some small sense of comfort but not much they were too resolute in their movements and much too thorough and methodical in their search for me to dream of their confining their investigations to the first floor unless i very much mistook their purpose i should soon hear them ascending the stairs after which instinct if not the faint smell of smoke still lingering in the air would lead them to the room where my poor adelaide lay and thus it proved more quickly than i expected the total darkness in which i lay brightened under an advancing lantern and i heard the steps of two men coming down the hall it was a steady if not rapid approach and i was quite prepared for their presence when they finally reached the doorway opposite and stopped to look in what must have appeared to them a vast and empty space they were officials true enough one hasty glance through the balustrade assured me of that i even knew one of them by name he was a sergeant of police and a highly trustworthy man but how they had been drawn to this place at a moment so critical i could not surmise do men of this stamp scent crime as a hound scents out prey they had the look of hounds even in the momentary glimpse i got of them i noted the sense and expectant look with which they endeavoured to pierce the dim spaces between us the chase was on it was something more than curiosity or a chance exercise of their duty which had brought them here and if the sight of the low gallery in which i lay should suggest to them all its possibilities as a hiding-place i should know in just one moment more what it is for the helpless query to feel the clutch of the captor but the moment passed without any attempt at approach on their part and when i lifted my head again it was to catch a glimpse of their side faces as they turned to look elsewhere for what they were plainly in search of an oath muffled but stern which was the first word above a whisper that i had heard issue from their lips told me that they had reached the room and had come upon the horror which lay there what would they say to it would they know who she was her name her quality her story and respect her dead as they certainly must have respected her living 
i listened but caught only a low murmur as they conferred together i imagined their movements saw them in my mind's eye leaning over that death-tenanted couch pointing with accusing finger at the two dark marks and consulting each other with sidelong looks as they passed from one detail of her appearance to another i even imagined them crossing the floor and lifting the two cordial glasses just as i had done and then slowly setting them down again with perhaps a lift of the brows or a suggestive shake of the head and maddened by my own intolerable position drawn by a power i felt it impossible to resist i crept to my feet and took my staggering way down the half-dozen steps of the gallery and thence along by the left-hand wall towards the further doorway and through it to where these men stood weighing the chances in which my life and honour were involved and those of one other of whom i dared not think and would not have these men think for all that was left me of hope and happiness it was dark in the ballroom and it was only a little less so in the corridor all the light was in that room but i still slid along the wall like a thief with eyes set and ears agape for any chance word which might reach me suddenly i heard one it was this uttered with a decision which had the strange effect of lifting my head and making a man of me again that settles it he will find it hard to escape after this he i had been dreading to hear she yet why who on god's earth save myself could know that carmel had been within these woeful walls to-night he i never stopped to question who was meant by this definite pronoun i was not even conscious of caring very much i was in a coil of threatening troubles but i was in it alone and greatly relieved by the discovery i drew myself up and stepped quickly forward into the room where the two officials stood their faces as they wheeled sharply about and took in my shoeless and more or less dishevelled figure told me with an eloquence which made my heart sink the unfortunate impression which my presence made upon them it was but a fleeting look for these men were both by nature and training easy masters of themselves but its language was unmistakable and i knew that if i were to hold my own with them i must get all of the support i could from the truth save where it would involve her from the truth and my own consciousness of innocence if i had any such consciousness i was not sure that i had for my falseness had precipitated this tragedy how i might never know but a knowledge of the how was not necessary to my self-condemnation nevertheless my hands were clean of this murder and allowing the surety of this fact to take a foremost place in my mind i faced these men and with a real feeling but as little display of it as possible i observed you have come to my aid in a critical moment this is my betrothed wife the woman i was to marry and i find her lying here dead in this closed and lonely house what does it mean i know no more than you do End of chapter three Chapter Four of the House of the Whispering Pines by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. The Old Candlestick. It is a damned and bloody work, the graceless action of a heavy hand, if that is to be the work of any hand. King John. The two men eyed me quietly then hexford pointed to my shoeless feet and sternly retorted permit us to doubt your last assertion you seem to be in better position than ourselves to explain the circumstances which puzzle you they were right it was for me to talk not for them i conceded the point in these words perhaps but you cannot always trust appearances i can explain my own presence here and the condition in which you find me but i cannot explain this tragedy near and dear as miss cumberland was to me 
i did not know she was in the building alive or dead i came upon her here covered with the cushions just as you found her i have felt the shock i do not look like myself i do not feel like myself it was enough here real emotion seized me and i almost broke down i was in a position much more dreadful than any they could imagine or should be allowed to their silence led me to examine their faces hexford's mouth had settled into a stiff straight line and the other man's wore a cynical smile i did not like at this presage of the difficulties awaiting me i felt one strand of the rope sustaining me above this yawning gulf of shame and ignominy crack and give way oh for a better record in the past a staff on which to lean in such an hour as this but while nothing serious clouded my name i had more to blush for than to pride myself upon in my career as prince of good fellows and these men knew it both of them and let it weigh in the scale already tipped far off its balance by coincidences which a better man than myself would have found it embarrassing to explain i recognized all this i say in the momentary glance i cast at their stern and unresponsive figures but the courage which had served me in lesser extremities did not fail me now and kneeling before my dead betrothed i kissed her cold white hand with sincere compunction before attempting the garbled and probably totally incoherent story with which i endeavoured to explain the inexplainable situation they listened i will do them that much justice but it was with such an air of incredulity that my words fell with less and less continuity and finally lost themselves in a confused stammer as i reached the point where i pulled the cushions from the couch and made my ghastly discovery you see see for yourselves what confronted me my betrothed a dainty delicate woman dead alone in this solitary far-away spot the victim of what i asked myself then i ask myself now i cannot understand it or those glasses yonder or those marks they were black by this time unmistakable not to be ignored by them or by me we understand those marks and you ought to came from the second man the one i did not know my head fell forward my lips refused to speak the words i saw as in a flash a picture of the one woman bending over the other terror reproach anguish in the eyes whose fixed stare would never more leave my consciousness an excess of rage or some such sudden passion animating the other whose every curve spoke tenderness whose every look up to this awful day had been as an angel's look to me the vision was a maddening one i shook myself free from it by starting to my feet it's it's i gasped she has been strangled quoth hicksford doggedly a dog's death mumbled the other my hands came together involuntarily at that instant with the memory before me of the vision i have just described i almost wished that it had been my hate my anger which had brought those tell-tale marks upon that livid skin i should have suffered less i should only have had to pay the penalty of my crime and not be forced to think of carmel with terrible revulsion as i was now thinking minute by minute fight with it as i would you had better sit down hexford suddenly suggested pushing a chair my way clark look up the telephone and ask for three more men i am going into this matter thoroughly perhaps you will tell us where the telephone is he asked turning my way it was some little time before i took in these words when i did i became conscious of his keen look also of a change in my own expression i had forgotten the telephone it had not yet been taken out if only i had remembered this before these men came i might have saved no nothing could have saved her or me except the snow 
that may already have saved her all this time i was trying to tell where the telephone was that i succeeded at last i judged from the fact that the second man left the room as he did so hexford lit the candle idly watching for nothing now could make me look at the lounge again i noticed the candlestick it was of brass and rare in style and workmanship a candlestick to be remembered one of a pair perhaps i felt my hair stir as i took in the details of its shape and ornamentation if its mate were in her house ah uh, no 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 i would not have it so i could not control my emotion if i let my imagination stray so far the candlestick must be the property of the club i had only forgotten it was bought when while thinking planning i was conscious of hexford's eyes fixed steadily upon me did you go into the kitchen in your wanderings below he asked no i began but seeing that i had made a mistake i bungled and added weakly yes after matches only matches that's all and did you get them yes in the dark you must have had trouble in finding them not at all only safety matches are allowed here and they are put in a receptacle at the side of each door i had but to open the kitchen door feel along the jam find this receptacle and pull the box out i am well used to all parts of the house and you did this i have said so may i ask which door you lead to the one communicating with the front hall where did you light your first match upstairs not in the kitchen no sir you are sure quite sure that's a pity i thought you might be able to tell me how so many wine and whiskey bottles came to be standing on the kitchen table i stared at him dazed then i remembered the two small glasses on the little table across the room and instinctively glanced at them but no whiskey had been drunk out of them the odour of anisette is unmistakable you carry the key to the wine cellar he asked i considered a moment i did not know what to make of the bottles on the kitchen table these women and bottles they abhorred wine they had reason to god knows i remembered the dinner and all that had signalized it and felt my confusion grow but a question had been asked and i must answer it it would not do for me to hesitate about a matter of this kind only what was the question something about a key i had no key the cellar had been ransacked without my help should i acknowledge this the keys were given up by the janitor yesterday i managed to stammer at last but i did not bring them here to-night they are in my rooms at home i finished with a gasp i had suddenly remembered that these keys were not in my rooms i had had them with me at miss cumberland's and given to fooling with something when embarrassed i had fooled with them and dropped them while talking with adelaide and watching carmel i had meant to pick them up but i forgot and you need say nothing more about it remarked hexford i have no right to question you at all and stepping across the room he took up the glasses one after the other and smelt of them some sweet stuff he remarked cordial i should say anisette there wasn't anything like that on the kitchen table let us see what is in here he added stepping into the adjoining small room into which i had simply peered in my own investigation of the place as he did so a keen blast blew in a window in the adjoining room was open he cast me a hurried glance and with the door in his hand made the following remark your lady love the victim here could not have come through the snow with no more clothing on her than we see now she must have worn a hat and coat or furs or something of that nature let us look for them i rose stumbling 
i saw that he did not mean to leave me alone for a moment indeed i did not wish to be left better any companionship than that of my own thoughts and of her white upturned face as i followed him into this closet he pushed the door wide pulling out an electric torch as he did so by its light we saw almost at first glance the coat and hat he professed to seek lying in a corner of the floor beside an overturned chair good left my companion's lips that's all straight you recognize these garments i nodded speechless a thousand memories rushed upon me at the sight of the long plush coat which i had so often buttoned about her with a troubled heart how her eyes would seek mine as we stood thus close together searching searching for the old love or the fancied love of which the ashes only remained torment all torment to remember now as hexford must have seen if the keenness of his intelligence equalled that of his eye at this moment the window which stood open was a small one a mere slit in the wall but it let in a stream of zero air and i saw hexford shiver as he stepped towards it and looked out but i felt hot rather than cold and when i instinctively put my hand to my forehead it came away wet End of chapter 4chapter five of the house of the whispering pines by anna katherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn a scrap of paper look to the lady and when we have our naked frailties hid that suffer in exposure let us meet and question this most bloody piece of work fears and scruples shake us in the great hand of god i stand and thence against the undivulged pretence i fight of treasonous malice macbeth shortly after this a fresh relay of police arrived and i could hear the whole house being ransacked i had found my shoes and was sitting in my own private room before a fire which had been lighted for me on the hearth i was in a state of stupor now and if my body shook as it did from time to time it was not from cold nor do i think from any special horror of mind or soul i felt too dull for that but in response to the shuddering pines which pressed up close to the house at this point and sowed and tapped at the walls and muttered among themselves with an insistence which i could not ignore notwithstanding my many reasons for self-absorption the storm which had been exceedingly fierce while it lasted had quieted down to a steady fall of snow had its mission been to serve as a blanket to this crime by wiping out from the old snow all tell-tale footsteps and such other records as simplify cases of this kind for the detectives it could not have happened more a propos to the event from the complaints which had already reached my ears from the two policemen i was quite aware that even as early as their first arrival they had found a clean page where possibly a few minutes before the whole secret of this tragedy may have been written in unmistakable characters and while this tilled me with relief in one way it added to my care in another for the storm which could accomplish so much in so short a time was a bitter one for a young girl to meet and carmel must have met it at its worst in her lonesome struggle homeward where was she living or dead where was she now and where was adelaide the two women who for the last six weeks had filled my life with so many unhallowed and conflicting emotions the conjecture passed incessantly through my brain but it passed idly also and was not answered even in thought indeed i seemed incapable of sustaining any line of thought for more than an instant and when after an indefinite length of time the door behind me opened the look i turned upon the gentleman who entered must have been a strange and far from encouraging one he brought a lantern with him so far the room had had no other illumination than such as came from the fire and when he had set his lantern down on the mantel and turned to face me i perceived 
with a sort of sluggish hope that he was dr perry once a practising physician and my father's intimate friend now a country official of no ordinary intelligence and what was better of no ordinary feeling his attachment to my father had not descended to me and for the moment he treated me like a stranger i am the coroner of this district said he i have left my bed to have a few words with you and learn if your detention here is warranted you are the president of this club and the lady whose violent death in this place i have been called upon to investigate is miss cumberland your affianced wife my assent though hardly audible was not to be misunderstood drawing up a chair he sat down and something in his manner which was not wholly without sympathy heartened me still more dispelling some of the cloudiness which had hitherto befogged my faculties they have told me what you had to say in explanation of your presence here where a crime of some nature has taken place but i should like to hear the story from your own lips i feel that i owe you this consideration at all events i am disposed to show it this is no common case of violence and the parties to it are not of the common order miss cumberland's virtue and social standing no one can question while you are the son of a man who has deservedly been regarded as an honour to the town you have been intending to marry miss cumberland yes i looked the man directly in the eye our wedding day was set did you love her pardon me if i am to be of any benefit to you at this crisis i must strike at the root of things if you do not wish to answer say so mr Ranelagh. i do wish this was a lie but what was i to do knowing how dangerous it would be for carmel to have it publicly known where my affections were really centred and what a secret tragedy of hard struggle and jealous passion underlay this open one of foul and murderous death i am in no position to conceal anything from you i did love miss cumberland we have been engaged for a year she was a woman of fortune but i am not without means of my own and could have chosen a penniless girl and still been called prosperous i say and she returned your love sincerely was the room light enough to reveal my guilty flush she had loved me only too well too jealously too absorbingly for her happiness or mine and the sister it was gently but gravely put and instantly i knew that our secret was out however safe we had considered it this man was cognizant of it and if he why not others why not the whole town a danger which up to this moment i had heard whispered only by the pines was opening in a gulf beneath our feet its imminence steadied me i had kept my glance on coroner perry and i do not think it changed my tone i am quite assured was almost as quiet and grave as his as i made my reply in these words her sister is her sister i hardly think that either of us would be apt to forget that have you heard otherwise sir he was prepared for equivocation possibly for denial but not for attack his manner changed and showed distrust and i saw that i had lost rather than made by this venturous move is this your writing he suddenly asked showing me a morsel of paper which he had drawn from his vest pocket i looked and felt that i now understood what the pines had been trying to tell me for the last few hours that compromising scrap of writing had not been destroyed it existed for her and my undoing then doubt came fate could not juggle thus with human souls and purposes i had simply imagined myself to have recognized the words lengthening and losing themselves in a blur before my eyes carmel was no fool even if she had wild and demoniacal moments this could not be my note to her that fatal note which would make all denial of our mutual passion unavailing is it your writing my watchful inquisitor repeated i looked again the scrap was smaller than my note had been when it left my hands if it were the same then some of the words were gone were they the first ones or the last 
it would make a difference in the reading or rather in the conclusions to be drawn from what remained if only the mist would clear from before my eyes or he would hold the slip of paper nearer the room was very dark the the is it your writing coroner perry asked for the third time there was no denying it my writing was peculiar and quite unmistakable i should gain nothing by saying no it looks like it i admitted reluctantly but i cannot be sure in this light may i ask what this bit of paper is and where you found it its contents i think you know as for the last question i think you can answer that also if you will saying which he quietly replaced the scrap of paper in his pocket-book i followed the action with my eyes i caught a fresh glimpse of a darkened edge and realized the cause of the faint odor which i had hitherto experienced without being conscious of it the scrap had been plucked out of the chimney she had tried to burn it i remembered the fire and the smouldering bits of paper which crumbled at my touch and this one this the most important the only important one of them all had flown half scorched up the chimney and clung there within easy reach the whole incident was plain to me and i could even fix upon the moment when hexford or clark discovered this invaluable bit of evidence it was just before i burst in upon them from the ballroom and it was the undoubted occasion of the remark i had then overheard this settles it he cannot escape us now during the momentary silence which now ensued i tried to remember the exact words which had composed this note they were few sparks from my very heart i ought to be able to recollect them to-night ten thirty train we will be married at p come come my darling my life she will forgive when all is done hesitation will only undo us to-night at ten thirty do not fail me i shall never marry any one but you was that all i had an indistinct remembrance of having added some wild and incoherent words of passionate affection affixed to her name her name but it may be that in the hurry and flurry of the moment these terms of endearment simply passed through my mind and found no expression on paper i could not be sure any more than i could be positive from the half glimpse i got of these lines which portion had been burnt off the top in which the word train occurred or the final words emphasizing a time of meeting and my determination to marry no one but the person addressed the first gone the letter might take on any sinister meaning the letter gone the first might prove a safeguard corroborating my statement that an errand had taken me into town i was oppressed by the uncertainty of my position even if i carried off this detail successfully others of equal importance might be awaiting explanation my poor maddened guilt-haunted girl had made the irreparable mistake of letting this note of mine fly unconsumed up the chimney and she might have made others equally incriminating it would be hard to find an alibi for her if suspicion once turned her away she had not met me at the train the unknown but doubtless easily to be found man who had handed me her note could swear to that fact then the note itself i had destroyed it it is true but its phrases were so present to my mind had been so branded into it by the terrors of the tragedy which they appeared to foreshadow that i had a dreadful feeling that this man's eye could read them there i remember that under the compelling power of this fancy my hand rose to my brow outspread and concealing as if to interpose a barrier between him and them is my folly past belief possibly but then i have not told you the words of this fatal communication they were these innocent if she were innocent but how suggestive in the light of her probable guilt i cannot wait till to-morrow then you will see the depth of my love for you what i owe you what i owe adelaide i should see i was seeing suddenly i dropped my hand a new thought had come to me had carmel been discovered on the road leading from this place 
you perceive that by this time i had become the prey of every threatening possibility even of that which made the present a nightmare from which i should yet awake to old conditions and old struggles bad enough god knows but not like this not like this meantime i was conscious that not a look or movement of mine had escaped the considerate but watchful eye of the man before me you do not relish my questions he dryly observed perhaps you would rather tell your story without interruption if so i beg you to be as explicit as possible the circumstances are serious enough for perfect candour on your part he was wrong they were too serious for that perfect candour would involve carmel seeming candour was all i could indulge in i took a quick resolve i would appear to throw discretion to the winds to confide to him what men usually hold sacred to risk my reputation as a gentleman rather than incur a suspicion which might involve others more than it did myself perhaps i should yet win through and save her from an ignominy she possibly deserved but which she must never receive at my hands i will give you an account of my evening i said it will not aid you much but will prove my good faith you asked me a short time ago if i loved the lady whom i was engaged to marry and whose dead body i most unexpectedly came upon in this house some time before midnight i answered yes and you showed that you doubted me you were justified in your doubts i did love her once or I thought so but my feelings changed a great temptation came into my life carmel returned from school and you know her beauty her fascination a week in her presence and marriage with adelaide became impossible but how evaded i only knew the coward's way to lure this inexperienced young girl fresh from school into a runaway match a change which now became perceptible in miss cumberland's manner only egged me on it was not sufficiently marked in character to call for open explanation yet it was unmistakable to one in the watch as i was and betokened a day of speedy reckoning for which i was little prepared i know what the manly course would have been but i preferred to skulk i acknowledge it now it is the only retribution i have to offer for a past i am ashamed of without losing one particle of my intention i governed more carefully my looks and actions and thought i had succeeded in blinding adelaide to my real feelings and purpose whether i did or not i cannot say i have no means of knowing now she has not been her natural self for these last few days but she had other causes for worry and i have been willing enough to think that these were the occasion of her restless ways and short sharp speech and the blankness with which she met all my attempts to soothe and encourage her this evening i choked at the word the day had been one string of extraordinary experiences accumulating in intensity to the one ghastly discovery which had overtopped and overwhelmed all the rest this evening i falteringly continued i had set as the limit of my endurance of the intolerable situation during a minute of solitude preceding the dinner at miss cumberland's house on the hill i wrote a few lines to her sister urging her to trust me with her fate and meet me at the station in time for the ten-thirty train i meant to carry her at once to p where i had a friend in the ministry who would at once unite us in marriage i was very peremptory for my nerves were giving way under the secret strain to which they had been subjected for so long and she herself was looking worn with her own silent and uncommunicated conflict to write this note was easy but to deliver it involved difficulties miss cumberland's eyes seemed to be more upon me than usual mine were obliged to respond and carmel seeing this kept hers on her plate or on the other person seated at the table her brother arthur but the opportunity came as we all rose and passed together into the drawing-room carmel fell into place at my side and i slipped the note into her hand she had not expected it and i fear that the action was observed for when i took my leave of miss cumberland shortly after i was struck by her expression 
i had never seen such a look on her face before nor can i conceive of one presenting a more extraordinary contrast to the few and commonplace words with which she bade me good evening i could not forget that look i continued to see those pinched features and burning eyes all the way home where i went to get my gripsack and i saw them all the way to the station though my thoughts were with her sister and the joys i had planned for myself man's egotism dr perry i neither knew adelaide nor did i know the girl whose love i had so overestimated she failed me dr perry i was met at the station not by herself but by a letter a few hurried lines given me by an unknown man in which she stated that i had asked too much of her that she could not so wrong her sister who had brought her up and done everything for her since her mother died i have not that letter now or i would show it to you in my raging disappointment i tore it up on the place where i received it and threw the pieces away i had staked my whole future on one desperate throw and i had lost if i had had a pistol i stopped warned by an uneasy movement on the part of the man i addressed that i had better not dilate too much upon my feelings indeed i had forgotten to whom i was talking i realized nothing thought of nothing but the misery i was describing his action recalled me to the indefinitely deeper misery of my present situation and conscious of the conclusions which might now be drawn from such impulsive utterances i pulled myself together and proceeded to finish my story with greater directness i did not leave the station till the ten thirty train had gone i had hopes still of seeing her or possibly i dreaded the long ride back to my apartments it was from sheer preoccupation of mind that i drove this way instead of straight out by marshall avenue i had no intention of stopping here the club-house was formally closed yesterday as you may know and i did not even have the keys with me but as i reached the bend in the road where you get your first sight of the buildings i saw a thin streak of smoke rising from one of its chimneys and anxious as to its meaning i drove in wait mr Rinillay. i'm sorry to interrupt you but by which gate did you enter by the lower one was it snowing at this time not yet it was just before the clouds rushed upon the moon i could see everything quite plainly my companion nodded and i went breathlessly on any question of his staggered me i was so ignorant of the facts at his command or of the facts at any one's command outside my own experience and observation that the simplest admission i made might lead directly to some clue of whose very existence i was unaware i was not even able to conjecture by what chance or at whose suggestion the police had raided the place and discovered the tragedy which had given point to that raid no one had told me and i had met with no encouragement to ask i felt myself sliding amid pitfalls my own act might precipitate the very doom i sought to avert yet i must preserve my self-possession and answer all questions as truthfully as possible lest i stumble into a web from which no skill of my own or of another could extricate me fastening my horse to one of the pine trees in the thickest clump i saw he is there now i suppose i crept up to the house and tried the door it was on the latch and i stole in there was no light on the lower floor and after listening for any signs of life i began to feel my way about the house searching for the intruder as i did not wish to attract attention to myself i took off my shoes i went through the lower rooms and then i came upstairs it was some time before i reached the the room where a fire had been lit but when i did i knew not i hastily corrected as i caught his quick concentrated glance what had happened or whom i should find there but that this was the spot where the intruder had been possibly was now and i determined to grapple with him what what have i said i asked in anguish as i caught a look on the coroner's face of irrepressible repulsion and disgust slight and soon gone but unmistakable so long as it lasted nothing he replied go on but his tone 
considerate as it had been from the first, did not deceive me. I knew that I had been detected in some slip of prevarication. As I had omitted all mention of the most serious part of my adventure, had said nothing of my vision of Carmel or the terrible conclusions which her presence there had awakened, my conscience was in a state of perturbation which added greatly to my confusion. For a moment I did not know where I stood, and I am afraid I betrayed a sense of my position. He had to recall me to myself by an unimportant question or two before I could go on. When I did proceed, it was with less connection of ideas, and a haste in speaking which was not due altogether to the harrowing nature of the tale itself. "'I had matches in my pocket and I struck one,' I began. Afterwards I lit the candle. The emptiness of the room did not alarm me. I experienced the sense of tragedy. Seeing the pillows heaped high and too regularly for chance, along a lounge ordinarily holding only two, I tore them off. I saw a foot, a hand, a tress of bright hair. Even then I did not think of her. Why should I? Not till I discovered her face did I know the terrors of my discovery, and then the confusion of it all unmanned me, and I fell on my knees. Go on, go on. The impetuosity, the suspense in the words astounded me. I stared at the coroner and lost the thread of my story. What had I to say more? How account for what must be ever unaccountable to him, to the world, to my own self, if in obedience to the demands of the situation I subdued my own memory and blotted out all I had seen but that which it was safe to confess to? There is no more to say, I murmured. The horror of that moment made a chaos in my mind. I looked at the dead body of her who lay there, as I have looked at everything since, as I looked at the police when they came, as I look at you now. But I know nothing. It is all a phantasmagoria to me, with no more meaning than a nightmare. She is dead, I know that, but beyond that all is doubt, confusion, what the world and all its passing show is to a blind man. I can neither understand nor explain. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of the House of the Whispering Pines by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Six Comments and Reflections. There is no agony and no solace left. Earth can console, heaven can torment, no more. Prometheus Sunbound. The coroner's intent look, which had more or less sustained me through this ordeal, remained fixed upon my face, as though he was still anxious to see me exonerate myself. How much did he know? That was the question. How much did he know? Having no means of telling, I was forced to keep silent. I had revealed all I dared to. As I came to this conclusion, his eyes fell, and I knew that the favourable minute had passed. The question he now asked proved it. You say that you were not blind to surrounding objects, even if they conveyed but little meaning to you. You must have seen, then, that the room where Miss Cumberland lay contained two small cordial glasses, both still moist with some liquor. I noticed that, yes. Someone must have drunk with her. I cannot contradict you. Was Miss Cumberland fond of that sort of thing? She detested liquor of all kinds. She never drank. I never saw a woman so averse to wine. I spoke before I thought. I might better have been less emphatic, but the mystery of those glasses had affected me from the first. Neither she nor Carmel ever allowed themselves so much as a social glass, yet those glasses had been drained. Perhaps the cold. There was a third glass. We found it in the adjoining closet. It had not been used. That third glass has a meaning, if only we could find it out. A possibility which had risen in my mind faded at these words. Three glasses, I dully repeated. 
and a small flask of cordial the latter seems pure enough i cannot understand it the phrase had become stereotyped no other suggested itself to me the problem would be simple enough if it were not for those marks on her neck you saw those too i take it yes who made them what man the lie or rather the suggestion of a lie flushed my face i was conscious of this but it did not trouble me i was panting for relief i could not rest till i knew the nature of the doubt in this man's mind if these words or any words i could use would serve to surprise his secret then welcome the lie or suggestion of a lie it was a brute's act i went on bungling with my sentences in anxiety to see if my conclusions fitted in with his own who was the brute do you know dr perry there were three glasses in those rooms only two were drank from he answered steadily to-morrow i may be in a position to answer your question i am not to-night why did i take heart not a change not the flicker of one had passed over his countenance at my utterance of the word man either his official habit had stood him in wonderful stead or the police had failed so far to see any connection between this murder and the young girl whose footprints for all i knew still lingered on the stairs would the morrow arm them with complete knowledge as i turned from his retreating figure and flung myself down before the hearth this was the question i continually propounded to myself in vain repetition would the morrow reveal the fact that adelaide's young sister had been with her in the hour of death or would the fates propitiously aid her in preserving the secret as they had already aided her in selecting for the one man who shared it him who of all others was bound by honour and personal consideration for her not to divulge what he knew thus the hours between two and seven passed when i fell into a fitful sleep from which i was rudely awakened by a loud rattle at my door followed by the entrance of the officer who had walked up and down the corridor all night the wagon is here said he breakfast will be given to you at the station to which hexford looking over his shoulder said i'm sorry to say that we have here the warrant for your arrest can i do anything for you warrant i burst out what do you want of a warrant it is as a witness you seek to detain me i presume no was his brusque reply the charge upon which you are arrested is one of murder you will have to appear before a magistrate i am sorry to be the one to tell you this but the evidence against you is very strong and the police must do their duty but i am innocent absolutely innocent i protested the perspiration starting from every pore as the full meaning of the charge burst upon me what i have told you was correct i myself found her dead hexford gave me a look don't talk he kindly suggested leave that to the lawyers then as the other man turned aside for a moment he whispered in my ear it's no go one of our men saw you with your fingers on her throat he had clambered into a pine tree and the shade of your window was up you had better come quietly not a soul believes you innocent this then was what had doomed me from the start this and that partly burnt letter i understood now why the kind-hearted coroner who loved my father had urged me to tell my tale hoping that i would explain this act and give him some opportunity to indulge in a doubt and i had failed to respond to the hint he had given me the act itself must appear so sinister and the impulse which drove me to it so incomprehensible without the heart-rending explanation i dare not subjoin that i never questioned the wisdom of silence in its regard yet this silence had undone me i had been seen fingering my dead fiancée's throat and nothing i could now say or do would ever convince people that she was dead before my hands touched her strangled by another's clutch one person only in the whole world could know and feel how false this accusation was 
and yesterday that one's trust in my guiltlessness would have thrown a ray of light upon the deepest infamy which could befall me but to-day they had settled over that once innocent spirit a cloud of too impenetrable a nature for any light to struggle to and fro between us i could not contemplate that cloud i could not dwell upon her misery or upon the revulsion of feeling which follows such impetuous acts and it had been an impetuous act the result of one of her rages i had been told of these rages i had even seen her in one when they passed she was her lovable self once more and very penitent and very downcast if all i feared were true she was suffering acutely now but i gave no thought to this i could dream of but one thing how to save her from the penalty of crime a penalty i might be forced to suffer myself and would prefer to suffer rather than see it fall upon one so young and so angelically beautiful turning to the officer next to me i put the question which had been burning in my mind for hours tell me how you came to know that there was trouble here what brought you to this house there can be nothing wrong in telling me that well if you don't know he began i do not i broke in i guess you'd better wait till the chief has had a word with you i suppressed all tokens of my disappointment and by a not unnatural reaction perhaps began to take in and busy myself with the very considerations i had hitherto shunned where was carmel and how was she enduring these awful hours had repentance come and with it a desire to own her guilt did she think of me and the effect this unlooked-for death would have upon my feelings that i should suffer arrest for her crime could not have entered her mind i had seen her but she had not seen me in the dark hall which i must now traverse as a prisoner and a suspect no intimation of my dubious position or its inevitable consequences had reached her yet when it did what would she do i did not know her well enough to tell the attraction she had felt for me had not been strong enough to lead her to accommodate herself to my wishes and marry me offhand but it had been strong enough to nerve her arm in whatever altercation she may have had with her jealous-minded sister it was the temper and not the strength of the love which would tell in a strait like this would it prove of a generous kind should i have to combat her desire to take upon herself the full blame of her deed with all its shames and penalties or should i have the still deeper misery of finding her careless to my position and welcoming any chance which diverted suspicion from herself either supposition might be possible according to my judgment in this evil hour all communication between us in spite of our ardent and ungovernable passion had been so casual and so slight looks a whispered word or so one furtive clasp in which our hands seemed to grow together were all that i had to go upon as tests of her feeling towards me her character i had judged from her face which was lovely but faces deceive and the loveliness of youth is not like the loveliness of age an absolute mirror of the soul within was not medusa captivating for all her snaky locks hide those locks and one might have thought her a daphne what would relieve my doubts as hexford drew near me again on our way to the head of the staircase i summoned up courage to ask have you heard anything from the hill has the news of this tragedy been communicated to miss cumberland's family and if so how are they bearing this affliction his lip curled and for a minute he hesitated then something in my aspect of the straightforward look i gave him softened him and he answered frankly if coldly word has gone there of course but only the servants are affected by it so far miss cumberland the younger is very ill and the boy i don't know his name has not shown up since last evening he is very dissipated they say and may be in one of the joints in the lower part of the town i stopped in dismay clutching wildly at the railing of the stairs we were descending i had hardly heard the latter words all my mind was on what he had said first miss carmel cumberland ill i stammered too ill to be told i was sufficiently master of myself to put it this way yes he rejoined kindly 
as he urged me down the very stairs i had seen her descend in such a state of mind a few hours before a servant who had been out late heard the fall of some heavy body as she was passing miss cumberland's room and rushing in found miss carmel as she called her lying on the floor near the open fire her face had struck the bars of the grate in falling and she was badly burned but that was not all she was delirious with fever brought on they think by anxiety about her sister whose name she was constantly repeating they had a doctor for her and the whole house was up before ever the word came of what had happened here i thanked him with a look i had no opportunity for more half a dozen officers were standing about the front door and in another moment i was bustled into the conveyance provided and was being driven away from the death-haunted spot i had heard the last whisper of those pines for many many days but not in my dreams it ever came back at night sinister awesome haunted with dead hopes and breathing of an ever doubtful future End of chapter six chapter seven part one of the house of the whispering pines by anna catherine green this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Clifton accepts my case. Part one. This hand of mine is yet a maiden and an innocent hand, not painted with the crimson spots of blood. Within this bosom never entered yet the dreadful motion of a murderous thought. King John my first thought when i could think at all was this she has some feeling then her terror and remorse have maddened her i can dwell upon her image with pity the next will they find her wet clothes and discover that she was out last night the latter possibility troubled me my mind was the seat of strange contradictions as the day advanced and i began to realize that i Elwood Ranelagh, easy-going man of the world, but with traditions of respectable living on both sides of my house, and a list of friends of which any man might be proud, was in a place of detention on the awful charge of murder. I found that my keenest torment arose from the fact that I was shut off from the instant knowledge of what was going on in the house where all my thoughts, my fears, and I shall say it, latent hopes were centred to know carmel ill and not to know how ill to feel the threatening arm of the law hovering constantly over her head and neither to know the instant of its fall nor be given the least opportunity to divert it to realize that some small inadvertence on her part some trivial but incriminating object left about some heedless murmur or burst of unconscious frenzy might precipitate her doom and i remain powerless bearing my share of suspicion and ignominy it is true but not the chief share if matters befell as i have suggested which they were liable to do at any hour nay at any minute my examination before the magistrate held one element of comfort nothing in its whole tenor went to show that as yet she was in the least suspected of any participation in my so-called crime but the knowledge which came later of how the police first learned of trouble at the club-house did not add to this sense of relief whatever satisfaction it gave my curiosity a cry of distress had come to them over the telephone a wild cry in a woman's choked and tremulous voice help at the whispering pines help that was all or all they revealed to me in their endeavour to find out whether or not i was present when this call was made i learned the nature of their own suspicions they believed that adelaide in some moment of prevision had managed to reach the telephone and sent out this message but what did i believe what could i believe all the incidents of the deadly struggle which must have preceded the fatal culminating act were mysteries which my mind refused to penetrate after hours of torturing uncertainty and an evening which was the miserable precursor of a still more miserable night 
i decided to drop conjecture and await the enlightenment which must come with the morrow it was therefore in a condition of mingled dread and expectation that i opened the paper which was brought to me the next morning of the shock which it gave me to see my own name blotting the page with suggestions of hideous crime i will not speak but pass at once to the few gleams of added knowledge i was able to gather from these abominable columns arthur the good-for-nothing brother had returned from his wild carouse and had taken affairs in charge with something like spirit and a decent show of repentance for his own shortcomings and the mad taste for liquor which had led him away from home that night carmel was still ill and likely to be so for many days to come her case was diagnosed as one of brain fever and of a most dangerous type doctors and nurses were busy at her bedside and little hope was held out of her being able to tell soon if ever what she knew of her sister's departure from the house on that fatal evening that her testimony on this point would be invaluable was self-evident for proofs were plenty of her having haunted her sister's rooms all evening in a condition of more or less delirium she was alone in the house and this may have added to her anxieties all of the servants having gone to the policeman's ball it was on their return in the early morning hours that she had been discovered lying ill and injured before her sister's fireplace one fact was mentioned which set me thinking the keys of the club-house had been found lying on the table in the side hall of the cumberland mansion the keys which i have already mentioned as missing from my pocket an alarming discovery which might have acted as a clue to the suspicious i feared if their presence there had not been explained by the waitress who had cleared the table after dinner coming upon these keys lying on the floor besides one of the chairs she had carried them out into the hall and laid them where they would be more readily seen she had not recognized the keys but had taken it for granted that they belonged to mr ranelagh who had dined at the house that night they were my keys and i have already related how i came to drop them on the floor had they but stayed there adelaide or was it carmel might not have seen them and been led by some strange if not tragic purpose incomprehensible to us now and possibly never to find full explanation to enter the secret and forsaken spot where i later found them the one dead the other fleeing in frenzy but not in such a thoughtless frenzy as to forget these keys or to fail to lock the club-house door behind her that she on her return home should have had sufficient presence of mind to toss these keys down in the same place from which she or her sister had taken them argued well for her clear-headedness up to that moment the fever must have come on later a fever which with my knowledge of what had occurred at the whispering pines seemed the only natural outcome of this situation the next paragraph detailed a fact startling enough to rouse my deepest interest zadok brown the cumberlance's coachman declared that arthur's cutter and what he called the gray mare had been out that night they were both in place when he returned to the stable towards early morning but the signs were unmistakable that both had been out in the snow since he left the stable at about nine he had locked the stable door at that time but the key always hung in the kitchen where any one could get it this was on account of arthur who if he wanted to go out late sometimes harnessed a horse himself zadok judged that he had done so this night though how the horse happened to be back in her stall and no mr arthur in the house it would take wiser heads than his to explain but he was sure the mare had been out there was some comment made on this because arthur had denied using his cutter that night he declared instead that he had gone out on foot and designated the coachman's tail as all bush i was not the only one who had a drop too much downtown was the dogged assertion with which he met all questions on this subject i wouldn't give a snap of my finger for sadoc's opinion on any subject after five hours of dancing and the necessary drinks there were no signs of the mare having been out when i got home as this was about noon the next day his opinion on this point could not be said to count for much 
as for myself i felt inclined to believe that the mare had been out that one or both of the women had harnessed him and that it was by these means that they had reached the whispering pines the night was too cold a storm too imminent for them to have contemplated so long a walk on a road so remote as that leading to the club-house arthur was athletic but adelaide was far from strong and never addicted to walking under the most favourable conditions of all the mysteries surrounding her dead presence in the club-house the one which from the first had struck me as the most inexplicable was the manner of her reaching there now i could understand both that fact and how carmel had succeeded in returning in safety to her home she had ridden both ways a theory which likewise explained how she came to wear a man's derby and possibly a man's overcoat with her skirts covered by a bearskin she would present a very fair figure of a man to any one who chanced to pass her this was desirable in her case a man and woman driving at a late hour through the city streets would attract little if any attention while two women might having no wish to attract attention they had resorted to subterfuge or carmel had it was not like adelaide to do so she was always perfectly open both in manner and speech these were my deductions drawn from my own knowledge would others who had not my knowledge be in any wise influenced to draw the same would the fact that the mare had been out during those mysterious hours when everybody had appeared to be absent from the house saving the one young girl whom they afterwards found stark staring mad with delirium serve to awaken suspicion of her close and personal connection with this crime there was nothing in this reporter's article to show that such an idea had dawned upon his mind but the police are not readily hoodwinked and i dreaded the result of their inquiries if they chose to follow this undoubted clue yet if they let this point slip where should i be human nature is human all the way through and i could not help having moments when i asked myself if this young girl were worth the sacrifice i contemplated making for her she was lovely to look at amiable and of womanly promise save at those rare and poignant moments when passion would seize her in a gust which drove everything before it but were any of these considerations sufficient to justify me in letting my whole manhood slip for the sake of one who whatever the provocation had used the strength of her hands against the sister who had been as a mother to her for so many years that she had had provocation i did not doubt adelaide for all her virtues was not an easy person to deal with upright and perfectly sincere herself she had no sympathy with or commiseration for any lack of principle or any display of selfishness in others a little cold a little reserved a little lacking in spontaneity though always correct and always generous in her gifts and open in her acts her whole nature would rise at any evidence of meanness or ingratitude and though she said little you would feel her disapprobation through and through she would even change physically naturally pallid and of small inconspicuous features her eyes on these occasions would so flame and her whole figure so dilate that she looked like another woman i have seen her brother six feet in height and weighty for his years cringe under her few quiet words at these times till she absolutely seemed the taller of the two it was only in these moments she was handsome and had i loved her i should probably have admired this passionate purity this intolerance of all that was small or selfish or unworthy of a good woman's esteem but not loving her i had merely cherished a wholesome fear of her displeasure and could quite comprehend what a full display of anger on her part might call up in her sensitive already deeply suffering sister the scathing arraignment the unbearable taunt well well it was all dream-work but i had time to dream and opportunity for little else and pictures which till now i had sedulously kept in the background of my imagination would come to the front as i harped on this topic and weighed in my disturbed mind the following question 
should i continue the course which i had instinctively taken out of a natural sense of chivalry or face my calumniators with the truth and leave my cause and hers to the justice of men rather than to the slow but righteous workings of providence i struggled with the dilemma for hours the more so that i did not stand alone in the world i had relatives and i had friends some of whom had come to see me and gone away deeply grieved at my reticence. i was swayed too by another consideration i had deeply loved my mother she was dead but i had her honour to think of should it be said she had a murderer for her son in the height of my inner conflict i had almost cried aloud the fierce denial which would arise at this thought but ere the word could leave my lips such a vision rose before me of a bewildering young face with wonderful eyes and a smile too innocent for guile and too loving for hypocrisy that i forgot my late antagonistic feelings forgot the claims of my dear dead mother and even those of my own future such passion and such devotion merited consideration from the man who had called them forth i would not slight the claims of my dead mother but i would give this young girl a chance for her life let others ferret out the fact that she had visited the club-house with her sister i would not proclaim it it was enough for me to proclaim my innocence and that i would do to the last i was in this frame of mind when charles clifton called and was allowed to see me i had sent for him in one of my discouraged moods he was my friend but he was also my legal adviser and it was as such i had summoned him and it was as such he had now come cordial as our relations had been though he was hardly one of my ilk i noticed no instinctive outstretching of his hand and so did not reach out mine appearances had been too strong against me for any such spontaneous outburst from even my best friends i realized that to expect otherwise from him or from any other man would be to play the fool and this was no time for folly the day for that was past i was the first to speak you see me where you have never thought to see a friend of yours but we won't go into that the police have good reasons for what they have done and i presume feel justified in my commitment notwithstanding i am an innocent man so far as the attack made upon miss cumberland goes i had no hand in her murder if murder it is found out to be my story which you have read in the papers and which i felt forced to give out possibly to my own shame and that of another whom i would fain have saved it is an absolutely true one i did not arrive at the whispering pines until after miss cumberland was dead to this i am ready to swear and it is upon this fact you must rely in any defence you might hereafter be called upon to make in my regard he listened as a lawyer would be apt to listen to such statements from the man who had summoned him to his aid but i saw that i had made no impression on his convictions he regarded me as a guilty man and what was more to the point no doubt as one for whom no plea could be made or any rational defence undertaken you don't believe me i went on still without any great bitterness i am not surprised at it after what the man clark has said of seeing me with my hands on her throat any man friend or not would take me for a villain after that but charles to you i will confess what cowardice kept me from owning to dr perry at the proper possibly at the only proper moment that i did this out of a wild desire to see if those marks were really the marks of strangling fingers i could not believe that she had been so killed and led away by my doubts i leaned over her and you shall believe me you must i insisted as i perceived his hard gaze remain unsoftened i don't ask it of the rest of the world i hardly expect any one to give me credit for good impulses or even for speaking the plain truth after the discovery which has been made of my treacherous attitude towards these two virtuous and devoted women but you if you are to act as my counsel must take this denial from me as gospel truth 
i may disappoint you in other ways i may try you and often make you regret that you undertook my case but on this fact you may safely pin your faith she was dead before i touched her had the police spy whose testimony is likely to hang me climbed the tree a moment sooner than he did he would have seen that are you ready to take my case clifton is a fair fellow and i knew if he once accepted the fact i thus urged upon him he would work for me with all the skill and ability my desperate situation demanded i therefore watched him with great anxiety for the least change in the constrained attitude and fixed unpromising gaze with which he had listened to me and was conscious of a great leap of heart as the set expression of his features relaxed and he responded almost warmly i will take your case ranelay god help me to make it good against all odds end of chapter seven part one chapter seven part two of the house of the whispering pines by anna katherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn clifton accepts my case part two i was conscious of few hopes but some of the oppression under which i laboured lifted at those words i had assured one man of my innocence it was like a great rock in the weary desert my sigh of relief bespoke my feelings and i longed to take his hand but the moment had not yet come something was wanting to a perfect confidence between us and i was in too sensitive a frame of mind to risk the slightest rebuff he was ready to speak before i was then you had not been long on the scene of crime when the police arrived i had been in the room but a few minutes i do not know how long i was searching the house the police say that fully twenty minutes elapsed between the time they received miss cumberland's appeal for help and their arrival at the club-house if you were there that long i cannot say moments are hours in such a crisis i my emotions were too much for me and i confusedly stopped he was surveying me with the old distrust in a moment i saw why you're not open with me he protested why should moments be hours to you previous to the instant when you stripped those pillows from the couch you are not a fanciful man nor have you any cowardly instincts why were you in such a turmoil going through a house where you could have expected to find nothing worse than some miserable sneak thief this was a poser i had laid myself open to suspicion by one thoughtless admission and what was worse it was but the beginning in all probability of many other possible mistakes i had never taken the trouble to measure my words and the whole truth being impossible i necessarily must make a slip now and then he had better be warned of this i did not wish him to undertake my course blindfolded he must understand its difficulties while believing in my innocence then if he chose to draw back well and good i should have to face the situation alone charles said i as soon as i could perfectly control my speech you are quite just in your remark i am not and cannot be perfectly open with you i shall tell you no lies but beyond that i cannot promise i am caught in a net not altogether of my own weaving so far i will be frank with you a common question may trip me up others find me free and ready with my defence you have chanced upon one of the former i was in the turmoil of mind from the moment of my entrance into that fatal house but i can give no reason for it unless i am as you hinted a coward he settled that supposition with a gesture i had rather not have seen it would be better for him to consider me a poltroon than to suspect my real reasons for the agitation which i had acknowledged you say you cannot be open with me that means you have certain memories connected with that night which you cannot divulge right charles but not memories of guilt of active guilt i mean 
this i have previously insisted on and this is what you must believe i am not even an accessory before the fact i am perfectly innocent so far as adelaide's death is concerned you may proceed on that basis without fear that is if you continue to take an interest in my case if not i shall be the last to blame you little honour is likely to occur to you from defending me i have accepted the case and i shall continue to interest myself in it he assured me with a dogged rather than genial persistence but i should like to know what i am to work upon if it cannot be shown that her call for help came before you entered the building that would be the best defence possible of course i replied but neither from your standpoint nor mine is it a feasible one i have no proof of my assertion i never looked at my watch from the time i left the station till i found it run down this very morning the club-house clock has been out of order for some time and was not running all i know and can swear to about the length of time i was in that building prior to the arrival of the police since she was not only dead and buried under those accumulated cushions but in a room some little distance from the telephone that will do for me said he but scarcely for those who are prejudiced against you everything points so indisputably to your guilt the note which you say you wrote to carmel to meet you at the station looks very much more like one to miss cumberland to meet you at the club-house it was thus i first learned which part of this letter had been burned off footnote it was the top portion leaving the rest to read come come my darling my life she will forgive when all is done hesitation will only undo us to-night at ten thirty i shall never marry any one but you it was also evident that i had failed to add those expressions of affection linked to carmel's name which had been in my mind and awakened my keenest apprehension End of footnote. otherwise he pursued what could have taken her there everybody who knew her will ask that such a night so soon after seeing you it is a mystery anyway but one entirely inconceivable without some excuse for her these lines said come and she went for reasons which may be clear to you who were acquainted with her weak as well as strong points went how no one knows by chance or by intention on her part or yours every servant was out of the house by nine o'clock and her brother too only the sister remained the sister whom you profess to have urged to leave the town with you that very evening and she can tell us nothing may die without ever being able to do so some shock of her feelings you may know its character and you may not drove her from a state of apparent health into the wildest delirium in a few hours it was not your letter if your story is true about that letter or she would have shown its effect immediately upon receiving it that is in the early evening and she did not helen one of the maids declares that she saw her some time after you left the house and that she wore anything but a troubled look that in fact her countenance was beaming and so beautiful that accustomed as the girl was to her young mistress's good looks she was more than struck by her appearance and spoke of it afterwards at the ball a telling circumstance against you ranelay not only contradicting your own story but showing that her after condition sprang from some sudden and extreme apprehension in connection with her sister did you speak no i had not spoken i had nothing to say i was too deeply shaken by what he had just told me to experience anything but the utmost confusion of ideas carmel beaming and beautiful at an hour i had supposed her suffering i could not reconcile it with a letter she had written me or with that understanding with her sister which ended so hideously in the whispering pines the lawyer seeing my helpless state proceeded with his presentation of my case as it looked to unprejudiced eyes miss cumberland comes to the club-house so do you you have not the keys and so go searching about the building till you find an unlocked window by which you both enter there are those who say you purposely left this window unfastened when you went about the house the day before that you dropped the keys in her house where they would be sure to be found 
and drove down to the station and stood about there for a good half hour in order to divert suspicion from yourself afterwards and create an alibi in case it should be wanted i do not believe any of this myself not since accepting your assurance of innocence but there are those who do believe it firmly and discern in the whole affair a cool and premeditated murder your passion for carmel while not generally known has not passed unsuspected by your or her intimates and this in itself is enough to give colour to these suspicions even if you had not gone so far as to admit its power over you and the extremes to which you were willing to go to secure the wife you wished so much for the situation as it appears to outsiders of the circumstantial evidence which links you personally to this crime we have already spoken it is very strong and apparently unassailable but truth is truth and if you only felt free to bear your whole soul to me as you now decline to do i should not despair of finding some weak link in the chain which seems so satisfactory to the police and i am forced to add to the general public charles i was very near unbosoming myself to him at that moment but i caught myself back in time while carmel lay ill and unconscious i would not clear my name at her expense by so much as a suggestion charles i repeated but in a different tone and with a different purpose how do they account for the cordial that was drunk the two emptied glasses and the flask which were found in the adjacent closet it's one of the affairs conceded incongruities miss cumberland is a well-known temperance woman had the flask and glasses not come from her house you would get no one to believe that she had had anything to do with them have you any hint to give on this point it would be a welcome addition to your case alas i was as much puzzled by those emptied cordial glasses as he was and told him so also by the presence of the third unused one as i dwelt in thought on the latter circumstance i remembered the observation which coroner perry had made concerning it coroner perry speaks of a third and unused glass which was found with a flask i ventured tentatively he seemed to consider it an important item hiding some truth that would materially help this case what do you think or rather what is the general opinion on this point i have not heard i have seen the fact mentioned but without comment it is a curious circumstance i will make a note of it you have no suggestions to offer on the subject none the clue is a small one he smiled so is the one offered by the array of bottles found on the kitchen table yet the latter may lead directly to the truth adelaide never dug those out of the cellar where they were locked up and i'm sure i did not yet i suppose i'm giving credit for doing so naturally the key to the wine vault was the only key which was lacking from the bunch left at miss cumberland's that it was used to open the wine vault door is evident from the fact that it was found in the lock everything was against me if the whole affair had been planned with an intent to inculpate me and me only it could not have been done with more attention to detail nor could i have found myself more completely enmeshed yet i knew both from circumstances and my own instinct that no such planning had occurred i was a victim not of malice but of blind chance or shall i say of providence as to this one key having been slipped from the rest and used to open the wine vault for wine which nobody wanted and nobody drank this must be classed with the other incongruities which might yet lead to my enlargement you may add this coincident to the other i conceded after i had gone thus far in my own mind i swear that i had nothing to do with that key neither could i believe that it had been used or even carried there by adelaide or carmel though i knew that the full ring of keys had been in their hands and that they had entered the building by means of one of them so assured was i of their innocence in this regard that the idea which afterwards assumed such proportions in all our minds had at this moment its first dawning in mine as well as its first outward expression 
some other man than myself was thirsty that night i firmly declared we are getting on charles evidently he did not consider the pace a very fast one but being a cheerful fellow by nature he simply expressed his dissatisfaction by an imperceptible shrug do you know exactly what the club-house's wine vault contained he asked an inventory was given me by the steward the morning we closed it must be in my rooms your rooms have been examined you expected that didn't you probably this inventory has been found i don't suppose it will help any how should it very true how should it no thoroughfare there of course no thoroughfare anywhere to-day i exclaimed to-morrow some loophole of escape might suggest itself to me i should like to sleep on the matter i i should like to sleep on it he saw that i had something in mind of which i had thus far given him no intimation and he waited anxiously for me to reconsider my last words before he earnestly remarked a day lost at a time like this is often a day never retrieved think well before you bid me leave you unenlightened as to the direction in which you wish me to work but i was not ready not by any means ready and he detected this when i next spoke i will see you to-morrow any time to-morrow meantime i will give you a commission which you are at liberty to perform yourself or to entrust to some capable detective the letter of which a portion remains was written to carmel and she sent me a reply which was handed to me on the station platform by a man who was a perfect stranger to me i have hardly any memory of how the man looked but it should be an easy task to find him and if you cannot do that the smallest scrap of the note he gave me and which unfortunately i tore up and scattered to the winds would prove my veracity in this one particular and so make it easier for them to believe the rest his eye lightened i presumed the prospect of making any practical attempt in my behalf was welcome one thing more i now added my ring was missing from miss cumberland's hand when i took away those pillows i have reason to think or it is natural for me to think that she planned to return it to me by some messenger or in some letter do you know if such a messenger or such letter has been received at my apartments have you heard anything about this ring it was a notable one and not to be confounded with any other any one who knew us or who had ever remarked it on her hand would be able to identify it i have heard the ring mentioned he replied i have even heard that the police are interested in finding it but i have not heard that they have been successful you encouraged me much by assuring me that it was missing from her hand when you first saw her that ring may prove our most valuable clue yes but you must also remember that she may have taken it off before she started for the club-house that is very true you do not know whether they have looked for it at her home i do not will you find out and will you see that i get all my letters i certainly will but you must not expect to receive the letter unopened i suppose not i said this with more cheerfulness than he evidently expected my heart had been lightened of one load the ring had not been discovered on carmel as i had secretly feared i will take good care of your interests from now on he remarked in a tone much more natural than any he had before used be hopeful and show a brave front to the district attorney when he comes to interview you i hear that he is expected home to-morrow if you are innocent you can face him and his whole office with calm assurance which showed how little he understood of my real position there was comfort in this very thought however and i quietly remarked that i did not despair and i will not he emphasized rising with an assumption of ease which left him as he remained hesitating before me it was my moment of advantage and i improved it by proffering a request which had been more or less in my mind during the whole of this prolonged colloquy first thanking him for his disinterestedness i remarked that he had shown me so much consideration as a lawyer that i now felt emboldened to ask something from him as my friend you are free said i i am not 
miss cumberland will be buried before i leave these four walls i hate to think of her going to her grave without one token from the man to whom she has been only too good and who whatever outrage he may have planned to her feelings is not without reverence for her character and a heartfelt repentance for whatever he may have done to grieve her charles a few flowers white no wreath just a few which can be placed on her breast or in her hand you need not say whom they are from it would seem a mockery to any one but her lilies charles i shall feel happier to know that they are there will you do this for me i will that is all instinctively he held out his hand i dropped mine in it there was a slight pressure some few murmured words and he was gone i slept that night end of chapter seven part two Chapter Eight of the House of the Whispering Pines by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. A chance, I take it. I entreat you then, from one that so imperfectly conjects, you take no notice, nor build yourself a trouble, out of this scattering and unsure observance. It were not for your quiet, nor your good, nor for my manhood honesty or wisdom to let you know my thoughts othello i slept though a question of no small importance was agitating my mind demanding instant consideration and a definite answer before i again saw this friend and adviser i woke to ask if the suggestion which had come to me in our brief conversation about the bottles taken from the wine vault was the promising one it had then appeared or only a fool's trick bound to end in disaster i weighed the matter in every conceivable way and ended by trusting to the instinct which impelled me to have resource to the one and only means by which the scent might be diverted from its original cause confusion be sown in the minds of the police and carmel as well as myself be safe from the pit gaping to receive us this was my plan i would acknowledge to having seen a horse and cutter leave the club-house by the upper gateway simultaneously with my entrance through the lower one i would even describe the appearance of the person driving this cutter no one by the greatest stretch of imagination would be apt to associate this description with carmel but it might set the authorities thinking and if by any good chance a cutter containing a person wearing a derby hat and a coat with an extra high collar should have been seen on this portion of the road or if as i earnestly hoped the snow had left any signs of another horse having been tethered in the clump of trees opposite the one where i had concealed my own enough of the truth might be furnished to divide public opinion and start fresh inquiry that a woman's form had sought concealments under these masculine habiliments would not could not strike anybody's mind nothing in the crime had suggested a woman's presence much less a woman's active agency on the contrary all the appearances save such as i believed known to myself alone spoke so openly of a man's strength a man's methods a man's appetite and a man's brutal daring that the suspicion which had naturally fallen on myself as the one and only person implicated would in shifting pass straight to another man and if he could not be found return to me or be lost in a maze of speculation this seemed so evident after a long and close study of the situation that i was ready with my confession when mr clifton next came i had even forestalled it in a short interview forced upon me by the assistant district attorney and chief hudson that it had made an altogether greater impression upon the latter than i had expected gave me additional courage when i came to discuss this new line of defence with the young lawyer i was even able to tell him that to all appearance 
my long silence on a point so favourable to my own interests had not mitigated against me to the extent one would expect from men so alive to the subterfuges and plausible inventions of suspected criminals chief hudson believes me late as my statement is i saw it in his eye thus i went on and the assistant district attorney too at least the latter is willing to give me the benefit of the doubt which was more than i expected what do you suppose has happened some new discovery on their part if so i ought to know what it is believe me charles i ought to know what it is i have heard of no new discovery he coldly replied not quite pleased as i could see either with my words or my manner an old one may have served your purpose if another cutter besides yours passed through the clubhouse grounds at the time you mention it left tracks which all the fury of the storm would not have entirely obliterated in the fifteen minutes elapsing between that time and the arrival of the police perhaps they remember these tracks and if you had been entirely frank that night i know i know i put in but i wasn't lay it to my confusion of mind to the great shock i had received to anything but my own blood guiltiness and take up the matter as it now stands can't you follow up my suggestion a witness can certainly be found who encountered that cutter and its occupant somewhere on the long stretch of open road between the whispering pines and the resident district possibly it would help you have not asked for news from the hill the trembling which seized and shook me at these words testified to the shock they gave me carmel i cried she's worse dead no she's not worse and she's not dead but the doctors say it will be weeks before they can allow a question of any importance to be put to her you can see what that will do for us her testimony is too important to the case to be ignored a delay will follow which may or may not be favourable to you i am inclined to think now that it will redound to your interests you are ready to swear to the sleigh you speak of that you saw it leave the clubhouse grounds and turn north quite ready but you must not ask me to describe or in any way to identify its occupant i saw nothing but the hat and coat i have told you about it was just before the moon went under a cloud or i could not have seen that much is it so hard to preserve a natural aspect in telling or suggesting a lie that charles's look should change as i uttered the last sentence i do not easily flush and since my self-control had been called upon by the dreadful experiences of the last few days i had learned to conceal all other manifestations of feeling except under some exceptional shock but a lie embodied in so many words never came easy to my lips and i suppose my voice fell for his glance became suddenly penetrating and his voice slightly sarcastic as he remarked those clouds obscured more than the moon i fancy i only wish that they had not risen between you and me this is the blindest case that has ever been put into my hands all the more credit to me if i see you through it i suppose but tell me i broke in with equal desire to cut these recriminations short and to learn what was going on at the cumberland house have you been to the hill or seen anybody who has can't you give me some details of of carmel's condition of the sort of nurse who cares for her and how arthur conducts himself under this double affliction i was there last night miss clifford was in the house and received me she told me that arthur's state of mind was pitiful he was never a very affectionate brother you know but now they cannot get him away from carmel's door he sits or stands all day just outside the threshold and casts jealous and beseeching looks at those who are allowed to enter they say you wouldn't know him i tried to get him to come down and see me but he wouldn't leave his post 
doesn't he grieve for adelaide i always thought that of the two she had the greater influence over him yes but they cannot get him to enter the place where she lies his duty is to the living he says at least his anxiety is there he starts at every cry carmel utters she cries out then very often i could hear her from where i sat downstairs and what does she say the one thing constantly lila lila nothing more i kept my face in shadow if he saw it at all it must have looked as cold and hard as stone after a moment i went on with my queries does he arthur mention me at all i did not discuss you greatly with miss clifford i saw that she was prejudiced and i preferred not to risk an argument but she let fall this much that arthur felt very hard towards you and loudly insisted upon your guilt she seemed to think him justified in this you don't mind my telling you it is better for you to know what is being said about you in town i understood his motive he was trying to drive me into giving him my full confidence but i would not be driven i simply retorted quietly but in a way to stop all such future attempts miss clifford is a very good girl and a true friend of the whole cumberland family but she is not the most discriminating person in the world and even if she were her opinion would not turn me from the course i have laid out for myself does the doctor dr carpenter i presume venture to say how long carmel's present delirium will hold he cannot not knowing its real cause carmel fell ill before the news of her sister's death arrived at the house you remember some frightful scene must have occurred between the two previous to adelaide's departure for the whispering pines what that scene was can only be told by carmel and for her account we must wait happily you have an alibi which will serve you in this instance you were at the station during the time we are speaking of has that been proved yes several men saw you there and the gentleman who brought me the her letter it was more than difficult for me to speak carmel's name he has not come forward not yet not to my knowledge at least and the ring no news the nurse you have told me nothing about her i now urged reverting to the topic of gravest interest to me is she any one we know or an importation of the doctor's i did not busy myself with that she's a competent woman of course i suppose that is what you mean could i tell him that this was not what i meant at all that it was her qualities as woman rather than her qualifications as nurse which were important in this case if she were of a suspicious prying disposition given to weighing every word and marking every gesture of a delirious patient what might we not fear from her circumspection when carmel's memory asserted itself and she grew more precise in the frenzy which now exhausted itself in unintelligible cries or the ceaseless repetition of her sister's name the question seemed of such importance to me that i was tempted to give expression to my secret apprehensions on this score but i bethought myself in time and passed the matter over with the final remark watch her watch them all and bring me each and every detail of the poor girl's sickness you will never regret humouring me in this you ordered the flowers for adelaide yes lilies as you requested a short silence then i observed there will be no autopsy the papers say the evidences of death by strangulation are too well defined very true yet i wonder at their laxity in this there were signs of some other agency having been at work also 
those two empty glasses smelling of cordial innocent perhaps yet don't i can bear no more to-day i shall be stronger to-morrow another feeler turned aside his cheek showed his displeasure but the words were kind enough with which he speedily took his leave and left me to solitude and a long night of maddening thought End of chapter eight chapter nine of the house of the whispering pines by anna katherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn book two sweetwater to the front chapter nine we know of no such letter oh he sits high in all the people's hearts and that which would appear offence in us his countenance like richest alchemy will change to virtue and to worthiness julius caesar and you still hold him yes but with growing uncertainty he is one of those fellows who affect your judgment in spite of yourself handsome beyond the ordinary a finished gentleman and all that he has in addition to these advantages a way with him that goes straight to the heart in spite of prejudice and the claims of conscience that's a dangerous factor in a case like this it hampers a man in the exercise of his duties you may escape the fascination probably will but at least you will understand my present position and why i telephoned to new york for an expert detective to help us on this job i wish to give the son of my old friend a chance the man whom coroner perry thus addressed leaned back in his chair and quietly replied you're right not because he is the son of your old friend a handsome fellow and all that but for the reason that every man should have his full chance whatever the appearances against him personally i have no fear of my judgment being affected by his attractions i've had to do with too many handsome scamps for that but i shall be as just to him as you will simply because it seems an incredibly brutal crime for a gentleman to commit and also because i lay greater stress than you do on the two or three minor points which seem to favour his latest declaration that a man had preceded him in his visit to this lonely club-house a man whom he had himself seen leaving the grounds in a cutter just as he entered by the opposite driveway ah came in quick ejaculation from the coroner's lips i like to hear you say that i was purposely careful not to lay emphasis on the facts that you allude to i wished you to draw your own inferences without any aid from me the police did find traces of a second horse and cutter having passed through the club-house grounds it was snowing hard and these traces were speedily obliterated but hexford and clark saw them in time to satisfy themselves that they extended from the northern clump of trees to the upper gateway where they took the direction of the hill that is not all a gripsack packed for travelling was in mr renelay's cutter showing that his story of an intended journey was not without some foundation yes we have retained that gripsack it is not the only proof we have of his intention to leave the city for a while he had made other arrangements business arrangements but that's neither here nor there no one doubts that he had planned an elopement with a beautiful carmel the question is was his disappointment followed by the murder of the woman who stood in his way district attorney fox you will have guessed his identity before now took his time deliberating carefully with himself before venturing to reply then when the coroner's concealed impatience was about to disclose itself he quietly remarked i suppose that no conclusion can be drawn from the condition of the body when our men reached it i judged that it was still warm yes but so it would have been if she had met her fate several minutes earlier than was supposed clark and hexford defer about the length of time 
which intervened between the moment when the former looked into the room from the outside and that of their final entrance but whether it was five minutes or ten the period was long enough to render their testimony uncertain as to the exact length of time she had lain there dead had i been there oh, but it is useless to go into that let us take up something more tangible very good here it is of the six bottles of spirits which were surreptitiously taken from the club-house's wine vault four were found standing unopened on the kitchen table where are the other two that's it that's the question i have put myself ever since i interrogated the steward and found him ready to swear to the correctness of his report and the disappearance of these two bottles ranelagh did not empty them or the bottles themselves would have been found somewhere about the place now who did no one within the club-house precincts they were opened and emptied elsewhere there's our clue and if the man you've got up from new york is worth his salt he has his task ready to hand a hard task for a stranger and such a stranger not very prepossessing to say the least but he has a good eye and will get along with the boys all right nothing assertive about him not enough go perhaps would you like to see him in a moment i want to clear my mind in reference to these bottles only some one addicted to drink would drag those six bottles out of that cold unlighted cellar yes and a connoisseur at that the two missing bottles held the choicest brand in the whole stock they were kept far back too hidden as it were behind the other bottles yet they were hauled to the front and carried off as you say and by some one who knows a good thing in spirits what was in the four bottles found on the kitchen table sherry whiskey and rum two bottles of rum and one each of sherry and whiskey the thief meant to carry them all off but had not time the gentleman thief no common man such as we are looking for would make the choice of just those bottles so there we are again contradictions in every direction don't let us bother with the contradictions but just follow the clue those bottles full or empty must be found you know the labels yes and the shape and colour of the bottles both of which are peculiar good now let us see your detective but sweetwater was not called in yet just as coroner perry offered to touch his bell the door opened and mr clifton was ushered in well and favourably known to both men he had no difficulty in stating his business and proffering his request i am here in the interests of elwood ranelagh said he he is willing to concede and so am i that under the circumstances his arrest was justifiable but not his prolonged detention he has little excuse to offer for the mistakes he has made or the various offences of which he has been guilty his best friends must condemn his hypocrisy and fast and loose treatment of miss cumberland but he vows that he had no hand in her violent death and in this regard i feel not only bound but forced to believe him at all events i am going to act on that conviction and have come here to entreat your aid in clearing up one or two points which may affect your own opinion of his guilt at his counsel i have been able to extract from him a fact or two which he has hitherto withheld from the police reticent as he has shown himself from the start and considering the character of the two women involved in this tragedy this cannot be looked upon as entirely to his discredit he has confided to me a circumstance which in the excitement attended on miss carmel cumberland's sudden illness may have escaped the notice of the family and very naturally of the police it is this the ring which miss cumberland wore as the sign and seal of her engagement to him was not on her hand when he came upon her as he declares he did dead 
it was there at dinner-time a curious ring which i have often noted myself and could accurately describe if required if she took it off before starting for the whispering pines it should be easily found but if she did not what a clue it offers to her unknown assailant up till now mr ranelagh has been anticipating receiving this ring back in a letter written before she left her home but he has heard of no such letter and doubts now if you have may i ask if he is correct in this surmise we know of no such letter none has come to his rooms replied the coroner i thought not the whereabouts of this ring then is still to be determined you will pardon my having called your attention to it as mr ranelagh's legal adviser i am very anxious to have that ring found we are glad to receive your suggestion replied the district attorney but you must remember that some of its force is lost by its having originated with the accused very true but mr ranelagh was only induced to speak of this matter after i had worked with him for an hour there is a mystery in his attitude which i for one have not yet fathomed you must have noticed this also coroner perry your inquest when you hold it will reveal some curious facts but i doubt if it will reveal the secret underlying this man's reticence that we shall have to discover for ourselves he has another secret then than the one involving his arrest as a suspected murderer was the subtle conclusion of the district attorney yes or why does he balk so at the simplest inquiries i have my notion also to its nature but i am not here to express notions unless you call my almost unfounded belief in him a notion what i want to present to you is fact and fact which can be utilized in the cause of your client which is equally the cause of justice possibly we'll search for the ring mr clifton meanwhile will you cast your eye over these fragments of a note which mr renlay says he received from miss carmel cumberland while waiting on the station platform for her coming taking an envelope from his pocket mr clifton drew forth two small scraps of soiled and crumpled paper one of which was the half of another envelope presenting very nearly the following appearance as he pointed this out he remarked elwood is not so common a baptismal name that there can be any doubt as to the person addressed the other scraps also written in pencil and by the same hand contained but two or three disconnected words but one of those words was adelaide i spent an hour and a half in the yards adjoining the station before i found these two bits explained the young lawyer with a simple earnestness not displeasing to the two seasoned men he addressed one was in hiding under a stacked-up pile of outgoing fright and the other i picked out on a cart of stuff which had been swept up in the early morning i offer them in corroboration of mr ranelagh's statement that the com used in the particular consumed letter found in the clubhouse chimney was addressed to miss carmel cumberland and not to adelaide and that the place of meeting suggested by this word was the station platform and not the spot since made terrible by death you are acquainted with miss carmel cumberland's handwriting if i am not the town is full of people who are i believe these words to have been written by carmel cumberland mr fox placed the pieces back in their envelope and laid the whole carefully away for a second time we are obliged to you said he you can cancel the obligation was the quick retort by discovering the identity of the man who in derby hat and coat with a very high collar left the grounds of the whispering pines just as mr ranelay drove into them i have no facilities for the job and no desire to undertake it he had endeavoured to speak naturally if not with an off-hand air but he failed somehow 
else why the quick glance of startled inquiry which dr perry sent him from under his rather shaggy eyebrows well we'll undertake that too promised the district attorney i can ask no more returned charles clifton arising to depart the confronting of that man with ranelagh will cause the latter to unseal his lips before you have finished with my client you will esteem him much more highly than you do now the district attorney smiled at what seemed the callow enthusiasm of a youthful lawyer but the coroner who knew his district well looked very thoughtfully down at the table before which he sat and failed to raise his head until the young man had vanished from the room and his place had been taken by another of very different appearance and deportment then he roused himself and introduced the newcomer to the prosecuting attorney as caleb sweetwater of the new york police department caleb sweetwater was no beauty he was plain-featured to the point of ugliness so plain-featured that not even his quick whimsical smile could make his face agreeable to one who did not know his many valuable qualities his receding chin and far too projecting nose were not likely to create a favourable impression on one ignorant of his cheerful modest winsome disposition and the district attorney after eyeing him for a moment with ill-concealed disfavour abruptly suggested you have brought some credentials with you i hope here is a letter from one of the department mr gryce wrote it he added with just a touch of pride the letter is all right hastily remarked dr perry on looking it over mr sweetwater is commended to us as a man of sagacity and becoming reserve very good to business then the sooner we get to work on this new theory the better mr sweetwater we have some doubts if the man we have in hand is the man we really want but first how much do you know about this case all that's in the papers nothing more very little i have not been in town above an hour are you known here i don't think so it's my first visit this way then you are as ignorant of the people as they are of you well that has its disadvantages and its advantages if you will permit me to say so sir i have no prejudices no preconceived notions to struggle against i can take persons as i find them and if there's any deep family secret to unearth it's mighty fortunate for a man to have nothing stand in the way of his own instincts no likings i mean no leanings this way or that for humane or other purely unprofessional reasons the eye of district attorney fox stole towards that of his brother official but did not meet it the coroner had turned his attention to the table again and while betraying no embarrassment was not quite his usual self the district attorney's hand stole to his chin which he softly rubbed with his lean forefinger as he again addressed sweetwater this tragedy the most lamentable which has ever occurred in this town is really and without exaggeration a tragedy in high life the lady who was strangled by a brute's clutch was a woman of the highest culture and most estimable character her sister who is supposed to have been the unconscious cause of the crime is a young girl of blameless record of the man who was seen bending over the victim with his hands on her throat we cannot speak so well he has the faults and has lived the life of a social favourite gifted in many ways and popular with both men and women he has swung on his course with an easy disregard of the claims of others which while leaving its traces no doubt in many a humble and uncomplaining heart did not attract notice of this inherent lack of principle until the horrors of this tragedy lifted him into public view stripped of all his charms he is an egotist of the first water there is no getting over that but did he strangle the woman 
he says not that he was only following some extraordinary impulse of the moment in laying his thumbs on the marks he saw on miss cumberland's neck a fantastic story told too late besides for perfect credence and not worthy of the least attention if the reasons which followed are too well known to us for repetition sweetwater listened with snapping eyes to all that was said and when he had been given the various clues indicating the presence of a third and as yet unknown party on the scene of crime he rose excitedly to his feet and declaring that it was a most promising case begged permission to make his own investigations at the whispering pines after which he would be quite ready to begin his search for the man in the derby hat and high coat collar whose love for wine was so great that he chose and carried off the two choicest bottles that the club-house contained a hardy act for a man gentleman or otherwise who had just strangled the life out of a fine woman like that if he exists and the whole story is not a pure fabrication of the entrapped ranelay he shouldn't be hard to find what do you say gentlemen he shouldn't be hard to find we have not found him emphasized the district attorney with the shortest possible glance at the coroner's face then the field is all before me smiled sweetwater wish me luck gentlemen it's a blind job but that's just in my line a map of the town a few general instructions and i'm off mr fox turned towards the coroner and opened his lips but closed them again without speaking did sweetwater notice this act of self-restraint if he did he failed to show it End of chapter nine Chapter Ten of the House of the Whispering Pines by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Ten. I can help you. A subtle knave, a finder out of occasions that has an eye can stamp and counterfeit advantages though true advantage never presents itself. A devilish knave. Othello a half-hour spent with hexford in and about the club-house and sweetwater was ready for the road as he made his way through the northern gate he cast a quick look back at the long low building he had just left with its tall chimneys and rows of sightless windows half hidden half revealed by the encroaching pines the mystery of the place fascinated him to his awakened imagination there was a breathless suggestion in it a suggestion which it was his foremost wish just now to understand and those pines gaunt restless communicative ready with their secret if one could only interpret their language how their heads came together as their garrulous tongues repeated the tale which would never grow old to them until age nipped their hoary heads and laid them low in the dust with their horror half expressed their gruesome tale unfinished witnesses of it all commented the young detective as he watched the swaying boughs rising and dipping before a certain window they were peering into that room long before clark stole the glimpse which has undone the unfortunate ranelay if i had their knowledge i'd do something more than whisper thus musing thus muttering he plodded up the road his insignificant figure an unpromising break in the monotonous white of the wintry landscape but could the prisoner who had indirectly speeded this young detective on his present course have read his thoughts and rightly estimated the force of his purpose would he have viewed with so much confidence the entrance of this unprepossessing stranger upon the no thoroughfare into which his own carefully studied admissions had blindly sent him as has been said before this road was an outlying one and but little travelled save in the height of summer 
under ordinary circumstances sweetwater would have met no more than half a dozen carts or sledges between the club-house gates and the city streets but to-day the road was full of teams carrying all sorts of incongruous people eager for a sight of the spot made forever notorious by a mysterious crime he noted them all the faces of the men the gestures of the women but he did not show any special interest till he came to that portion of the road where the long line of half-buried fences began to give way to a few scattered houses then his spirit woke and he became quick alert and persuasive he entered houses he talked with the people though evidently not a dissipated man he stopped at several saloons taking his time with his glass and encouraging the chatter of all who chose to meet his advances he was a natural talker and welcomed every topic but his eye only sparkled at one this he never introduced himself he did not need to some one was always ready with a great theme and once it was started he did not let the conversation languish till every one present had given his or her quota of hearsay or opinion to the general fund it seemed a great waste of time for nobody had anything to say worth the breath expended on it but sweetwater showed no impatience and proceeded to engage the attention of the next man woman or child he encountered with undiminished zest and hopefulness he had left the country road behind and had entered upon the jumble of sheds shops and streets which marked the beginnings of the town in this direction when his quick and experienced eye fell on a woman standing with uncovered head in an open doorway peering up the street in anxious expectation of some one not yet in sight he liked the air and well-kept appearance of the woman he appreciated the neatness of the house at her back and gauged at its proper value the interest she displayed in the expected arrival of one whom he hoped would delay that arrival long enough for him to get in the word which by this time dropped almost unconsciously from his lips but a second survey of the woman's face convinced him that his ordinary loquaciousness would not serve him here there was a refinement in her aspect quite out of keeping with the locality in which she lived and he was hesitating how to proceed when fortune favoured him by driving against his knees a small lad on an ill-directed sled bringing him almost to the ground and upsetting the child who began to scream vociferously it was the woman's child for she made instantly for the gate which for some reason she found difficulty in opening sweetwater seeing this blessed his lucky stars he was at his best with children and catching the little fellow up he soothed and fondled him and finally brought him with such a merry air of triumph straight to his mother's arms that confidence between them was immediately established and conversation started he had in his pocket an ingenious little invention which he had exhibited all along the road as an indispensable article in every well-kept house he wanted to show it to her but it was too cold a day for her to stop outside wouldn't she allow him to step in and explain how her work could be materially lessened and her labour turned to play by a contrivance so simple that a child could run it it was all so ridiculous in face of this woman's quiet intelligence that he laughed at his own words and his laughter echoed by the child and in another instant by the mother made everything so pleasant for the moment that she insensibly drew back while he pulled open the gate only remarking as she led the way in i was looking for my husband he may come any minute and i'm afraid he won't care much about contrivances to save me work that is if they cost very much sweetwater whose hand was in his pocket drew it hastily out you were watching for your husband do you often stand in the open doorway looking for him her surprised eyes met his with a stare that would have embarrassed the most venturesome book agent 
but this man was of another ilk if you do he went on imperturbably but with a good-humoured smile which deepened her favourable impression of him how much would i give if you had been standing there last tuesday night when a certain cutter and horse went by on its way up the hill she was a self-contained woman this wife of a master mechanic in one of the great shops hard by but her jaw fell at this and she forgot to chide or resist her child when he began to pull her towards the open kitchen door sweetwater sensitive to the least change in the human face prayed that the husband might be detained if only for five minutes longer while he sweetwater worked this promising mine you were looking out he ventured and you did see that horse and cutter what luck it may save a man's life save she repeated staggering back a few steps and dragging the child with her save a man's life what do you mean by that not much if it was any cutter and any horse and at any hour but if it was the horse and cutter which left the whispering pines at ten or half past ten that night then it may mean life and death to the man now in jail under the dreadful charge of murder catching up her child she slid into the kitchen and sat down with it in the first chair she came to sweetwater following her took up his stand in the doorway unobtrusive but patiently waiting for her to speak the steaming kettles and the table set for dinner gave warning of the expected presence for which she had been watching but she seemed to have forgotten her husband forgotten everything but her own emotions who are you she asked at length you have not told me your real business no madam and i ask your pardon i feared that my real business if suddenly made known to you might startle perhaps frighten you i am a detective on the lookout for evidence in the case i have just mentioned i have a theory that a most important witness in the same drove by here at the hour and on the night i have named i want to substantiate that theory can you help me a sensitiveness too and quick appreciation of the character of those he addressed was one of sweetwater's most valuable attributes no glossing of the truth however skilfully applied would have served him with this woman so well as this simple statement followed by its equally simple and direct inquiry scrutinizing him over the child's head she gave but a casual glance at the badge he took pains to show her then in as quiet and simple tones as yet himself used she made this reply i can help you some you make it my duty and i have never shrunk from duty a horse and cutter did go by here on its way uphill last tuesday night at about eleven o'clock i remember the hour because i was expecting my husband every minute just as i am now he had some extra work on hand that night which he expected to detain him till eleven or a quarter after supper was to be ready at a quarter after to surprise him i had beaten up some biscuits and i had just put them in the pan when i heard the clock strike the hour afraid that he would come before they were baked i thrust the pan into the oven and ran to the front door to look out it was snowing very hard and the road looked white and empty but as i stood there a horse and cutter came in sight which as it reached the gate drew up in a great hurry as if something was the matter frightened because i am always thinking of harm to my husband whose work is very dangerous i ran out bareheaded to the gate when i saw why the man in the sleigh was making me such wild gestures his hat had blown off and was lying close up against the fence in front of me anxious always to oblige i made haste to snatch at it and carry it out to its owner i received a sort of thank you and would never have remembered the occurrence if it had not been for that murder and if she paused doubtfully ran her fingers nervously over the child's head looked again at sweetwater waiting expectantly for her next word and faltered painfully if i had not recognized the horse 
Sweetwater drew a deep breath. It was such a happy climax. Then, as she showed no signs of saying more, asked as quietly as his rapidly beating heart permitted, "'Didn't you recognize the man?' Her answer was short, but as candid as her expression. "'No. The snow was blinding. Besides, he wore a high collar, in which his head was sunk down almost out of sight.' but the horse was one which is often driven by here i had rather not tell you whose it is i have not told any one not even my husband about seeing it on the road that night i couldn't somehow but if it will save a man's life and make clear who killed that good woman ask any one on the hill in what stable you can find a grey horse with a large black spot on his left shoulder and you will know as much about it as i do isn't that enough sir now i must dish up my dinner yes yes it's almost enough just one question madam was the hat what folks call a derby like this one madam he explained drawing his own from behind his back yes i think so as well as i can remember it was like that i am afraid i didn't do it any good by my handling I had to clutch it quick, and I'm sure I bent the brim, to say nothing of smearing it with flower marks. How? Sweetwater had started for the door, but stopped, all eagerness at this last remark. I had been cutting out biscuits, and my hands were white with flour, she explained, simply. But that brushes off easily. I don't suppose it mattered. No, no, he hastily assented then while he smiled and waved his hand to the little urchin who had been his means of introduction to this possibly invaluable witness he made one final plea and that was for her name eliza simmons was the straightforward reply and this ended the interview the husband whose anticipated approach had occasioned all this abruptness was coming down the hill when sweetwater left the gate as this detective of ours was as careful in his finish as in all the rest of his work he called out as he went by i've just been trying to sell a wonderful contrivance of mine to the missus but it was no go the man looked smiled and went in at his own gate with the air of one happy in wife child and home sweetwater went on up the hill towards the top he came upon a livery stable stopping in his good-humoured way he entered into a talk with a man loitering inside the great door before he left him he had asked him these questions any grey horse in town yes one i think i've seen it has a patch of black on its left shoulder yes whose is it i have a mighty curiosity about the horse looks like a trick horse i don't know what you mean by that it belongs to a respectable family a family you must have heard about if you ever heard anything there's a funeral there to-day not miss cumberland's exclaimed sweetwater all agog in a moment yes miss cumberland's i thought you might have heard the name yes i have heard it the tone was dry the words abrupt but the detective's heart was dancing like a feather the next turn he took was toward the handsome residence district crowning the hill end of chapter ten chapter eleven of the house of the whispering pines by anna katherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter eleven in the coach house all things that we ordained festival turn from their office to black funeral our instruments to melancholy bells our wedding cheer to a sad burial feast and all things change them to the contrary romeo and juliet fifteen minutes later he stood in a finely wooded street before an open gateway guarded by a policeman 
showing his badge he passed in and entered a long and slightly curved driveway as he did so he took a glance at the house it was not as pretentious as he expected but indefinitely more inviting low and rambling covered with vines and nestling amid shrubbery which even in winter gave it a habitable air it looked as much the abode of comfort as of luxury and gave in outward appearance at least no hint of the dark shadow which had so lately fallen across it the ceremonies had been set for three o'clock and it was now half-past two as sweetwater reached the head of the driveway he saw the first of a long file of carriages approaching up the street lucky that my business takes me to the stable thought he what is the coachman's name i ought to remember it ah zadok zadok brown there's a combination for you he had reached this point in his soliloquy a bad habit of his for it sometimes took audible expression when he ran against another policeman set to guard the side door a moment's parley and he left this man behind but not before he had noted this door and the white and hospitable veranda which separated it from the driveway i am willing to go all odds that i shall find that veranda the most interesting part of the house he remarked in quiet conviction to himself as he noted its nearness to the stable and the ease with which one could step from it into a vehicle passing down the driveway it had another point of interest or rather the wing had to which it was attached as his eye travelled back across this wing in his lively walk towards the stable he caught a passing glimpse of a nurse's face and figure in one of its upper windows this located the sick chamber and unconsciously he hushed his step and moved with the greatest caution though he knew that this sickness was not one of the nerves and that the loudest sound would fail to reach ears lapsed in a blessed if alarming unconsciousness once around the corner he resumed a more natural pace and perceiving that the stable door was closed but that a window well up the garden side was open he cast a look toward the kitchen windows at his back and encountering no watchful eye stepped up to the former one and peered in a man sat with his back to him polishing a bit of harness this was probably zadok the coachman as his interest was less with him than with the stalls beyond he let his eye travel on in their direction when he suddenly experienced a momentary confusion by observing the head and shoulders of hexford leaning towards him from an opposite window in much the same fashion and certainly with exactly the same intent as himself as their glances crossed both flushed and drew back only to return again each to his several peephole neither meant to lose the advantage of the moment both had heard of the grey horse and wished to identify it hexford for his own satisfaction sweetwater as the first link of the chain leading him into the mysterious course mapped out for him by fate that each was more or less under the surveillance of the other did not trouble either there were three stalls and in each stall a horse stamped and fidgeted only one held their attention this was a mare on the extreme left a large grey animal with a curious black patch on its near shoulder the faces of both men changed as they recognized this distinguishing mark and instinctively their eyes met across the width of the open space separating them hexford's finger rose to his mouth but sweetwater needed no such hint he stood silent as his own shadow while the coachman rubbed away with less and less purpose until his hands stood quite still and his whole figure drooped in irresistible despondency as he raised his face moved perhaps by that sense of a watchful presence to which all of us are more or less susceptible they were both surprised to see tears on it the next instant he had started to his feet and the bit of harness had rattled from his hands to the floor who are you he asked with a touch of anger quite natural under the circumstances 
"'Can't you come in by the door, and not creep sneaking up to take a man at disadvantage?' As he spoke, he dashed away the tears with which his cheeks were still wet. "'I thought a heap of my young mistress,' he added, in evident apology for this display of what such men call weakness. "'I didn't know that it was in me to cry for anything, but I find that I can cry for her.' Hexford left his window, and Sweetwater slid from his. Next minute they met at the stable door. "'Had luck?' whispered the local officer. "'Enough to bring me here,' acknowledged the other. "'Do you mean to this house or to this stable?' "'To this stable.' "'Have you heard that the horse was out that night?' "'Yes, she was out.' "'Who driving?' "'Ah, that's the question. "'This man can't tell you.' "'A jerk of Hexford's thumb in Zadok's direction emphasized this statement. "'But I'm going to talk to him, for all that.' "'He wasn't here that night. He was at a dance. "'He only knows that the mare was out.' "'But I'm going to talk to him.' "'May I come in, too? I'll not interrupt. "'I've just fifteen minutes to spare.' "'You can do as you please. I've nothing to hide. From you, at any rate.' Which wasn't quite true, but Sweetwater wasn't a stickler for truth, except in the statements he gave his superiors. Hexford threw open the stable door, and they both walked in. The coachman was not visible, but they could hear him moving about above, grumbling to himself in none too encouraging a way. Evidently he was in no mood for visitors. "'I'll be down in a minute,' he called out, as their steps sounded on the hardwood floor. Hexford sounded over to the stalls. Sweetwater stopped near the doorway and glanced very carefully about him. Nothing seemed to escape his eye. He even took the trouble to peer into a waste-bin, and was just on the point of lifting down a bit of broken bottle from an open cupboard when Brown appeared on the staircase, dressed in his Sunday coat and carrying a bunch of fresh, hot-house roses. He stopped midway as Sweetwater turned towards him from the cupboard, but immediately resumed his descent, and was ready with his reply when Hexford accosted him from the other end of the stable. An odd beast, this. They don't drive her for her beauty, that's evident. She's fast and she's knowing, grumbled the coachman. Reason enough for overlooking her spots. Who's that man? he grunted, with a drop of his lantern jaws and a slight gesture towards the unknown interloper. Another of us, replied Hexford, with a shrug. We're both rather interested in this horse. Wouldn't another time do? pleaded the coachman, looking gravely down at the flowers he held. It's most time for the funeral, and I don't feel like talking. Indeed I don't, gentlemen. We won't keep you. It was Sweetwater who spoke. The mare's company enough for us. She knows a lot, this mare. I can see it in her eye. I understand horses. We'll have a little chat, she and I, when you are gone. Brown cast an uneasy glance at Hexford. "'He'd better not touch her,' he cautioned. "'He don't know the beast well enough for that.' "'He won't touch her,' Hexford assured him. "'She does look knowing, don't she? Would like to tell us something, perhaps. Was out that night, I heard you say. Curious. How did you know it?' "'I've said and said till I'm tired,' Brown answered, with sudden heat. This is pestering a man at a very unfortunate time. Look, the people are coming. I must go. My poor mistress and poor Miss Carmel. I liked him, do you understand? Liked him. And I do feel the trouble at the house, I do. His distress was so genuine that Hexford was inclined to let him go, but Sweetwater, with the cock of his keen eye, put in his word and held the coachman where he was. "'The old gal is telling me all about it,' muttered this sly, adaptable fellow. He had siddled up to the mare, and their heads were certainly very close together. "'Not touch her?' 
see here sweetwater had his arm round the filly's neck and was looking straight into her fiery and intelligent eye shall i pass her story on he asked with a magnetic smile at the astonished coachman which not only softened him but seemed to give the watchful hexford quite a new idea of this gawky interloper you'll oblige me if you can put her knowledge into words the man zadok declared with one fascinated eye on the horse and the other on the house where he evidently felt that his presence was wanted she was out that night and i know it as any coachman would know who doesn't come home stone drunk but where she was and who took her get her to tell if you can for i don't know no more than the dead the dead flashed out sweetwater wheeling suddenly about and pointing straight through the open stable door towards the house where the young mistress the old servant mourned lay in her funeral casket do you mean her the lady who is about to be buried could she tell if her lips were not sealed by a murderous hand she the word came low and awesomely rude and uncultured as the man was he seemed to be strangely affected by this unexpected suggestion i haven't the wit to answer that said he how can we tell what she knew the man who killed her is in jail he might talk to some purpose why don't you question him for a very good reason replied sweetwater with an easy good nature that was very reassuring he was arrested on the spot so that it wasn't he who drove this mare home unharnessed her put her back in her stall locked the stable door and hung up the key in its place in the kitchen some one else did that that's true enough and what does it show that the mare was out on some other errand than the one which ended in blood and murder was the coachman's unexpected retort is that so whispered sweetwater into the mare's cocked ear she's not quite ready to commit herself he drawled with another enigmatical smile at the lingering zadok she's keeping something back are you he pointedly inquired leaving the stalls and walking briskly up to zadok the coachman frowned and hastily retreated a step but in another moment he leaped in a rage upon sweetwater when the sight of the flowers he held recalled him to himself and he let his hand fall again with a quiet remark you're overstepping your duty i don't know who you are or what you want with me but you're overstepping your duty he's right muttered hexford better let the fellow go see one of the maids is beckoning to him he shall go and welcome if he will tell me where he gets his taste for this especial brand of whisky sweetwater had crossed to the cupboard and taken down the lower half of the broken bottle which had attracted his notice on his first entrance and was now holding it out with a quizzical look at the departing coachman hexford was at his shoulder with a spring and together they inspected the label still sticking to it which was that of the very rare and expensive spirit found missing from the clubhouse vault this is a find muttered hexford into his fellow detective's ear then with a quick move towards zadok he shouted out you'd better answer that question where did this bit of broken bottle come from they don't give you whisky like this to drink that they don't muttered the coachman not so much abashed as they had expected and i wouldn't care for it if they did i found that bit of bottle in the ash barrel outside and fished it out to put varnish in i like the shape broken this way yes it's just as good is it well never mind run along we'll close the stable door for you i'd rather do it myself and carry in the key here then we're going to the funeral too you'd like to this letter in a whisper to sweetwater the answer was a fervent one nothing in all the world would please this protean natured man quite so well End of chapter eleven
Chapter Twelve of the House of the Whispering Pines by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Twelve, Lila, Lila. Oh, treble woe! Fall ten times trouble on that cursed head, whose wicked deed thy most ingenuous sense deprived thee of. Hold off the earth a while till i have caught her once more in my arms hamlet let us enter by the side door suggested sweetwater as the two moved towards the house and be sure you place me where i can see without being seen i have no wish to attract attention to myself or to be identified with the police until the necessity is forced upon me then we won't go in together decided hexford find your own place you won't have any difficulty a crowd isn't expected miss cumberland's condition forbids it sweetwater nodded and slid in at the side door he found himself at once in a narrow hall from the end of which opened a large room a few people were to be seen in this latter place and his first instinct was to join them but finding that a few minutes yet remained before the hour set for the services he decided to improve them by a rapid glance about this hall which for certain reasons hardly as yet formulated in his own mind had a peculiar interest for him the most important object within view according to his present judgment was the staircase which connected it with the floor above but if you had asked his reason for this conclusion he would not have told you as Renelay might have done, that it was because it was the most direct and convenient approach to Carmel Cumberland's room. His thoughts were far from this young girl, intimately connected as she was with this crime, which shows through what a blind maze he was insensibly working. With his finger on the thread which had been put in his hand, he was feeling his way along inch by inch. It had brought him to this staircase, and it led him next to a rack upon which hung several coats and a gentleman's hat he inspected the former and noted that one was finished with a high collar but he passed the letter by it was not a derby the table stood next to the rack and on its top lay nothing more interesting than a clothes brush and one or two other insignificant objects but with his memory for details he had recalled the keys which one of the maids had picked up somewhere about this house and laid on a hall table if this were the hall and this the table then was every inch of the latter's simple cloth covered top of the greatest importance in his eyes he had no further time for even these cursory investigations hexford's step could be heard on the veranda and sweetwater was anxious to locate himself before the officer came in entering the room before him he crossed to the small group clustered in its further doorway there were several empty chairs in sight but he passed around them all to a dark and inconspicuous corner from which without effort he could take in every room on that floor from the large parlour in which the casket stood to the remotest region of the servants hall the clergyman had not yet descended and sweetwater had time to observe the row of little girls sitting in front of the bearers each with a small cluster of white flowers in her hand miss cumberland's sunday school class he conjectured and conjectured rightly he had also perceived that some of these children loved her near them sat a few relatives and friends among these was a very very old man whom he afterwards heard was a great uncle and a centenarian between him and one of the little girls there apparently existed a strong sympathy for his hand reached out and drew her to him when the tears began to steal down her cheeks and the looks which passed between the two had all the appeal and all the protection of a great love sweetwater who had many a soft spot in his breast felt his heart warm at this one innocent display of natural feeling in an assemblage otherwise frozen by the horror of the occasion 
his eyes dwelt lingeringly on the child and still more lingeringly on the old old man before passing to that heaped-up mound of flowers under which lay a murdered body and a bruised heart he could not see the face but the spectacle was sufficiently all-compelling without that would it have seemed yet more so had he known at whose request the huge bunch of lilies had been placed over that silent heart the sister sick the brother invisible there was little more to hold his attention in this quarter so he let it roam across the heads of the people around him to the distant hall communicating with the kitchen several persons were approaching from this direction among them zadok the servants of the house no doubt for they came in all together and sat down side by side in the chairs sweetwater had so carefully passed by there were five persons in all two men and three women only two interested him zadok with whom he had already made a superficial acquaintance and had had one bout and a smart bright-eyed girl with a resolute mouth softened by an insistent dimple who struck him as possessing excellent sense and some natural cleverness a girl to know and a girl to talk to was his instantaneous judgment then he forgot everything but the solemnity of the occasion for the clergyman had entered and taken his place and a great hush had fallen upon the rooms and upon every heart there present i am the resurrection and the life never had these consoling words sounded more solemn than when they rang above the remains of adelaide cumberland in this home where she had reigned as mistress ever since her seventeenth year the nature of the tragedy which had robbed the town of one of its most useful young women the awful fate impending over its supposed author a man who had come and gone in these rooms with a spell of fascination to which many of those present had themselves succumbed the brooding sense of illness if not impending death in the room above gave to these services a peculiar poignancy which in some breasts of greater susceptibility than the rest took the form of a vague expectancy bordering on terror sweetwater felt the poignancy but did not suffer from the terror his attention had been attracted in a new direction and he found himself watching with anxious curiosity the attitude and absorbed expression of a good-looking young man whom he was far from suspecting to be the secret representative of the present suspect whom nobody could forget yet whom nobody wished to remember at this hallowed hour had his attitude and his absorption been directed towards the casket over which the clergyman's words rose and fell with ever-increasing impressiveness he might have noted the man but would scarcely have been held by him but his interest sincere and strong as it undoubtedly was centred not so much in the services careful as he was to maintain a decorous attitude towards the same but in the faint murmurs which now and then came down from above where unconsciousness reigned and the stricken brother watched over the delirious sister with a concentration and abandonment to fear which made him oblivious of all other duties and almost as unconscious of the rights then being held below over one who had been almost as a mother to him as the sick girl herself with her ceaseless and importunate lila lila the detective watching this preoccupied stranger shared in some measure his secret emotions and thus was prepared for the unexpected occurrence of a few minutes later no one else had the least forewarning of any break in the services there had been nothing in the subdued but impressive rendering of the prayers to foreshadow a dramatic episode yet it came and in this manner the final words had been said and the friends present invited to look their last on the calm face which to many there had never worn so sweet a smile in life some had hesitated but most had obeyed the summons among them sweetwater 
but he had not much time in which to fix those features in his mind for the little girls who had been waiting patiently for this moment now came forward and he stepped aside to watch them as they filed by dropping as they did so a tribute of fragrant flowers upon the quiet breast they were followed by the servants among whom zadok had divided his roses as the last cluster fell from the coachman's trembling hand the undertaker advanced with the lid and pausing a moment to be sure that all were satisfied began to screw it on suddenly there was a cry and the crowd about the door leading to the main hall started back as wild steps were heard on the stairs and a young man rushed into the room where the casket stood and advanced upon the officiating clergyman and the astonished undertaker with a fierceness which was not without its suggestion of authority take it off he cried pointing at the lid which had just been fastened down i have not seen her i must see her take it off it was the brother awake at last to the significance of the hour the clergyman aghast at the sacrilegious look and the tone of the intruder stepped back raised one arm in remonstrance and instinctively shielding the casket with the other but the undertaker saw in the frenzied eye fixed upon his own that which warned him to comply with the request thus harshly and peremptorily uttered unscrewing the lid he made way for the intruder who drawing near pushed aside the roses which had fallen on the upturned face and laying his hand on the brow muttered a few low words to himself then he withdrew his hand and without glancing to right or left staggered back to the door amid a hush as unbroken as that which reigned behind him in that open casket another moment and his white haggard face and disordered figure would be blotted from sight by the door jamb the minister recovered his poise and the bearers their breath the men stirred in their seats and the women began to cast frightened looks at each other and then at the children some of whom had begun to whimper when in an instant all were struck again into stone the young man had turned and was facing them all with his hands held out in a clench which in itself was horrible if they let the man go he called out in low and threatening tones i will strangle him with these two hands the word and not the shriek which burst irrepressibly from more than one woman before him brought him to himself with a ghastly look on his bloated features he scanned for one moment the row of deeply shocked faces before him then tottered back out of sight and fled towards the staircase all thought that an end had come to the harrowing scene and minister and people faced each other once more when loud and sharp from above there rang down the shrill cry of delirium this time in articulate words which even the children could understand break it open i say break it open and see if her heart is there it was too awful men and women and children leaped to their feet and dashed away into the streets uttering smothered cries and wild ejaculations in vain the clergyman raised his voice and bade them respect the dead the rooms were well nigh empty before he had finished his appeal only the very old uncle and the least of the children remained of all who had come there in memory of their departed kinswoman and friend the little one had fled to the old man's arms before he could rise and was now held close to his aged and shaking knees while he strove to comfort her and explain soon these two were gone and the casket was refastened and carried out by the shrinking bearers leaving in those darkened rooms a trail of desolation which was only broken from time to time by the now faint and barely heard reiteration of the name of her who had just been borne away lila lila end of chapter twelve
Chapter Thirteen of the House of the Whispering Pines by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Thirteen. What we want is here. I'll tell you, by the way, the greatest comfort in the world. You said there was a clue to all. Remember, sweet. He said there was a clue. I hold it. Come. A blot in the scutcheon. Sweetwater, however affected by this scene, had not lost control of himself or forgotten the claims of duty. He noted at a glance that, while the candid-looking stranger, whose lead he had been following, was as much surprised as the rest at the nature of the interruption, which he had possibly anticipated and for which he was in some measure prepared, he was, of all present, the most deeply and peculiarly impressed by it. No element of fear had entered into his emotion, nor had it been heightened by any superstitious sense. Something deeper and more important by far had darkened his thoughtful eye and caused that ebb and flow of colour in a cheek unused, if Sweetwater read the man aright, to such quick and forcible changes sweetwater took occasion likewise while the excitement was at its height to mark what effect had been made on the servants by the action and conduct of young cumberland they know him better than we do was his inner comment what do they think of his words and what do they think of him it was not so easy to determine as the anxious detective might wish only one of them showed a simple emotion and that one was without any possibility of doubt, the cook. She was a Roman Catholic, and was simply horrified by the sacrilege of which she had been witness. There was no mistaking her feelings. But those of the other two women were more complex. So were those of the men. Zadok specially watched each movement of his young master with open mistrust, and very nearly started upright in his repugnance and dismay, when that intruding hand fell on the peaceful brow of her over whose fate to his own surprise he had been able to shed tears some personal prejudice lay back of this or some secret knowledge of the man from whose touch even the dead appeared to shrink and the women might not the same explanation account for that curious droop of the eye with which the two younger clutched at each other's hands to keep from screaming and interchanged whispered words which sweetwater would have given considerable out of his carefully cherished hoard to have heard it was impossible to tell at present but he was confident that it would not be long before he understood these latter at least he had great confidence in his success with women homely as he was he was not so sure of himself with men and he felt that some difficulties and not a few pitfalls lay between him and for instance the uncommunicative zadok but i've the whole long evening before me he added in quiet consolation to himself it will be a pity if i can't work on some of them in that time the last thing he had remarked before carmel's unearthly cry had sent the horrified guests in disorder from the house was the presence of Dr. Perry in a small room which Sweetwater had supposed empty until the astonishing events I have endeavoured to describe brought its occupant to the door. What the detective then read in the countenance of the family's best friend he kept to himself, but his own lost a trace of its former anxiety, as the official slipped back out of sight and remained so, even after the funeral cortege had started on its course plans had been made for carrying the servants to the cemetery and despite the universal disturbance consequent upon these events the plans were adhered to sweetwater watched them all ride away in the last two carriages this gave him the opportunity he wanted leaving his corner he looked up hexford and asked who was left in the house dr perry mr clifton the lawyer mr cumberland his sick sister and the nurse mr cumberland didn't he go to the grave 
did you expect him to after that sweetwater's shoulders rose and his voice took on a tone of indifference there's no telling where is he now do you think upstairs yes it seems he spends all his time in a little alcove opposite his sister's door they won't let him inside for fear of disturbing the patient so he just sits where i've told you doing nothing but listening to every sound that comes through the door is he there now yes and shaking just like a leaf i walked by him a moment ago and noticed particularly where's his room inside of the alcove you mention no there's a partition or two between if you go up by the side staircase you can slip into it without anyone seeing you coroner perry and mr clifton are in front is the side door locked no lock it the back door of course is yes the cook attended to that i want a few minutes all by myself help me hexford if dr perry has given you no orders take your stand upstairs where you can give me warning if mr cumberland makes a move to leave his post or the nurse her patient i'm ready but i've been in that room and i've found nothing i don't know that i shall you say that it is near the head of the stairs running up from the side door just a few feet away i would have sworn to that fact even if you hadn't told me muttered sweetwater five minutes later he had slipped from sight and for some time not even hexford knew where he was dr perry may i have a few words with you the coroner turned quickly sweetwater was before him but not the same sweetwater he had interviewed some hours before in his office this was quite a different looking personage though nothing could change his features the moment had come when their inharmonious lines no longer obtruded themselves upon the eye and the anxious nay deeply troubled official whom he addressed saw nothing but the ardour and quiet self-confidence they expressed it'll not take long he added with a short significant glance in the direction of mr clifton dr perry nodded excused himself to the lawyer and followed the detective into the small writing-room which he had occupied during the funeral in the decision with which sweetwater closed the door behind them there was something which caused the blood to mount to the coroner's brow you have made some discovery said he a very important one was the quick emphatic reply and in a few brief words the detective related his interview with the master mechanic's wife on the high road then with an eager now let me show you something he led the coroner through the dining-room into the side hall where he paused before the staircase up queried the coroner with an obvious shrinking from what he might encounter above no was the whispered reply what we want is here and pushing open a small door let into the under part of the stairway if Renelay in his prison cell could have seen and understood this movement he disclosed a closet and in that closet a coat or two and one derby hat he took down the latter and holding it out to the light pointed to a spot on the under side of its brim the coroner staggered as he saw it and glanced helplessly about him he had known this family all their lives and the father had been his dearest friend but he could say nothing in the face of this evidence the spot was a flower mark in which could almost be discerned the outline of a woman's thumb End of chapter thirteen Chapter fourteen of the House of the Whispering Pines by Anna Catherine Green This Libovox recording is in the public domain Recording by Carolyn Chapter fourteen The Motionless Figure this blood there is something in this more than natural if philosophy could find it out hamlet 
the coat is here too whispered sweetwater after a moment of considerate silence i had searched the whole wreck for them i had searched his closets and was about owning myself to be on a false trail when i spied this little door we had better lock it now had we not till you make up your mind what to do with this conclusive bit of evidence yes lock it i'm not quite myself sweetwater i'm no stranger to this house or to the unfortunate people in it i wish i had not been re-elected last year i shall never survive the strain if he turned away sweetwater carefully returned the hat to its pig turned the key in the door and softly followed his superior back into the dining-room and thence to their former retreat i can see that it's likely to be a dreadful business he ventured to remark as the two stood face to face again but we've no choice facts are facts and we've got to make the best of them you mean me to go on go on following up the clues which you have yourself given me i've only finished with one there's another the bottles yes the bottles i believe that i shall not fail there if you'll give me a little time i am a stranger in town you remember and cannot be expected to move as fast as a local detective sweetwater you have but one duty to follow both clues as far as they will take you as for my duty that is equally plain to uphold you in all reasonable efforts and to shrink at nothing which will save the innocent and bring penalty to the guilty only be careful remember the evidence against Renelay. you will have to force an exceedingly strong chain to hold your own against the facts which have brought this recreant lover to book you see oh i wish that poor girl could get ease he impetuously cried as lila lila rang again through the house there can never be any ease for her murmured sweetwater whatever the truth she is bound to suffer if ever she awakens to reality again do you agree with the reporters that she knew why and for what her unhappy sister left this house at night if not why this fever that sound she the coroner was emphatic she is the only one who is wholly innocent in this whole business consider her at every point her life is invaluable to every one concerned but she must not be roused to the fact not yet nor must he be startled either you know whom i mean quiet does it sweetwater quiet and a seeming deference to his wishes as the present head of the house is the place his has miss cumberland made a will her will will be read to-morrow for to-night arthur cumberland's position here is the position of a master i will respect it sir up to all reasonable bounds i don't think he mediates giving any trouble he is not at all impressed by our presence all he seems to care about is what his sister may be led to say in her delirium that's how you look at it the coroner's tone was one of gloom then after a moment of silence you may call my carriage sweetwater i can do nothing further here to-day the atmosphere of this house stifles me dead flowers dead hopes and something worse than death lowering in the prospect i remember my old friend this was his desk let us go i say sweetwater threw open the door but his wistful look did not escape the old man's eye you're not ready to go wish to search the house perhaps naturally it has already been done in a general way i wish to do it thoroughly the coroner sighed i should be wrong to stand in your way get your warrant and the house is yours but remember the sick girl that's why i wish to do the job myself you're a good fellow sweetwater then as he was passing out i'm going to rely on you to see this thing through quietly if you can openly and in the public eye if you must the keys tell the tale 
the keys and the hat if the former had been left in the clubhouse and the latter found without the mark set on it by the mechanic's wife ranelagh's chances would look as slim to-day as they did immediately after the event but with things as they are he may well rest easily to-night the clouds are lifting for him which shows how little we poor mortals realize what makes for the peace even of those who are the nearest to us and whose lives and hearts we think we can read like an open book the coroner gone sweetwater made his way to the room where he had last seen mr clifton he found it empty and was soon told by hexford that the lawyer had left this was welcome news to him he felt that he had a fair field before him and learning that it would be some fifteen minutes yet before he could hope to see the carriages back he followed hexford upstairs i wish i had your advantages he remarked as they reached the upper floor what would you do i'd wander down the hall and take a long look at things you would i'd like to see the girl and i'd like to see the brother when he thought no one was watching him why see the girl i don't know i'm afraid that's just curiosity i've heard she was a wonderful beauty she was once and not now you cannot tell they have bound up her cheeks with clothes she fell on the grate and got burned but i say that's dreadful if she was so beautiful yes it's bad but there are worse things than that i wonder what she meant by that wild cry of tear it open see if her heart is still there tear what open the coffin of course what else could she have meant well delirium is a queer thing makes a fellow feel creepy all over i don't reckon on my nights here hexford help me to a peep i've got a difficult job before me and i need all the aid i can get oh there's no trouble about that walk boldly along he won't notice he won't notice no he notices nothing but what comes from the sick room i see sweetwater's jaw had fallen but it righted itself at this last word listening eh yes as a fellow never listened before expectant like yes i should call it expectant does the nurse know this the nurse is a puzzler how so half nurse and half but go see for yourself here is a package to take in medicine from the drug store tell her there was no one else to bring it up she'll show no surprise muttering his thanks sweetwater seized the proffered package and hastened with it down the hall he had been as far as the turn before but now he passed the turn to find just as he expected a closed door on the left and an open alcove on the right the door led into miss cumberland's room the alcove circular in shape and lighted by several windows projected from the rear of the extension and had for its outlook the stable and the huge sycamore tree growing beside it sweetwater's fingers passed thoughtfully across his chin as he remarked this and took in the expressive outline of its one occupant he could not see his face that was turned towards the table before which he sat but his drooping head rigid with desperate thinking his relaxed hand closed round the neck of a decanter which nevertheless he did not lift made upon sweetwater an impression which nothing he saw afterwards ever quite effaced when i come back that whisky will be half gone thought he and lingered to see the tumbler filled and the first draw taken but no the hand slowly unclasped and fell away from the decanter his head sank forward until his chin rested on his breast and a sigh startling to sweetwater fell from his lips hexford was right only one thing could arouse him sweetwater now tried that thing 
he knocked softly on the sick-room door this reached the ear oblivious to all else young cumberland started to his feet and for a moment sweetwater saw again the heavy features which an hour before had produced such a repulsive effect upon him in the rooms below then the nerveless figure sank again into place with the same constraint in its lines and the same dejection sweetwater's hand lifted in repetition of his knock hung suspended he had not expected quite such indifference as this it upset his calculations just a trifle as his hand fell he reminded himself of the coroner's advice to go easy easy it is was his internal reply i'll walk as lightly as if eggshells were under my feet the door was open to him this time as it swung back he saw first a burst of rosy colour as a room panelled in exquisite pink burst upon his sight then the great picture of his life the bloodless features of carmel calmed for the moment into sleep perfect beauty is so rare its effect so magical not even the bandage which swathed one cheek could hide the exquisite symmetry of the features or take from the whole face its sweet and natural distinction frenzy which had distorted the muscles and lit the eyes with a baleful glare was lacking at this moment repose had quieted the soul and left the body free to express its natural harmonies sweetwater gazed at the winsome brown head over the nurse's shoulder and felt that for him a new and important factor had entered into this case with his recognition of this woman's great beauty how deep a factor he was far from suspecting or he would not have met the nurse's eye with quite so cheery and self-confident a smile excuse the intrusion he said we thought you might need these things hexford signed for them i'm obliged to you are you one of them she sharply asked would it disturb you if i were i hope not i have no wish to seem intrusive what do you mean something i know give it a name before there's a change there she nodded towards the bed and sweetwater took advantage of the moment to scrutinize more closely the nurse herself she was a robust fine-looking woman producing an impression of capability united to kindness strength of mind and rigid attendance to duty dominated the kindness however if crossed in what she considered best for a patient possibly for herself she could be severe if not biting in her speech and manner so much sweetwater read in the cold clear eye and firm self-satisfied mouth of the woman awaiting his response to the court demand she had made i want another good look at your patient and i want your confidence since you and i may have to see much of each other before this matter is ended you asked me to speak plainly and i have done so you are from headquarters coroner perry sent me throwing back his coat he showed his badge the coroner has returned to his office he was quite upset by the outcry which came from this room at an unhappy moment during the funeral i know it was my fault i opened the door just for an instant and in that instant my patient broke through her topo and spoke she had drawn him in by this time and after another glance at her patient softly closed the door behind him i have nothing to report said she but the one sentence everybody heard sweetwater took in the little memorandum book and pencil which hung at her side and understood her position and extraordinary amendability to his wishes unconsciously a low exclamation escaped him he was young and had not yet sunk the man entirely in the detective a cruel necessity to watch so interesting a patient for anything but her own good he remarked yet because he was a detective as well as a man his eye went wandering all over the room as he spoke until it fell upon a peculiar-looking cabinet or closet let into the wall directly opposite the bed what's that he asked i don't know i can't make it out and i don't like to ask 
Sweetwater examined it for a moment from where he stood, then crossed over and scrutinized it more particularly. It was a unique specimen. What it lacked in height, it could not have measured more than a foot from the bottom to the top, it made up a length which must have exceeded five feet. The doors, of which it had two, were both tightly locked, but as they were made of transparent glass, the objects behind them were quite visible. It was the nature of these objects which made the mystery. The longer Sweetwater examined them, the less he understood the reason for their collection, much less for their preservation in a room which in all other respects expressed the quintessence of taste. At one end he saw a stuffed canary, not perched on a twig, but lying prone on its side. Near it was a doll, with scorched face and limbs half-consumed. Next this, the broken pieces of a china bowl and what looked like the torn remnants of some very fine lace. Further along, his eye lighted on a young girl's bonnet, exquisite in color and nicety of material, but crushed out of all shape and only betraying its identity by its dangling strings. The next article in this long array of totally unhomogeneous objects was a metronome, with its pendulum wrenched half off and one of its sides lacking. He could not determine the character of what came next, and only gave a casual examination to the rest. The whole affair was a puzzle to him, and he had no time for puzzles disconnected with the very serious affair he was engaged in investigating. "'Some childish nonsense,' he remarked, and moved towards the door. "'The servants will be coming back, and I had rather not be found here. "'You'll see me again. I cannot tell you just when. "'Perhaps you may want to send for me. "'If so, my name is Sweetwater.' His hand was on the knob, and he was almost out of the room when he started and looked back. A violent change in the patient had occurred. Disturbed by his voice, or by some inner pulsation of the fever which devoured her, Carmel had risen from the pillow and now sat, staring straight before her with every feature working and lips opened as if to speak. Sweetwater held his breath, and the nurse leaped towards her and gently encircled her with protecting arms lie down she prayed lie down everything is all right i am looking after things lie down little one and rest the young girl drooped and yielding to the nurse's touch sank slowly back on the pillow but in an instant she was up again and flinging out her hands she cried out loudly just as she had cried an hour before break it open break the glass and look in her heart should be there her heart her heart go or i cannot quiet her ordered the nurse and sweetwater turned to obey but a new obstacle offered the brother had heard this cry and now stood in the doorway who are you he impatiently demanded surveying sweetwater in sudden anger i brought up the drugs was the quiet explanation of the ever-ready detective I didn't mean to alarm the young lady, and I don't think I did. It's the fever, sir, which makes her talk so wildly. We want no strangers here, was the young Cumberland's response. Remember, nurse, no strangers. His tone was actually peremptory. Sweetwater observed him in real astonishment as he slid by and made his quiet escape. He was still more astonished when, on glancing towards the alcove, he perceived that, contrary to his own prognostication, the whisky stood as high in the decanter as before. "'I've got a puzzler this time,' was his comment, as he made his way downstairs. "'Even Mr. Grace would say that. I wonder how I'll come out. Uppermost,' he finished in secret emphasis to himself uppermost it would never do for me to fail in the first big affair i've undertaken on my own account end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the house of the whispering pines by anna katherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn 
Chapter Fifteen. Helen surprises Sweetwater. Lurk, lurk, King Lear. The returning servants drove up just as Sweetwater reached the lower floor. He was at the side door when they came in, and a single glance convinced him that all had gone off decorously at the grave, and that nothing further had occurred during their absence to disturb them. He followed them as they filed away into the kitchen, and, waiting till the men had gone about their work, turned his attention to the girls who stood about very much as if they did not know just what to do with themselves. "'Sit, ladies,' said he, drawing up chairs quite as if he were doing the honours of the house. Then, with a sly, compassionate look into each woe-begone face, he artfully remarked, you're all upset you are by what mr cumberland said in such an unbecoming way at the funeral he'd like to strangle mr Rennelay. why couldn't he wait for the sheriff it looks as if that gentleman would have the job all right oh don't wailed out one of the girls the impressionable warm-hearted maggie the horrors of this house will kill me i can't stand it a minute longer i'll go i'll go to-morrow you won't you're too kind-hearted to leave mr cumberland and his sister in their desperate trouble sweetwater put in with a decision as suggestive of admiration as he dared to assume her eyes filled and she said no more sweetwater shifted his attention to helen working around by her side he managed to drop these words into her ear she talks most but she doesn't feel her responsibilities any more than you do i've had my experience with women and you're of the sort that stays she rolled her eyes toward him in a slow surprised way that would have abashed most men i don't know your name or your business here said she but i do know that you take a good deal upon yourself when you say what i shall do or shan't do i don't even know myself that's because your eye is not so keen to your own virtues as well i won't say as mine but as those of any appreciative stranger i can't help seeing what you are you know she turned her shoulder, but not before he caught a slight disdainful twitch of her rosy, non-communicative mouth. "'Ah, ah, my lady, not quick enough,' thought he, and with the most innocent air in the world, he launched forth in a tirade against the man then in custody, as though his guilt were an accepted fact, and nothing but the formalities of the law stood between him and his final doom." it must make you all feel queer he wound up to think you have waited on him and seen him tramping about these rooms for months just as if he had not wicked feelings in his heart and meant to marry miss cumberland not to kill her oh oh maggie sobbed out and a perfect gentleman he was too i can't believe no bad of him he wasn't like her breath caught and so suddenly that Sweetwater was almost convinced that the more cautious Helen had twitched her by the skirt. Like, like other gentlemen who came here. It was a kind word he had, or a smile. I, I... She made no attempt to finish, but bounded to her feet, pulling up the more sedate Helen with her. Let's go, she whispered. I'm afeard of the man the other yielded and began to cross the floor behind the impetuous maggie sweetwater summoned up his courage one moment he prayed will you not tell me before you go whether the candlestick i have noticed on the dining-room mantel is not one of a pair yes there were two once said helen resisting maggie's effort to drag her out through the open door once smiled sweetwater by which you mean three days ago a lowering of her head and a sudden make for the door 
sweetwater changed his tone to one of simple inquiry and was that where they always stood the pair of them one on each end of the dining-room mantel she nodded involuntarily perhaps but decisively sweetwater hid his disappointment the room mentioned was a thoroughfare for the whole family any member of it could have taken the candlestick i'm obliged to you said he and might have ventured further had she given him the opportunity but she was too near the door to resist the temptation of flight in another moment she was gone and sweetwater found himself alone with his reflections they were not altogether unpleasing he was sure that he read the evidences of struggle in her slowly working lips and changing impulses so so thought he the good seed has found its little corner of soil i'll leave it to take root and sprout perhaps the coroner will profit by it if not i've a way of coaxing tender plants which should bring this one to fruit we'll see the moon shone that night much to sweetwater's discomfiture as he moved about the stable-yard he momentarily expected to see the window of the alcove thrown up and to hear mr cumberland's voice raised in loud command for him to quit the premises but no such interruption came the lonely watcher whose solitary figure he could just discern above the unshaded sill remained immovable with his head buried in his arms but whether in sleep or in brooding misery there was naught to tell the rest of the house presented an equally dolorous and forsaken appearance there were lights in the kitchen and lights in the servants rooms at the top of the house but no sounds either of talking or laughing all voices had sunk to a whisper and if by chance a figure passed one of the windows it was in a hurried frightened way which sweetwater felt very ready to appreciate in the stable it was no better zadok had brought an evening paper and was seeking solace from its columns sweetwater had attempted the sociable but had been met by a decided rebuff the coachman could not forget his attitude before the funeral and nothing not even the pitcher of beer the detective proposed to bring in softened the forbidding air with which this old servant met the other's advances soon sweetwater realized that his work was over for the night and planned to leave but there was one point to be settled first was there any other means of exit from these grounds save that offered by the ordinary driveway he had an impression that in one of his strolls about he had detected the outlines of a door in what looked like a thin brick wall in the extreme rear if so it were well worth his while to know where that door led working his way along the shadow cast by the house and afterward by the stable itself he came upon what was certainly a wall and a wall with a door in it he could see the latter plainly from where he halted in the thick of the shadows the moonlight shone broadly on it and he could detect the very shape and size of its lock it might be as well to try that lock but he would have to cross a very wide strip of moonlight in order to do so and he feared to attract attention to his extreme inquisitiveness yet who was there to notice him at this hour mr cumberland had not moved the girls were upstairs zadok was busy with his paper and the footman dozing over his pipe in the room over the stable sweetwater had just come from that room and he knew a quiet stable-yard and a closed door only ten feet away he glanced again at the letter and made up his mind advancing in a quiet sidelong way he had he laid his hand on the small knob above the lock and quickly turned it the door was unlocked and swung under his gentle push an alleyway opened before him leading to what appeared to be another residence street 
he was about to test the truth of his surmise when he heard a step behind him and turning encountered the heavy figure of the coachman advancing towards him with a key in his hand zadok was of an easy turn but he had been sorely tired that day and his limit had been reached you snooper he bawled what do you want here won't the run of the house content you come i want to lock that door it is my last duty before going to bed sweetwater assumed the innocent and i was just going this way it looks like a short road into town it is isn't it no yes growled the other whichever it is it isn't your road to-night that's private property sir the alley you see belongs to our neighbours no one passes through here but myself and he caught himself in time with a sullen grunt which may have been the result of fatigue or of that latent instinct of loyalty which is often the most difficult obstacle a detective has to encounter and mr ranelagh i suppose you would say was sweetwater's easy finish no answer the coachman simply locked the door and put the key in his pocket sweetwater made no effort to deter him more than that he desisted from further questions though he was dying to ask where this key was kept at night and whether it had been in its usual place on the evening of the murder he had gone far enough he thought another step and he might rouse this man's suspicion if not his enmity but he did not leave the shadows into which he again receded until he had satisfied himself that the key went into the stable with the coachman where it probably remained for this night at least it was after ten when sweetwater re-entered the house to say good-night to hexford he found him on watch in the upper hall and the man clark below he had a word with the former what is the purpose of the little door in the wall back of the stable it connects these grounds with those of the fultons the fultons live on houston street are the two families intimate very mr cumberland is sweet on the young lady there she was at the funeral to-day she fainted when you know when i can guess god what complications arise you don't say that any woman can care for him hexford gave a shrug he had seen a good deal of life he uses that door then sweetwater pursued after a minute probably did he use it that night he didn't visit her where did he go we can't find out he was first seen on garden street coming home after a night of debauch he had drunk hard asked where he got the liquor he maundered out something about a saloon but none of the places which he usually frequents had seen him that night i have tried them all and some that weren't in his books it was no good that door is supposed to be locked at night zadok says that's his duty was it locked that night can't say perhaps the coroner can you see the inquiry ran in such a different direction at first that a small matter like that may have been overlooked sweetwater subdued the natural retort and reverting to the subject of the saloons got some specific information in regard to them then he passed thoughtfully downstairs only to come upon helen who was just extinguishing the front hall light good night he said in passing good night mr sweetwater there was something in her tone which made him stop and look back she had stepped into the library and was blowing out the lamp there he paused a moment and sighed softly then he started towards the door only to stop again and cast another look back she was standing in one of the doorways anxiously watching him and twisting her fingers in and out in an irresolute way truly significant in one of her disposition he felt his heart leap returning softly 
he took up his stand before her, looking her straight into the eye. "'Good night,' he repeated, with an odd emphasis. "'Good night,' she answered, with equal force and meaning. But the next moment she was speaking rapidly, earnestly. "'I can't sleep,' said she. "'I never can when I'm not certain of my duty. Mr. Rennelay is an injured man. Ask what was said and done at their last dinner here. I can't tell you. I didn't listen and I didn't see what happened, but it was something out of the ordinary. Three broken wine-glasses lay on the tablecloth when I went in to clear away. I heard the clatter when they fell and smashed, but I said nothing. I have said nothing since, but I know there was a quarrel, and that Mr. Rennelay was not in it, for his glass was the only one which remained unbroken. Am I wrong in telling you? I wouldn't if— if it were not for Mr. Rennelay. He didn't do right by Miss Cumberland, but he don't deserve to be in prison, and so would Miss Carmel tell you if she knew what was going on, and could speak. She loved him, and— I've said enough, I've said enough— the agitated girl protested as he leaned eagerly towards her i couldn't tell the priest any more good night and she was gone he hesitated a moment then pursued his way to the side door and so out of the house into the street as he passed along the front of the now darkened building he scanned it with a new interest and a new doubt Soon he returned to his old habit of muttering to himself. We don't know the half of what has taken place within those walls during the last four weeks, said he. But one thing I will solve, and that is where this miserable fellow spent the hours between this dinner they speak of and the time of his return next day. Hexford has failed at it. Now we'll see what a blooming stranger can do. End of chapter 15。and all things will be well, I warrant thee. Romeo and Juliet He was walking south, and on the best-lighted and most beautiful street in town, but his eyes were for ever seeking a break in the long line of fence which marked off the grounds of a seemingly interminable stretch of neighbouring mansions, and when a corner was at last reached, he dashed around it and took a straight course for Houston Street, down which he passed with quickened steps and an air of growing assurance. He was soon at the bottom of the hill where the street, taking a turn, plunged him at once into a thickly populated district. As this was still the residence quarter, he passed on until he gained the heart of the town and the region of the saloons. Here he slackened peace and consulted a memorandum he had made while talking to Hexford. A big job, was his comment, sorry to find the hour quite so late. But I'm not bound to finish it tonight. A start is all I can hope for, so here goes. It was not his intention to revisit the places so thoroughly overhauled by the police. He carried another list, that of certain small groceries and quite unobtrusive hotels where a man could find a private room in which to drink alone, it being Sweetwater's conviction that in such a place, and in such a place only, would be found the tokens of those solitary hours spent by Arthur Cumberland between the time of his sister's murder and his reappearance the next day. Had they been spent in his old haunts, or in any of the well-known drinking saloons of the city, some one would have peached on him before this, he went on, in silent argument with himself. He's too well known, 
too much of a swell for all this lowering aspect and hang-dog look to stroll along unnoticed through any of the principal streets so soon after the news of his sister's murder had set the whole town agog yet he was not seen till he struck garden street a good quarter of a mile from his usual resorts here sweetwater glanced up at the corner gas lamp beneath which he stood and seeing that he was in garden street tried to locate himself in the exact spot where this young man had first been seen on the notable morning in question then he looked carefully about him nothing in the street or its immediate neighbourhood suggested the low and secret den he was in search of i shall have to make use of the list he decided and asked the first passer-by the way to hubbell's alley it was a mile off that settles it muttered sweetwater besides i doubt if he would go into an alley the man has sunk low but hardly so low as that what's the next address i have cuthbert road where's that espying a policeman eyeing him with more or less curiosity from the other side of the street he crossed over and requested to be directed to cuthbert road cuthbert road that's where the markets are they're closed at this time of night was the somewhat suspicious reply evidently the location was not a savoury one are there nothing but markets there inquired sweetwater innocently it was his present desire not to be recognized as a detective even by the men on beat i'm looking up a friend he keeps a grocery or some kind of small hotel i have his number but i don't know how to get to cuthbert road then turn straight about and go down the first street and you'll reach it before the trolley car you see up there can strike this corner but first sew up your pockets there's a bad block between you and the markets sweetwater slapped his trousers and laughed i wasn't born yesterday he cried and following the officer's directions made straight for the road worse than the alley he muttered but too near to be slighted i wonder if i shouldn't have borrowed somebody's old coat it had been wiser certainly in garden street all the houses had been closed and dark but here they were open and often brightly lighted and noisy from cellar to roof men women and frequently children jostled him on the pavement and he felt his pockets touched more than once but he wasn't caleb sweetwater of the new york department of police for nothing he laughed bantered fought his way through and finally reached the quieter region and at this hour the almost deserted one of the markets sixty-two was not far off and pausing a moment to consider his course he mechanically took in the surroundings he was surprised to find himself almost in the open country the houses extending on his left were fronted by the booths and stalls of the market but beyond these were the fields interested in this discovery and anxious to locate himself exactly he took his stand under a favouring gas lamp and took out his map what he saw sent him forward in haste shops had now taken the place of tenements and as these were mostly closed there were very few persons on the block and those were quiet and unobtrusive he reached a corner before coming to sixty two and was still more interested to perceive that the street which branched off thus immediately from the markets was a wide and busy one offering both a safe and easy approach to dealer and customer i'm on the track he whispered almost aloud in his secret self-congratulation sixty two will prove a decent quiet resort which i may not be above patronizing myself but he hesitated when he reached it some houses invite and some repel this house repelled yet there was nothing shabby or mysterious about it 
there was the decent entrance lighted but not too brilliantly a row of dark windows over it and above it all a sloping roof in which another sparkle of light drew his attention to an upper row of windows this time of the old dormer shape an alley ran down one side of the house to the stables now locked but later to be thrown open for the use of the farmers who begin to gather here as early as four o'clock nothing wrong in its appearance everything shipshape and yet i shall find some strange characters here was the sweetwater comment with which our detective opened the door and walked into the house it was an unusual hour for guests and the woman he saw bending over a sort of desk in one corner of the room he strode into looked up hastily almost suspiciously well and what is your business she asked with her eye on his clothes which while not fashionable were evidently of the sort not often seen in that place i want a room he tipsily confided to her in which i can drink and drink till i cannot say i'm in trouble i am but i don't want to do any mischief i only want to forget i've money and as he saw her mouth open and i've the stuff whiskey just whiskey give me a room i'll be quiet i'll give you nothing she was hot angry and full of distrust this house is not for such as you it's a farmer's lodging honest men who'd stare and go mad to see a fellow like you about go along i tell you or i'll call jim he'll know what to do with you then he'll know more than i do myself mumbled the detective with a crushed and discouraged air money and not a place to spend it in why can't i go in there he peevishly inquired with a tremulous gesture towards a half-open door through which a glimpse could be got of a neat little snuggery nobody'll see me give me a glass and leave me till i rap for you in the morning that's worth a fiver don't you think so missis and we'll begin by passing over the fiver no she was mighty peremptory and what was more she was in a great hurry to get rid of him this haste and the anxious ear she turned towards the hall enlightened him as to the situation there was some one within hearing or liable to come within hearing who possibly was not so stiff under temptation could it be her husband if so it might be worth his own while to wait the good man's coming if only he could manage to hold his own for the next few minutes changing his tactics he turned his back on the snuggery and surveyed the offended woman with just a touch of maudlin sentiment i say he cried just loud enough to attract the attention of any one within earshot you're a mighty fine woman and the boss of this here establishment that's evident i'd like to see the man who could say no to you he's never sat in that ear cashier's seat where you be of that i'm dead sure he wouldn't care for fivers if you didn't nor for tens either she was really a fine woman for her station and a buxom powerful one too but her glance wavered under these words and she showed a desire with difficulty suppressed to use the strength of her white but brawny arms in shoving him out of the house to aid her self-control he on his part began to edge towards the door always eyeing her and always speaking loudly in admirably acted tipsy unconsciousness of the fact i am a man who likes my own way as well as anybody were the words with which he sought to save the situation and further his own purposes but i never quarrel with a woman her whims are sacred to me 
i may not believe in them they may cost me money and comfort but i yield i do when they are as strong in their wishes as you be i'm going missus i'm going oh the exclamation burst from him he could not help it the door behind him had opened and a man stepped in causing him so much astonishment that he forgot himself the woman was big bigger than most women who rule the roost and do the work in haunts where work calls for muscle and a good head behind it she was also rosy and of a make to draw the eye if not the heart but the man who now entered was small almost to the point of being a mannequin and more than that he was weazen of face and ill-balanced on his two tiny ridiculous legs yet she trembled at his presence and turned a shade paler as she uttered the feeble protest jim is she making a fool of herself asked the little man in a voice as shrill as it was weak do your business with me women are no good and he stalked into the room as only little men can sweetwater took out his ten pointed to the snuggery and tapped his breast pocket whisky here he confided bring me a glass i don't mind your farmers they won't bother me what i want is a locked door and a still mouth in your head the last he whispered in the husband's ear as the wife crossed reluctantly back to her books the man turned the bill he had received over and over in his hand then scrutinized sweetwater with his first show of hesitation you don't want to kill yourself he asked sweetwater laughed with a show of good humour that appeared to relieve the woman if it did not the man oh that's it he cried that's what the missus was afraid of was it well i vow and ten thousand dollars to my credit in the bank no i don't want to kill myself i just want to booze to my heart's content with nobody by to count the glasses you've known such fellows before and that cosy little room over there has known them too just add me to the list it won't harm you the man's hand closed on the bill sweetwater noted the action out of the corner of his eye but his direct glance was on the woman her back was to him but she had started as he mentioned the snuggery and made as if to turn but thought better of it and bent lower over her books i've struck the spot he murmured exultantly to himself this was the place i want and here i'll spend the night but not to booze my wits away oh no nevertheless it was a night virtually wasted he learned nothing more than what was revealed by that one slight movement on the part of the woman though the man came in and sat with him for an hour and they drank together out of the flask sweetwater had brought with him he was as impervious to all sweetwater's wiles and as blind to every bait he threw out as any man the young detective had ever had to do with when the door closed on him and sweetwater was left to sit out the tedious night alone it was with small satisfaction to himself and some regret for his sacrificed bill the driving in of the farmers and the awakening of life in the market and all the stir it occasioned inside the house and out prevented sleep even if he had been inclined that way he had to swallow his pill and he did it with the best grace possible sooner than was expected of him sooner than was wise perhaps he was on his feet and peering out of the one small window this most dismal day room contained he had not mistaken the outlook it gave on to the alley and all that was visible from behind the curtains where he stood was the thick brick wall of the neighbouring house this wall had not even a window in it which in itself was a disappointment to one of his resources he turned back into the room disgusted 
then crept to the window again and softly raising the sash cast one of his lightning glances up and down the alley then he softly let the sash fall again and retreated to the centre of the room where he stood for a moment with a growing smile of intelligence and hope on his face he had detected close against the side of the wall a box or hand cart full of empty bottles it gave him an idea with an impetuosity he would have criticized in another man he flung himself out of the room in which he had been for so many hours confined and coming face to face with the landlady standing in unexpected watch before the door found it a strain on his nerves to instantly assume the sullen vaguely abused air with which he had decided to leave the house nevertheless he made the attempt and if he did not succeed to his own satisfaction he evidently did to hers for she made no effort to stop him as he stumbled out and in her final look which he managed with some address to intercept he perceived nothing but relief what had been in her mind fear for him or fear for themselves he could not decide until he had rummaged that cart of bottles but how was he to do this without attracting attention to himself in a way he still felt to be undesirable in his indecision he paused on the sidewalk and let his glances wander vaguely over the busy scene before him before he knew it his eye had left the market and travelled across the snow-covered fields to a building standing by itself in the far distance its appearance was not unfamiliar seizing hold of the first man who passed him he pointed it out crying what building is that that that's the whispering pines the country club house where he didn't wait for the end of the sentence but plunged into the thickest group of people he could find with a determination greater than ever to turn those bottles over before he ate his manner of going about this was characteristic lounging about the stalls until he found just the sort of old codger he wanted he scraped up an acquaintance with him on the spot and succeeded in making himself so agreeable that when the old fellow sounded back to the stables to take a look at his horse sweetwater accompanied him hanging around the stable door he kept up his chatter while sizing up the bottles heaped in the cart at his side he even allowed himself to touch one or two in an absent way and was meditating an accidental upset of the whole collection when a woman he had not seen before thrust her head out of a rear window shouting sharply leave those bottles alone they're waiting for the old clothes man he pays us money for them sweetwater gaped and strolled away he had used his eyes to purpose and was quite assured that the bottle he wanted was not there but the woman's words had given him his cue and when later in the day a certain old jew peddler went his rounds through this portion of the city a disreputable-looking fellow accompanied him whom even the sharp landlady in cuthbert road would have failed to recognize as the same man who had occupied the snuggery the night before he was many hours on the route and had many new experiences with human nature but he gained little else and was considering with what words he should acknowledge his defeat at police headquarters when he found himself again at the markets and a minute later in the alley where the cart stood with the contents of which he had busied himself earlier in the day he had followed the peddler here because he had followed him to every other back door in alley but he was tired and had small interest in the cart which looked quite undisturbed and in exactly the same condition as when he turned his back upon it in the morning but when he drew nearer and began to lend a hand in removing the bottles to the wagon he discovered that a bottle had been added to the pile and that this bottle bore the label which marked it as being one of the two which had been taken from the clubhouse on the night of the murder End of chapter sixteen
Chapter Seventeen, Part One of *The House of the Whispering Pines* by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Seventeen. Must I tell these things? Had I but died an hour before this chance, I had lived a blessed time, for from this instant there is nothing serious in mortality; all is but toys renown and grace is dead the wine of life is drawn and the lease is left this vault to brag of macbeth the lamp in the corner's room shone dully on the perturbed faces of three anxious men they had been talking earnestly and long but were now impatiently awaiting the appearance of a fourth party as was shown by the glances which each threw from time to time towards the door leading into the main corridor the district attorney courted the light and sat where he would be the first seen by any one entering he had nothing to hide being entirely engrossed in his duty further back and rather behind the lamp than in front of it stood or sat as his restlessness prompted coroner perry the old friend of amasa cumberland with whose son he had now to do behind him and still further in the shadow could be seen the quiet figure of sweetwater all counted the minutes and all showed relief the coroner by a loud sigh when the door finally opened and an officer appeared followed by the lounging form of adelaide's brother arthur cumberland had come unwillingly and his dissatisfaction did not improve his naturally heavy countenance however he brightened a little at the sight of the two men sitting at the table and advancing broke into speech before either of the two officials had planned their questions i call this hard he burst forth my place is at home and at the bedside of my suffering sister and you drag me down here at nine o'clock at night to answer questions about things of which i am completely ignorant i've said all i have to say about the trouble which has come into my family but if another repetition of the same things will help to convict that scoundrel who has broken up my home and made me the wretchedest dog alive then i'm ready to talk so fire ahead dr perry and let's be done with it sit down replied the district attorney gravely with a gesture of dismissal to the officer mr cumberland we have spared you up to this time for two very good reasons you were in great trouble and you appeared to be in the possession of no testimony which could materially help us but matters have changed since you held conversation with dr perry on the day following your sister's decease you have laid that sister away the will which makes you an independent man for life has been read in your hearing you are in as much ease of mind as you can be while your remaining sister's life hangs trembling in the balance and more important still discoveries not made before the funeral have been made since rendering it very desirable for you to enter into particulars at this present moment which were not thought necessary then particulars what particulars don't you know enough as it is to hang the fellow wasn't he seen with his fingers on adelaide's throat what can i tell you that is any more damaging than that particulars the word seemed to irritate him beyond endurance never had he looked more unprepossessing or a less likely subject for sympathy than when he stumbled into the chair set for him by the district attorney arthur the word had a supple ring the coroner who uttered it waited to watch its effect seemingly it had none after the first sullen glance thrown him by the young man and the coroner sighed again but this time softly and as a prelude to the following speech we can understand said he why you should feel so strongly against one who has divided the hearts of your sisters and played with one if not with both 
few men could feel differently you have reason for your enmity and we excuse it but you must not carry it to the point of open denunciation before the full evidence is in and the fact of murder settled beyond all dispute whatever you may think whatever we may think it has not been so settled there are missing links still to be supplied and this is why we have summoned you here and ask you to be patient and give the district attorney a little clearer account of what went on in your own house before you broke up that evening and went to your debauch and your sister adelaide to her death at the whispering pines i don't know what you mean he brought his fist down on the table with each word nothing went on that is something went on at dinner-time it was not a usual meal put in the district attorney you and your sisters stop he was at that point of passion which dulls the most self-controlled to all sense of propriety don't talk to me about that dinner i want to forget that dinner i want to forget everything but two things i live for to see that fellow hanged and to the words choked him and he let his head fall but presently threw it up again that dastard who may god confound passed a letter across adelaide into carmel's hand he panted out i saw him but i didn't take it in i wasn't thinking i was who broke the glasses urged his relentless inquisitor one at your plate one at carmel's and one at the head of the board where sat your sister adelaide god must i tell these things he had started to his feet and his hand violently in all it did struck his forehead impulsively as he uttered this exclamation have it then heaven knows i think of it enough not to be afraid to speak it out in words adelaide the name came with passion but once uttered produced its own calming effect so that he went on with more restraint adelaide never had much patience with me she was a girl who only saw me one way the right the right was what she dinned into my ears from the time i was a small boy and didn't know but that all youngsters were brought up by sisters i grew to hate what she called the right i wanted pleasure a free time and a good drink whenever the fancy took me you know what i am dr perry and everybody in town knows but the impulse which has always ruled me was not a downright evil one or if it was i called it natural independence and let it go at that but adelaide suffered i didn't understand it and i didn't care a fig for it but she did suffer god forgive me he stopped and mopped his forehead sweetwater moved a trifle on his seat but the others men who had passed the meridian of life who had known temptations possibly had succumbed to them from time to time sat like two statues one in full light and the other in as dark a shadow as he could find that afternoon young cumberland presently resumed she was keyed up more than usual she loved ranelagh damn him and he had played or was playing her false she watched him with eyes that madden me now when i think of them she saw him look at carmel and she saw carmel look at him then her eyes fell on me i was angry angry at them all and i wanted a drink it was not her habit to have wine on the table but sometimes when ranelagh was there she did she was a slave to ranelagh and he could make her do whatever he wished just as he can make you and everybody else here he shot insolent glances at his two interlocutors one of whom changed colour which happily he did not see ring the bell i ordered and have in the champagne i want to drink to your marriage and the happy days in prospect for us all it was brutal and i knew it but i was reckless and wild for the wine so i guess was ranelagh for he smiled at her and she rang for the champagne 
when the glasses had been set beside each plate she turned towards carmel we will all drink she said to my coming marriage this made carmel turn pale for adelaide had never been known to drink a drop of liquor in her life i felt a little queer myself and not one of us spoke till the glasses were filled and the maid had left the dining-room and shut the door then adelaide rose we will drink standing said she and never had i seen her look as she did then i thought of my evil life when i should have been watching ranelagh and when she lifted the glass to her lips and looked at me almost as earnestly as she did at ranelagh but it was a different kind of earnestness i felt like like well like the wretch i was and always had been possibly always will be she drank we wouldn't call it drinking for she just touched the wine with her lips but to her it was debauch then she stood waiting with the strangest gleam in her eyes while ranelagh drained his glass and i drained mine ranelagh thought she wanted some sentiment and started to say something appropriate but his eyes fell on carmel who had tried to drink and couldn't and he bungled over his words and at last came to a pause under the steady stare of adelaide's eyes never mind elwood she said i know what you would like to say but that's not what i am thinking of now i am thinking of my brother the boy who will soon be left to find his way through life without even the unwelcome restraint of my presence i want him to remember this day i want him to remember me as i stand here before him with this glass in my hand you see wine in it arthur but i see poison poison nothing else for one like you who cannot refuse a friend cannot refuse your own longing never from this day on shall another bottle be opened under my roof carmel you have grieved as well as i over that past for pleasure in this house do as i do and may arthur see and remember her fingers opened the glass fell from her hand and lay in broken fragments beside her plate carmel followed suit and before i knew it my own fingers had opened and my own glass lay in pieces on the tablecloth beneath me only ranelagh's hand remained steady he did not choose to please her or he was planning his perfidy and had not caught her words or understood her action she held her breath watching that hand and i can hear the gasp yet with which she saw him set his glass down quietly on the board that's the story of those three broken glasses if she had not died that night i should be laughing at them now but she did die and i don't laugh i curse curse her recreant lover and sometimes myself do you want anything more of me i'm eager to be gone if you don't the district attorney sought out and lifted a paper from the others lying on the desk before him it was the first movement he had made since cumberland began his tale i'm sorry said he with a rapid examination of the paper in his hand but i shall have to detain you a few minutes longer what happened after the dinner where did you go from the table i went to my room to smoke i was upset and thirsty as a fish have you liquor in your room sometimes did you have any that night not a drop i didn't dare i wanted that champagne bottle but adelaide had been too quick for me it was thrown out wasted i do believe wasted so you did not drink you only smoked in your room smoked one cigar that was all then i went downtown his tone had grown sulky the emotion which had buoyed him up till now seemed suddenly to have left him with it went the fire from his eye the quiver from his lip and it is necessary to add everything else calculated to awaken sympathy he was simply sullen now may i ask by which door you left the house the side door 
the one i always take what overcoat did you wear i don't remember the first one i came to i suppose but you can surely tell us what hat they expected a violent reply and they got it no i can't what has my hat got to do with the guilt of elwood renley nothing we hope was the imperturbable answer but we find it necessary to establish absolutely just what overcoat and what hat you wore down street that night i've told you that i don't remember the young man's colour was rising are not these the ones queried the district attorney making a sign to sweetwater who immediately stepped forward with a shabby old ulster over his arm and a battered derby in his hand the young man started rose then sat again shouting out with angry emphasis no yet you recognize these why shouldn't i they're mine only i don't wear them any more they're done for you must have rooted them out from some closet we did perhaps you can tell us what closet i no what do i know about my old clothes i leave that to the women the slight faltering observable in the latter word conveyed nothing to these men mr cumberland the district attorney was very serious this hat and this coat old as they are were worn into town from your house that night this we know absolutely we can even trace them to the clubhouse mechanically not spontaneously this time the young man rose to his feet staring first at the man who had uttered these words then at the garments which sweetwater still held in view no anger now he was too deeply shaken for that too shaken to answer at once too shaken to be quite the master of his own faculties but he rallied after an interval during which these three men devoured his face each under his own special anxiety and read there possibly what each least wanted to see i don't know anything about it were the words with which arthur cumberland sought to escape from the net which had been thus deftly cast about him i didn't wear these things anybody can tell you what clothes i came home in ranelagh may have borrowed ranelagh wore his own coat and hat we will let the subject of apparel drop and come to a topic on which you may be better qualified to speak mr cumberland you have told us that you didn't know at the time and can't remember now where you spent that night and most of the next morning all you can remember is that it was in some place where they let you drink all that you wished and leave when the fancy took you and not before it was none of your usual haunts this seemed strange to your friends at the time but it is easier for us to understand now that you have told us what had occurred at your home table you dreaded to have your sister know how soon you could escape the influence of that moment you wished to drink your fill and leave your family none the wiser am i not right yes it's plain enough isn't it why harp on that string don't you see that it maddens me do you want to drive me to drink again the coroner interposed he had been very willing to leave the burden of this painful inquiry to the man who had no personal feelings to contend with but at this indignant cry he started forward and with an air of fatherly persuasion remarked kindly you mustn't mind the official tone or the official persistence there is a reason for all that mr fox says answer him frankly and this inquiry will terminate speedily we have no wish to hurry you only to get at the truth the truth i thought you had that pat enough the truth the truth about what ranelagh or me i should think it was about me from the kind of questions you ask it is just now 
resumed the district attorney, as his colleague drew back out of sight once more. "'You cannot remember the saloon in which you drank. That's possible enough, but perhaps you can remember what they gave you. Was it whiskey, rum, absinthe, or what?' The question took his irritable listener by surprise. Arthur gasped, and tried to steal some comfort from Coroner Perry's eye. But that old friend's face was too much in shadow, and the young man was forced to meet the district attorney's eye instead, and answer the district attorney's question. "'I drank absinthe,' he cried at last. "'From this bottle?' queried the other, motioning again to Sweetwater, who now brought forward the bottle he had picked up in Cuthbert Road. Arthur Cumberland glanced at the bottle the detective held up, saw the label, saw the shape, and sank limply in his chair, his eyes starting, his jaw falling. End of chapter 17, part 1《Chapter Seventeen, Part Two of the House of the Whispering Pines by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Seventeen, Part Two. Where did you get that? He asked, pulling himself together with the sudden, desperate self-possession that caused Sweetwater to cast a quick, significant glance at the corner, as he withdrew from his corner leaving the bottle on the table that answered the district attorney was picked up at a small hotel on cuthbert road just back of the markets i don't know the place it's not far from the whispering pines in fact you can see the clubhouse from the front door of this hotel i don't know the place i tell you it's not a high-class resort not select enough by a long shot to have this brand of liquor in its cellar they tell me that this is a very choice quality that very few private families even indulge in it that there were only two bottles of it left in the clubhouse when the inventory was last taken and that those two bottles are now gone and that this is one of them is that what you want to say well it may be for all i know i didn't carry it there i didn't have the drinking of it we have seen the man and woman who keep that hotel they will talk if they have to they will his dogged self-possession rather astonished them well that ought to please you i've nothing to do with the matter a change had taken place in him the irritability approaching to violence which had attended every speech and infused itself into every movement since he came into the room had left him he spoke quietly and with a touch of irony in his tone he seemed more the man but not a whit more prepossessing and if anything less calculated to inspire confidence the district attorney showed that he was baffled, and Dr. Perry moved uneasily in his seat, until Sweetwater, coming forward, took up the cue and spoke for the first time since young Cumberland entered the room. "'Then I have no doubt you will do us this favor," he volunteered, in his pleasantest manner. "'It's not a long walk from here.' will you go there in my company with your coat collar pulled up and your hat well down over your eyes and ask for a seat in the snuggery and show them this bottle they won't know that it's empty the man is sharp and the woman intelligent they will see that you are a stranger and admit you readily they are only shy of one man the man who drank there on the night of your sister's murder you're a uh, he began with the touch of his old violence but realizing perhaps that his fingers were in a trap he modified his manner again and continued more quietly this is an odd request to make 
I begin to feel as if my word were doubted here, as if my failings and reckless confession of the beastly way in which I spent that night were making you feel that I have no good in me, and am at once a liar and a sneak. I'm not. I won't go with you to that low-drinking hell, unless you make me, but I'll swear— Don't swear. It is unnecessary to say who spoke. We wouldn't believe you— and it would be only adding perjury to the rest. You wouldn't believe me? No. We have reasons, my boy. There were two bottles. Well? The other has been found nearer your home. That's a trick. You're all up to tricks. Not in this case, Arthur. Let me entreat you in memory of your father to be candid with us. We have arrested a man. He denies his guilt, but can produce no witnesses in support of his assertions. Yet such witnesses may exist. Indeed, we think that one such does exist. The man who took the bottles from the clubhouse's wine vault did so within a few minutes of the time when this crime was perpetrated on your sister. He should be able to give valuable testimony for or against Elwood Ranelagh. Now you can see why we are in search of this witness, and why we think you can serve us in this secret and extraordinary matter. If you can't, say so, and we will desist from all further questions. But this will not help you. It will only show that, in our opinion, you have gained the rights of a man suspected of something more than shirking his duty as an unknown and hitherto unsuspected witness. This is awful! Young Cumberland had risen to his feet and was swaying to and fro before them like a man struck between the eyes by some maddening blow. God! If I had only died that night! He muttered, with his eyes upon the floor, and every muscle tense with the shock of this last calamity. "'Dr. Perry,' he moaned suddenly, stretching out one hand in entreaty, and clutching at the table for support with the other. "'Let me go for to-night. Let me think. My brain is all in a whirl. I'll try to answer to-morrow.' But even as he spoke he realized the futility of this request. His eyes had fallen again on the bottle, and in its shape and tell-tale label he beheld a witness bound to testify against him if he kept silent himself. "'Don't answer,' he went on, holding fast to the table, but letting his other hand fall. "'I was always a fool. I'm nothing but a fool now. I may as well own the truth and be done with it. I was in the clubhouse.' I did rob the wine vault. I did carry off the bottles to have a quiet spree, and it was to some place on Cuthbert Road I went. But when I've admitted so much, I've admitted all. I saw nothing of my sister's murder, saw nothing of what went on in the rooms upstairs. I crept in by the open window at the top of the kitchen stairs, and I came out by the same. I only wanted the liquor, and when I got it, I slid out as quietly as I could, and made my way over the golf links to the road. Wiping the sweat from his brow, he stood trembling. There was something in the silence surrounding him which seemed to go to his heart, for his free right hand rose unconsciously to his breast and clung there. Sweetwater began to wish himself a million of miles away from this scene. This was not the enjoyable part of his work. This was the part from which he always shrunk with overpowering distaste. The district attorney's voice sounded thin, almost piercing, as he made this remark. You entered by an open window. Why didn't you go in by the door? I hadn't the key. I had only abstracted the one which opens the wine vault. The rest I left on the ring. It was the sight of this key, lying on our hall table, which first gave me the idea. I feel like a cat when I think of it, but that's of no account now. 
all i really care about is for you to believe what i tell you i wasn't mixed up in that matter of my sister's death i didn't know about it i wish i had adelaide might have been saved we might have all been saved but it was not to be flushed he slowly sank back into his seat no complaint now of being in a hurry or of his anxiety to regain his sick sister's bedside he seemed to have forgotten those fears in the perturbations of the moment his mind and interest were here everything else had grown dim with distance did you try the front door what was the use i knew it to be locked what was the use of trying the window wasn't it also presumably locked the red mounted hot and feverish to his cheek you'll think me no better than a street urchin or something worse he exclaimed i knew that window i had been through it before you can move that lock with your knife blade i had calculated on entering that way mr Renelay's story receives confirmation commented the district attorney wheeling suddenly towards the coroner he says that he found this window unlocked when he approached it with the idea of escaping that way arthur cumberland remained unmoved the district attorney wheeled back there were a number of bottles taken from the wine vault some half dozen were left on the kitchen table why did you trouble yourself to carry up so many because my greed outran my convenience i thought i could lung away an armful but there are limits to one's ability i realized this when i remembered how far i had to go and so left the greater part of them behind why when you had a team ready to carry you a eh, i had no team but the denial cost him something his cheek lost its ruddiness and took on a sickly white which did not leave it again as long as the interview lasted you had no team how then did you manage to reach home in time to make your way back to cuthbert road by half-past eleven i didn't go home i went straight across the golf links if fresh snow hadn't fallen you would have seen my tracks all the way to cuthbert road if fresh snow had not fallen we should have known the whole story of that night before an hour had passed how did you carry those bottles in my overcoat pockets these pockets he blurted out clapping his hands on either side of him had it begun to snow when you left the clubhouse no was it dark i guess not the links were bright as day or i shouldn't have got over them as quickly as i did quickly how quickly the district attorney stole a glance at the coroner which made sweetwater advance a step from his corner i don't know i don't understand these questions was the sullen reply you walked quickly does that mean you didn't look back how look back your sister lit a candle in the small room where her coat was found this light should have been visible from the golf links i didn't see any light he was almost rough in these answers he was showing himself now at his very worst a few more questions followed but they were of minor import and aroused less violent feeling the serious portion of the examination if thus it might be called was over and the parties showed the reaction which follows an unnatural restraint or subdued excitement the coroner glanced meaningly at the district attorney who tapping with his fingers on the table hesitated for a moment before he finally turned again upon arthur cumberland you wish to return to your sister you are at liberty to do so i will trouble you no more to-night your sleigh is at the door i presume 
the young man nodded then rising slowly looked first at the district attorney then at the coroner with a glance of searching inquiry which did not escape the watchful eye of sweetwater lurking in the rear there was no display of anger scarcely of impatience in him now if he spoke they did not hear him and when he moved it was heavily and with a drooping head they watched him go each as silent as he the coroner tried to speak but succeeded no better than the boy himself when the door opened under his hand they all showed relief but were startled back into their former attention by his turning suddenly in the doorway with his final remark what did you say about a bottle with a special label on it being found at our house it never was or if it was some fellow has been playing you a trick i carried off those two bottles myself one you see there the other is i can't tell where but i didn't take it home that you can bet on one more look followed by a heavy frown and a low growling sound in his throat which may have been his way of saying good-bye and he was gone sweetwater came forward and shut the door then the three men drew more closely together and the district attorney remarked he is better at the house i hadn't the heart on your account dr perry to hurry matters faster than necessity compels what a lout he is pardon me but what a lout he is to have had two such uncommon and attractive sisters and such a father interposed the coroner just so and such a father sweetwater hey what's the matter you don't look satisfied didn't i cover the ground fully sir so far as i can see now but well well out with it i don't know what to out with it's all right but i guess i'm a fool or tired or something can i do anything more for you if not i should like to hunt up a bunk a night's sleep will make a man of me again go then that is if dr perry has no orders for you none i want my sleep too but dr perry had not the aspect of one who expects to get it sweetwater brightened a few more words some understanding as to the morrow and he was gone the district attorney and the coroner still sat but very little passed between them the clock overhead struck the hour both looked up but neither moved another fifteen minutes then the telephone rang the coroner rose and lifted the receiver the message could be heard by both gentlemen in the extreme quiet of this midnight hour dr perry yes i'm listening he came in at a quarter to twelve greatly agitated and very white i ran upon him in the lower hall and he looked angry enough to knock me down but he simply let out a curse and passed straight up to his sister's room i waited till he came out then i managed to get hold of the nurse and she told me this queer tale he was all in a tremble when he came in but she declares he had not been drinking he went immediately to the bedside but his sister was asleep and he didn't stay there but went over where the nurse was and began to hang about her till suddenly she felt a twitch at her side and looking quickly saw the little book she carries there falling back into place he had lifted it and probably read what she had written in it during his absence she was displeased but he laughed when he saw that he had been caught and said boldly you are keeping a record of my sister's ravings well i think i'm as interested in them as you are and have as much right to read as you have to write thank god they are innocent enough even you must acknowledge that she made no answer for they were innocent enough but she'll keep the book away from him after this of that you may be sure and what is he doing now is he going into his room to-night no 
he went there but only to bring out his pillows he will sleep in the alcove drink no not a drop he has ordered the whisky locked up i hear him moaning sometimes to himself as if he missed it awfully but not a thimbleful has left the decanter good night hexford good night you heard this to the district attorney every word both went for their overcoats only on leaving did they speak again and then it was to say at ten o'clock to-morrow morning at ten o'clock end of chapter seventeen Chapter Eighteen of the House of the Whispering Pines by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Eighteen. On it was written. Can this avail thee? Look to it. Prometheus bound. The district attorney was right. Sweetwater was not happy his night's rest had not benefited him he had seemed natural enough when he first appeared at the coroner's office in the early morning and equally natural all through the lengthy conference which followed but a half hour later any one who knew him well any of his fellow detectives in new york especially mr gryce who had almost fathered him since he came among them a raw and inexperienced recruit would have seen at first glance that his spirits were no longer at par and that the cheer he displayed in manner and look was entirely assumed and likely to disappear as soon as he found himself alone and it did so disappear when at two o'clock he entered the club-house grounds it was without buoyancy or any of the natural animation with which he usually went about his work each step seemed weighted with thought or at least heavy with inner dissatisfaction but his eye was as keen as ever and he began to use that eye from the moment he passed the gates what was in his mind was he hunting for new clues or was he merely seeking to establish the old the officers on guard knew him by this time and let him pass hither thither and where he would unmolested he walked up and down the driveways peering continuously at the well-trodden snow he studied the spaces between he sauntered to the rear and looked out over the golf links then he began to study the ground in this direction as he had already studied it in front the few mutterings which left his lips continued to speak of discontent if i had only had clark's chance or even hexford's was among his complaints but what can i hope now this snow has been trampled till it is one solid cake of ice to the very edge of the golf links beyond that the distance is too great for minute inspection yet it will have to be gone over inch by inch before i shall feel satisfied i must know how much of his story is to be believed and how much of it we can safely set aside he ended by wandering down on the golf links taking out his watch he satisfied himself that he had time for an experiment and immediately started for cuthbert road an hour later he came wandering back on a different line he looked soured disappointed when near the building again he cast his eye over its rear and gazed long and earnestly at the window which had been pointed out to him as the one from which a possible light had shone forth that night there were no trees on this side of the house only vines but the vines were bare of leaves and offered no obstruction to his view if there had been a light in that window any one leaving this house by the rear would have seen it unless he had been drunk or a fool muttered sweetwater in contemptuous comment to himself arthur cumberland's story is one lie i'll take the district attorney's suggestion and return to new york to-night my work here is done 
yet he hung about the links for a long time and finally ended by entering the house and taking up his stand beneath the long narrow window of the closet overlooking the golf links with chin resting on his arms he stared out over the sill and sought from the space before him and from the intricacies of his own mind the hint he lacked to make this present solution of the case satisfactory to all his instincts something is lacking thus he blurted out after a look behind him in the adjoining room of death i can't say what nor can i explain my own unrest or my disinclination to leave this spot the district attorney is satisfied and so i'm afraid is the coroner but i'm not and i feel as guilty here he threw open the window for air and thrusting his head out glanced over the links then aside at the pines showing beyond the line of the house on the southern end and then out of mere idleness down at the ground beneath him as guilty he went on as Renelay appears to be and some one really is i starting he leaned farther out what was that he saw in the vines not on the snow of the ground but halfway up in the tangle of small branches clinging close to the stone of the lower story just beneath this window he would see something that glistened something that could only have got there by falling from this window could he reach it no he would have to climb up from below to do that well that was easy enough with the thought he rushed from the room in another minute he was beneath the window had climbed pulled pushed his way up had found the little pocket of nettled vines observable from above had thrust in his fingers and worked a small object out had looked at it uttered an exclamation curious in its mixture of suppressed emotions and let himself down again into the midst of the two or three men who had scented the adventure and hastened to be witnesses of its outcome a file he exclaimed an empty file but holding the little bottle up between his thumb and forefinger he turned it slowly about until the label faced them on it was written one word but it was a word which invariably carries alarm with it that word was poison sweetwater did not return to new york that night End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the house of the whispering pines by anna katherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter nineteen it's not what you will find i am not mad i would to heaven i were for then tis like i should forget myself oh if i could what grief should i forget preach some philosophy to make me mad for being not mad but sensible in grief my reasonable part produces reason how i may be delivered of these woes king john i regret to disturb you arthur but my business is of great importance and should be made known to you at once this i say as a friend i might have waited for the report to have reached you from hearsay or through the evening papers but i prefer to be the one to tell you you can understand why sullen and unmollified the young man thus addressed eyed apprehensively his father's old friend placed so unfortunately in his regard and morosely exclaimed out with it i am a poor hand at guessing what has happened now a discovery a somewhat serious one i fear at least it will force the police to new action your sister may not have died entirely from strangulation other causes may have been at work now what do you mean by that 
arthur cumberland was under his own roof and in presence of one who should have inspired his respect but he made no effort to hide the fury which these words called up i should like to know what deviltry is in your minds now am i never to have peace peace and tragedy do not often run together came in the mild tones of his would-be friend a great crime has taken place all the members of this family are involved to say nothing of the man who lies now under the odium of suspicion in our common county jail peace can only come with the complete clearing up of this crime and the punishment of the guilty but the clearing up must antedate the punishment mr ranelagh's assertion that he found miss cumberland dead when he approached her may not be as so many believe the reckless denial of a criminal disturbed in his act it may have had a basis in fact i don't believe it nothing will make me believe it stormed the other jumping up and wildly pacing the drawing-room floor it is all a scheme for saving the most popular man in society society that for society he shouted out snapping his fingers he is president of the club the pet of women the admired of all the dolls and gawks who are taken with his style his easy laughter and his knack at getting at man's hearts he won't laugh so easily when he's up before a jury for murder and he'll never again fool women or bulldoze men even if they are weak enough to acquit him of his crime enough of the smirch will stick to prevent that if it doesn't i'll again his hands went out in the horribly suggestive way they had done at his sister's funeral the coroner sat appalled confused almost distracted between his doubts his convictions his sympathy for the man and his recoil from the passions he would be only too ready to pardon if he could feel quite sure of their real root and motive cumberland may have felt the other's silence or he may have realized the imprudence of his own fury for he dropped his hands with an impatient sigh and blurted out but you haven't told me your discovery it seems to me it is a little late to make discoveries now this was brought about by the persistence of sweetwater he seems to have an instinct for things he was leaning out of the window at the rear of the clubhouse the window of that small room where your sister's coat was found and he saw caught in the vines beneath a why don't you speak out i cannot tell what you found unless you name it a little bottle an apothecary's phial it was labelled poison and it came from this house arthur cumberland reeled then he caught himself up and stood staring with a very obvious intent of getting a grip on himself before he spoke the coroner waited a slight flush deepening on his cheek how do you know that file came from this house dr perry looked up astonished he was prepared for the most frantic ebullitions of wrath for violence even or for dull stupid blank silence but this calm quiet questioning of fact took him by surprise he dropped his anxious look and replied it has been seen on the shelves by more than one of your servants your sister kept it with her medicines and the druggist with whom you deal remembers selling it some time ago to a member of your family which member i don't believe this story i don't believe any of your he was fast verging on violence now you will have to arthur facts are facts and we cannot go against them the person who bought it was yourself perhaps you can recall the circumstance now i cannot he did not seem to be quite master of himself i don't know half the things i do at least i didn't used to but what are you coming to what's in your mind and what are your intentions something to shame us further i have no doubt 
you're soft on ranelagh and don't care how i feel or how carmel will feel when she comes to herself poor girl are you going to call it suicide you can't with those marks on her throat we're going to carry out our investigations to the full we're going to hold the autopsy which we didn't think necessary before that's why i'm here arthur i thought it your due to know our intentions in regard to this matter if you wish to be present you have only to say so if you do not you may trust me to remember that she was your father's daughter as well as my own highly esteemed friend shaken to the core the young man sat down amid innumerable tokens of the two near if not dear ones just mentioned and for a moment had nothing to say gone was his violence gone his self-assertion and his insolent captious attitude towards his visitor the net had been drawn too tightly or the blow fallen too heavily he was no longer a man struggling with his misery but a boy on whom had fallen a man's responsibilities sufferings and cares my duty is here he said at last i cannot leave carmel the autopsy will take place to-morrow how is carmel to-day no better the words came with a shudder doctor i've been a brute to you i am a brute i have misused my life and have no strength with which to meet trouble what you propose to do with with adelaide is horrible to me i didn't love her much while she was living i broke her heart and shamed her from morning till night every day of her life but good for nothing as i am and good for nothing as i've always been if i could save her body this last humiliation i would willingly die right here and now and be done with it must this autopsy take place it must then he raised his arm the blood swept up dyeing his cheeks his brow his very neck a vivid scarlet tell them to lock up every bottle the house holds or i cannot answer for myself i should like to drink and drink till i knew nothing cared for nothing was a madman or a beast you will not drink the coroner's voice rang deep he was greatly moved you will not drink and you will come to the office at five o'clock to-morrow we may have only good news to impart we may find nothing to complicate the situation arthur cumberland shook his head it's not what you will find said he and stopped biting his lips and looking down the coroner uttered a few words of consolation forced from him by the painfulness of the situation the young man did not seem to hear them the only sign of life he gave was to rush away the moment the coroner had taken his leave and regain his seat within sight and hearing of his still unconscious sister as he did so these words came to his ears through the door which separated them flowers i smell flowers lila you always loved flowers but i never saw your hands so full of them arthur uttered a sharp cry then bowing his face upon his arms he broke into sobs which shook the table where he sat twenty-four hours later in the coroner's office sat an anxious group discussing the great case and the possible revelations awaiting them the district attorney mr clifton the chief of police and one or two others among them sweetwater made up the group and carried on the conversation dr perry only was absent he had undertaken to make the autopsy and had been absent for this purpose several hours five o'clock had struck and they were momentarily looking for his reappearance but when the door opened as it did at this time it was to admit young cumberland whose white face and shaking limbs betrayed his suspense and nervous anxiety he was welcomed coldly but not impolitely 
and sat down in very much the same place he had occupied during his last visit but in a very different and much more quiet state of mind to sweetwater his aspect was one of despair but he made no remark upon it only kept all his senses alert for the coming moment of so much importance to them all but even he failed to guess how important until the door opened again and the coroner appeared looking not so much depressed as stunned picking out arthur from the group he advanced towards him with some commonplace remark but desisted suddenly and turned upon the others instead i have finished the autopsy said he i knew just what poison the phial had held and lost no time in my tests a minute portion of this drug which is dangerous only in large quantities was found in the stomach of the deceased but not enough to cause serious trouble and she died as we had already decided from the effect of the murderous clutch upon her throat but he went on sternly as young cumberland moved and showed signs of breaking in with one of his violent invectives against the supposed assassin i made another discovery of still greater purport when we lifted the body out of its resting-place something beside withered flowers slid from her breast and fell at our feet the ring gentlemen the ring which ranelagh says was missing from her hand when he came upon her and which certainly was not on her finger when she was laid in the casket rolled to the floor when we moved her here it is there is one person here at least who can identify it but i do not ask that person to speak that we may well spare him he laid the ring on the table not too near arthur not within reach of his hand but close enough for him to see it then he sat down and hid his face in his hands the last few days had told on him he looked older by ten years than he had at the beginning of the month the silence which followed these words and this action was memorable to everybody there concerned some had seen and all had heard of young cumberland's desperate interruption of the funeral and the way his hand had invaded the flowers which the children had cast in upon her breast as the picture real or fancied rose before their eyes one man rose and left his place at the table then another and presently another even charles clifton drew back the district attorney remained where he was and so did young cumberland the latter had reached out his hand but he had not touched the ring and he sat thus frozen what went on in his heart no man there could guess and he did not enlighten them when at last he looked up it was with a dazed air and an almost humble mien providence has me this time he muttered i don't understand these mysteries you will have to deal with them as you think best his eyes still glued to the jewel dilated and filled with fierce light as he said this damn the ring and damn the man who gave it to her however it came into her casket he's at the bottom of the business just as he was at the bottom of her death if you think anything else you will think a lie turning away he made for the door there was in his manner desperation approaching to bravado but no man made the least effort to detain him not till he was well out of the room did any one move then the district attorney raised his finger and arthur cumberland did not ride back to his home alone End of chapter 19chapter 20 of the house of the whispering pines by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn book 3 hidden surprises chapter 20 he or you there is no third 
a heavy summons lies like lead upon me and yet i would not sleep merciful powers restrain in me the cursed thoughts that nature gives way to in repose macbeth for several days i had been ill they were merciful days to me since i was far too weak for thought then there came a period of conscious rest then renewed interest in life and my own fate and reputation what had happened during this interval i had confused memory of having seen clifton's face at my bedside but i was sure that no words had passed between us when would he come again when should i hear about carmel and whether she were yet alive or mercifully dead like her sister i might read the papers but they had been carefully kept from me not one was in sight the nurse would undoubtedly give me the information i desired but kind as she had been i dreaded to consult a stranger about matters which involved my very existence and every remaining hope yet i must know for i could not help thinking now and i dreaded to think amiss and pile up misery for myself when i needed support and consolation i would risk one question but no more i would ask about the inquest had it been held if she said yes ah if she said yes i should know that carmel was dead and the news coming thus would kill me so i asked nothing and was lying in a sufficiently feverish condition when the doctor came in saw my state and thinking to cheer me up remarked blandly you are well enough this morning to hear good news did you recognize the room you are in i am in the hospital am i not hardly you are in one of mr o'hagan's own rooms mr o'hagan was the head-keeper you are detained now simply as a witness i was struck to the heart terrified in an instant what why what has happened i questioned rapidly half starting up then falling back on my pillow under his astonished eye nothing he parried seeing his mistake and resorting to the soothing process they simply have had time to think you're not the sort of man from which criminals are made that's nonsense i retorted reckless of his opinion and mad to know the truth yet shrinking horribly from it criminals are made from all kinds of man neither are the police so philosophical something has occurred but don't tell me i protested inconsistently as he opened his lips send for mr clifton he's my friend i can better bear here he is said the doctor as the door softly opened under the nurse's careful hand i looked up saw charles's faithful face and stretched out my hand without speaking never had i needed a friend more and never had i been more constrained in my greeting i feared to show my real heart my real fears my real reason for not hailing my release as every one evidently expected me to with a gesture to the nurse the doctor tiptoed out muttering to clifton as he passed some words of warning or casual instruction the nurse followed and clifton coming forward took a seat at my side he was cheerful but not too cheerful and the air of slight constraint which tinged his manner as much as it did mine did not escape me well old fellow he began my hand went up an entreaty tell me why they have withdrawn their suspicions i've heard nothing read nothing for days i don't understand this move for reply he laid his hand on mine you're stanch he began you have my regard elwood not many men would have stood the record and sacrificed themselves as you have done 
the fact is recognized now and your motive i must have turned very white for he stopped and sprang to his feet searching for some restorative i felt the need of blinding him to my condition with an effort which shook me from head to foot i lifted myself from the depths into which his words had plunged me and after fighting for self-control faltered forth feebly enough don't be frightened i'm all right again i guess i'm not very strong yet sit down i don't need anything he turned and surveyed me carefully and finding my colour restored seated himself and proceeded more circumspectly perhaps i had better wait till to-morrow before i satisfy your curiosity said he and leave me to imagine all sorts of horrors no tell me at once has anything happened at the cumberlands yes what you feared has happened no no carmel is not dead did you think i meant that forgive me i should have remembered that you had other causes for anxiety than the one weighing on our minds she is holding her own just holding it but that is something in one so young and naturally healthy i could see that i baffled him it could not be helped i did not dare to utter the question with which my whole soul was full i could only look my entreaty he misunderstood it as was natural enough she does not know yet what is in store for her were his words and i could only lie still and look at him helplessly and try not to show the despair that was sinking me deeper and deeper into semi-unconsciousness when she comes to herself she will have to be told but you will be on your feet then and will be allowed no doubt to soften the blow for her by your comfort and counsel the fact that it must have been you if not he he did i shout it or was the shout simply in my own mind i trembled as i rose on my elbow i searched his face in terror of my self-betrayal but his showed only compassion and an eager desire to clear the air between us by telling me the exact facts yes arthur his guilt has not been proven he has not even been remanded the sister's case is too pitiful and coroner perry too soft-hearted where any of the family is involved but no one doubts his guilt and he does not deny it himself you know probably no one better that he cannot very consistently do this in face of the evidence accumulated against him evidence stronger in many regards than that accumulated against yourself the ungrateful boy the the pardon me i don't often indulge in invectives against unhappy men who have their punishment before them but i was thinking of you and what you have suffered in this jail where you have not belonged no not for a day don't think of me the words came with a gasp i was never so hard put to it not when i first realized that i had been seen with my fingers on adelaide's throat arthur a booby and a boor but certainly not the slayer of his sister unless i had been woefully mistaken in all that had taken place in that clubhouse previous to my entrance into it on that fatal night as i caught clifton's eye fixed upon me i repeated though with more self-control i hope don't think of me i am not thinking of myself you speak of evidence what evidence give me details don't you see that i am burning with curiosity i shan't be myself till i hear this alarmed him it's a risk said he the doctor told me to be careful not to excite you too much but suspense is always more intolerable than certainty and you have heard too much to be left in ignorance of the rest yes yes i agreed feverishly pressing his hand it all came about through you he blundered on 
you told me of the fellow you saw riding away from the whispering pines at the time you entered the grounds i passed the story on to a coroner and he to a new york detective they have put on this case he and arthur's own surly nature did the rest i cringed where i lay this was my work the person who drove out of the clubhouse grounds while i stood in the clubhouse hall was carmel and the clue i had given instead of baffling and confusing them had led directly to arthur seeing nothing peculiar or at all events giving no evidence of having noted anything peculiar in my movement clifton went evenly on pouring into my astonished ears the whole long story of this detective's investigations i heard of his visit at the mechanic's cottage and of the identification of the hat marked by eliza simmons's flowery thumb with an old one of arthur's fished out from one of the cumberland closets then as i lay dumb in my secret dismay and perturbation of arthur's acknowledged visit to the club-house and his abstraction of the bottles which to all minds save my own perhaps connected him directly and well-nigh unmistakably with the crime the finger of god nothing else such coincidences cannot be natural was my thought and i braced myself to meet the further disclosures i saw awaiting me but when these disclosures were made and arthur's conduct at the funeral was given its natural explanation by the finding of the tell-tale ring in adelaide's casket i was so affected both by the extraordinary nature of the facts and the doubtful position in which they seemed to place the one whom even now i found it difficult to believe guilty of adelaide's death that clifton aroused in spite of his own excitement to a sudden realization of my condition bounded to his feet and impetuously cried out i had to tell you it was your due and you would not have been satisfied if i had not but i fear that i rushed my narrative too suddenly upon you that you needed more preparation and that the greatest kindness i can show you now is to leave before i do further mischief i believe i answered i know that his idea of leaving was insupportable to me that i wanted him to stay until i had had time to think and adjust myself to these new conditions instinctively i did not feel as certain of arthur's guilt as he did my own case had taught me the insufficiency of circumstantial evidence to settle a mooted fact besides i knew arthur even better than i did his sisters he was as full of faults and as lacking in amiable and reliable traits as any fellow of my acquaintance but he had not the inherent snap which makes for crime he lacked the vigour which god forgive me the thought lay back of carmel's softer characteristics i could not imagine him guilty i could for all my love imagine his sister so and i did the conviction would not leave my mind charles said i at last struggling for calmness and succeeding better in my task than either he or i expected what motive do they assign for this deed why should arthur follow adelaide to the club-house and kill her now if he had followed me you were at dinner with them that night and know what she did and what she vowed about the wine he was very angry though he dropped his glass and let it shiver on the board he himself says that he was desperately put out with her and could only drown his mad emotions in drink he knew that she would hear of it if he went to any saloon in town so he stole the key from your bunch and went to help himself out of the club-house wine vault that's how he came to be there what followed who knows he won't tell and we can only conjecture the ring which she certainly wore that night might give the secret away but it is not gifted with speech though as a silent witness it is exceedingly eloquent the episode of the ring confused me i could make nothing out of it 
could not connect it with what i myself knew of the confused experiences of that night but i could recall the dinner and the sullen aspect not unmixed with awe with which this boy contemplated his sister when his own glass fell from his nerveless fingers my own heart was not in the business it was on the elopement i had planned but i could not help seeing what i have just mentioned and it recurred to me now with fatal distinctness the awe was as great as the sullenness did that offer a good foundation for crime i disliked arthur i had no use for the boy and i wished with all my heart to detect guilt in his actions rather than in those of the woman i loved but i could not forget that tinge of awe on features too heavy to mirror very readily the nicer feelings of the human soul it would come up and under the influence of this impression i said are you sure that he made no denial of this crime that does not seem like arthur guilty or innocent he made none in my presence and i was in the coroner's office when the ring was produced from its secret hiding-place and set down before him there was no open accusation made but he must have understood the silence of all present he acknowledged some days ago when confronted with the bottle found in cuthbert road that he had taken both it and another from the clubhouse just before the storm began to rage that night the hour the very hour i muttered he entered and left by that upper hall window or so he says but he is not to be believed in all his statements some of his declarations we know to be false which ones give me a specimen charlie mention something he has said that you know to be false well it is hard to accuse a man of a direct lie but he cannot be telling the truth when he says that he crossed the links immediately to cuthbert road thus cutting out the right home of which we have such extraordinary proof under the fear of betraying my thoughts i hurriedly closed my eyes i was in an extraordinary position myself what seemed falsehood to them struck me as the absolute truth carmel had been the one to go home he without doubt had crossed the links as he said as this conviction penetrated deeply and yet more deeply into my mind i shrank inexpressibly from the renewed mental struggle into which it plunged me to have suffered myself to have fallen under the ban of suspicion and the disgrace of arrest had certainly been hard but it was nothing to be holding another in the same plight through my own rash and ill-advised attempt to better my position and carmel's by what i had considered a totally harmless subterfuge i shuddered as i anticipated the sleepless hours of silent debate which lay before me the voice which whispered that arthur cumberland was not over-gifted with sensitiveness and would not feel the shame of his position like another did not carry with it an indisputable message and could not impose on my conscience for more than a passing moment the lout was human and i could not stifle my convictions in his favour but carmel i clenched my hands under the clothes i wished it were not high noon but dark night that clifton would only arise or turn his eyes away that something or anything might happen to give me an instant of solitary contemplation without the threatening possibility of beholding my thoughts and feelings reflected in another's mind was this review instantaneous or the work of many minutes forced by the doubt to open my eyes i met clifton's full look turned watchfully on me the result was calming even to my apprehensive gaze it betrayed no new enlightenment my struggle had been all within no token of it had reached him this he showed still more plainly when he spoke 
there will be a close sifting of evidence at the inquest you will not enjoy this but the situation hard as it may prove has certainly improved so far as you are concerned that should hasten your convalescence poor arthur burst from my lips and the cry was echoed in my heart then because i could no longer endure the pusillanimity which kept me silent i rose impulsively into a sitting posture and summoning all my faculties into full play endeavoured to put my finger on the one weak point in the evidence thus raised against carmel's brother what sort of a man would you make arthur out to be when you accuse him of robbing the wine vault on top of a murderous assault on his sister i know it argues a brute but he arthur cumberland is selfish unresponsive and hard but he is not a brute i am disposed to give him the benefit of my good opinion to this extent charlie i cannot believe he first poisoned and then choked that noble woman clifton drew himself up in his turn astonishment battling with renewed distrust either he or you ranelagh he exclaimed firmly there is no third person this you must realize End of chapter 20